Hello? <sighs> Hello, chat. How's it going? Damn right we're getting a candle going. A fresh new candle. Never before seen on stream. Top notch. It's supposed to smell like a Christmas tree. That's going to that's going to be the goal here is that it's going to smell like Christmas in this stream. It's going to be delicious. I need a candle now and hack. God damn it, I never can find a place to put this candle where it can be seen. I almost need to uh, move the microphone to that side. Would that be a downgrade? I don't know. I don't know if that would matter if I really do that. All right, let's see here. I gotta catch up on chat. I think people definitely subs subscribed. Four monitors, we're almost there. Hell yeah, we got my four monitors in. Yup, got the four monitors in the stand, which means I no longer have like stuff underneath here so I can do this, which is a magical thing for people who like to keep their desks clean. It's nice that like underneath these monitors, I don't have anything and I did, mediocre cable management where you don't really see cables coming down here or on either of these sides that's kind of out of frame for you but that's uh that's a big upgrade there oh man where am i gonna put this today here eh? huh huh why am i why am i looking at the twitch version which is very very compressed compared to the official obs version how do you even hook up that many monitors? Just one graphics card for the past, like, six or seven years can usually do four in this day and age. XGemDo, thank you so much for the two months of support with the subscriberino. Hell yeah. Yo, new OS hype. Hell yeah. We got Jan Polak coming in here with the yo, yo, yo. Three months of support. Thank you so much for that. Oh man, I have limited time t on to earn exclusive emotes with the hype train. Holy shit, I'm not even caught up to that. Oh yeah, that screensaver. Yeah, it's C Matrix. <laughs> it's a terminal thing. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, all right, there goes my afternoon productivity. Yep. We're gonna bring it right back. We're gonna get you so amped to write some code today. You're gonna be like, holy shit, I love writing code. You know, that's how that's how that's gonna go. Welcome to the screen and stream. This 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 the scream? This is this just the scream? <laughs> uh, in the beginning, they programmed a uh, computer by watching memory in an oscilloscope, like the Matrix. Yeah, that's why I got an oscilloscope out of screen here. That's how we're gonna write all all our code today. We're just gonna um. Um, we're gonna take some potentiometers and change the and change the waves. You know, we're gonna we're gonna get in those bits. We're gonna do the we're gonna do the bit. This is the bit dance. I'm like actually pretty impressed how how synchronized my hands look on stream because they don't feel synchronized. But they, this is the this is the bit dance. This is the programming dance right here. Here you go. That's what you come here for. That is the content that we have in this stream. <laughs> Someone CSI enhanced the screen to the Vim sessions. Yeah, that's why I put up useless shit on there. So it looks like cool stuff, but it's actually just like a random folder with code in it that I opened. I don't know if it's Rust or C. I think it's C. <laughs> Good day, everyone. Hope you're feeling great. Hell yeah, we are, Desu. Oh, man. He cares about European viewer C. All my v European viewers, you are the best out there. The American viewers, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> what, what use are you to me at four in the morning, Americans? God, call me back when you have health care. <laughs> uh, uh. All right, very exciting stuff about to happen. I, I hope, I don't know. We have no idea where this is going to go today. I mean... I say we as if as if you guys have as much of a plan as I do, because I have none, uh, but that's fine. We'll do the standard stuff where we'll just talk to the camera for a while, and then we'll maybe come up with a good idea of what to do. My Satsuma Chai is currently burning. 
masala chai, nutmeg, and satsumo peel. I don't know what really any of those things are other than nutmeg and and chai and maybe peel. Um, <laughs> so I don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> I need the candle and hack, and hell yeah, you do. Got some emotes getting shared in chat. Don't burn plastic from monitor. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's actually, this, this candle actually burns pretty hot. We'll, uh, we'll, be, we'll be careful about it. We'll be careful about that one lumen of energy coming off of this. Um... Microphone move is a good idea. Yeah, I, but the problem is this microphone is in a good position for when I turn to the camera. Because if it was over there, I would get quieter when I look at the camera. And and I, I know not everyone likes when I look at the camera and, and say nice things to chat. But sometimes you get what you get here, you know? There's only so much. I was just about to go to sleep. Well, get some sleep and catch us in the morning. No problem with that. Just leave your leave your browser open so, the, so we have the, the viewership number. You know, egos. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, let's see. What else is in chat? Oh, chat just scrolled on me here. Oh, my God. Oh, chat's going so fast. Hello, Mr. Streamer. <laughs> what a lovely Monday. Robobot. I don't know why I always read that in the same thing. I literally read the text and then your name afterwards, but I always read it in the same fucking way. Um, I love it. Weird question, but how much was your table set up? Oh, we're talking in the in the dozens of IKEA dollars. <laughs> I've, had, I've had this same desk for a long time. It's no more than two hundred dollars. No more than two hundred dollars. Um, we can now see the OBS, so we watch the stream while we watch the stream. Exactly, that's the point. You get that nice layered layered thing. I don't know. I think. Having that up there is best, so I I like to have OBS open somewhere, right? I, I want to see OP, OBS open somewhere, and there's nothing sensitive in my OBS, so it works okay on this monitor, whereas this monitor, which I kind of crop out of the frame at a weird angle, I like to be able to pop open something that's more sensitive if I need to, if I need to reference code, if I need to send a work email or something while on stream. Uh, so this just frees up another monitor um, such that this one can be dedicated towards uh, more important things, like Twitch chat. Um, a, 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 a ye scotch meat? I scotch neat? Whatever it is, scotch neat is delicious, and that is the correct way to drink scotch. I'm all, I'm all about that. Thank you so much for the tier one sub. Acid Boot, thank you so much for the three months of support. Fuzz all the things. We will. I mean, we won't get to fuzzing for a long time. We got a, we got a whole hill to climb before, before we get there. The Kate, the Kate, Kate, Kadian? The Kadian? Uh, coming in with a two months. Thank you so much for that. Got a gifted sub going to Daniel42 from Nipsey. Thank you so much for that. Oh, man. Hype, boo. Scam train. Yeah, oh, yeah. We got a scam train going. Holy shit. Uh, Don Ho coming in with 16 people with a raid. Thank you so much for that. How was your stream? Hope it was wonderful and successful and awesome and fun and exciting. Got Desu gifting a tier one sub. Hell yeah. Thank you so much for that, Desu. Oh my god, I cannot catch up with chat. Holy fucking shit. Let me let me see here. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to just scroll through really quickly and see if there's anything crazy here. Uh alright, it's my NA bedtime. See you in the VOD. See you around. See you in the morning. Live. <laughs> uh Wiggy, thank you so much for coming in with four months. The stream is back. Hell yeah, it is. Um, dozens, dozens of IKEA dollars, Rich. Yeah. Oh man. Um, can you talk about the scheduler and fuzzing and the hypervisor? Uh, you're gonna have to give something more specific there, cause we're not gonna be having a scheduler here at all. Um, so if there's something that you're curious about. Uh, we'll, we'll see if we can figure that out. Masters, by the way, thank you so much for the three months of support. All right. Safrini. S-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-
Thank you so much for the six months of support. Oh, man. And Frode giving a gifted sub to God Warrior. 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 <laughs> Pack Bypass, thank you so much for the 200 biddies. Keep it going. Hell yeah. Hype train going hard right now. Good time to start. We got the, we got the fancy stream time going. Starting at... 1,300 hours in Germany when there's a vacation going on. Hell yeah. You have three new monitors. Um, I just have, well, I, I have four new monitors here. So all of these monitors are new. Um, and I got to stand for them, of course. Um, and that, that's it. So all these monitors are actually new. But yeah. Um... I'm not sure if you knew about this or if this is going to be useful. Uh, do you remember the as any hack you use for a generic device type in chocolate milk? There now may be a solution to this. Um, okay, we'll take a look at that. But that is pretty nice. Um, oh, generic associated types. Ooh. Ooh, whoa. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pin that. I'll uh, look at that probably another time. That looks like a, a lot of complex uh, code to figure out what it does right now. Um, Jen Pollock coming in with a gifted sub as well. Hell yeah. Uh, I'm doing SMP and scheduler and multi-threading for my OS, and I just want to know uh, how do I need to design that part? However, however you need to. Um, there's so many different ways to handle multi-threading and scheduling that there's there's just there's no right way to do that. Um, Anyone who tells you there's a correct way to do that uh, is probably just oblivious to the other ways of doing it. Um, or they're, they're incapable of thinking about other people's problems. Um, in reality, really all you need to do is make a context switch. Make something that allows you to save the register state and context switch from thread to thread or process to process. Um, and then once you have that, Figure out how you want to schedule things. Do you want to round robin things? Do you want to do a preemptive kernel? Do you not want to do a preemptive kernel? Do you want to do a real time kernel? Uh, do you not want to have a scheduler at all? There's it. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. You can do it however you want. Um. All right. The real til tilted tree. Thank you so much for the two months. Hell yeah. What else? What else here? 2K or 4K monitors? These are 1080p, the correct resolution, the, the best resolution. I haven't found any reason to go over 1080p yet. So, all right. Asabid coming in with another gifted sub to Dominic. Hell yeah. All right, let me see here about, uh, I got to get my Streamlabs open. Let's see, so I can see donations, because it sounded like maybe there's a donation, but I don't have any of my notifications on Twitch. I have to look at Streamlabs to do that, which I normally don't have open, which means I miss all of those donations, so I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. All right. All right. Briven donated $2. Thank you so much. Bits is for losers. Hell yeah. Thank you so much for that. Sorry for missing that. All right. All right. Uh, have you made some kind of functional analysis or break breakdown structures for FuzzOS to prepare the project? No, not at all. I haven't written any code for this. I haven't designed out anything. Uh, it's not something I've really even remotely thought about. Um, we're just going to kind of go in there and just do whatever uh, is necessary to solve the problems that we have. And then if we solve a problem in the wrong way, uh, we'll write some profiling or something, and uh, the profiling will tell us that we fucked up, and then we'll change the design that we made. Um, that's kind of the current plan. Uh, but who knows? Who knows? I upgraded from three full HDs to two 4Ks, and they're much nicer for coding. I can fit six splits on each easily, uh, which three was pushing it on the full HD. Absolutely, yeah. 4Ks are pretty nice if you can put up with 4Ks, but typically they just, things just kind of suck. Um, and that's really annoying. I, I don't know. I, I had a 4K before, and I literally just put it in 1080p mode because it just, the compatibility was so ass that I didn't even bother. Um, hell yeah. Nitcat, uh, finally managed to catch a stream of yours before work. Was gonna sleep, uh, was gonna sleep in, but fuck it now. Oh, man. 
Get, get, get the get the rest of your little sleep. Don't don't miss out on sleep for this. It's, that's not worth. All right. 4K has been flawless for me. Huh. It, it's okay, I think, if you have all your monitors as 4K. But if you have a mixed resolution, uh, it can become a pretty big problem. So. All right. Um. 2K in native resolution, no scaling problem. Yeah, I I haven't I don't know if I've seen a 2K monitor. I didn't even know what that refers to. Yeah, mixed resolution is a mess. Yep, absolutely. Complete fucking mess. How's chat doing? The ginger beard is looking glorious today. Hell yeah. I I I shaved. I shaved. I trimmed up a bit. Tried to tried to keep it fancy for th this stream, you know? It's been a, it's been a while since I've stromped, strempt, st str strommed. I don't, I don't know the past tense for strempt. <laughs> Best stream, absolutely. Hell yeah. Oh, man. All right. Well, if chat doesn't have anything else exciting, then we can go and pretend to write code. Uh, when I see the number of monitors, I'm always like, this man is planning some world domination. I mean, planning is typically future tense. I think planned is the correct tense here, you know? That's, that's, uh, that ship has sailed. We've already, we've already done world domination. This problem solved. A new monitor's waiting at worked. Ooh, 3840 by 1600. That's, uh, interesting. So that's like a super wide. Option stream, stream, stream. <laughs> Uh, Cinnamon was the only DE desktop environment for me which would handle 4K with fractional scaling out of the box. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't, uh, haven't tried Cinnamon. Haven't tried anything except for DWM. Um, like, honestly, I don't know if I've used a different window manager since 2008. <laughs> I don't think I've even bothered. Maybe I use, like... I guess GNOME 2, I probably used until 2008, but after that, it's, ah, no, I used Awesome. I used Awesome for like two years in high school, and then I switched to DWM. How long are you planning to stream today? I have no idea. It kind of depends how things go, how motivation goes, what we get done, if we get some good momentum going here, because starting off a project can sometimes be tough, but we'll see. Awesome was kind of good, but Lu but Lua? You got problems with Lua? The premier language with one index to raise? How can you go, go wrong with that? <laughs> and no arrays, but dictionaries where the indices are keys? <laughs> what? How can you go wrong with that? I should also mention that I'm running 4K on Windows, so the compatibility is a bit better. I mean, Windows just... It has perfect compatibility with everything. It's the best operating system written by the best company in the world. So, you know, that just makes sense. <laughs> this is a comment. Yeah. Yeah, they have weird comments. lua has been around for a long time. It's actually a relatively clean language in terms of implementing one. <laughs> MS Shill. <laughs> Surely isn't biased. What do you mean? What do you mean? Lou does fall back to arrays when they're only numeric indices, I think. Oh, interesting. Do they have to be contiguous for that to work? Definitely isn't biased by it. Look, chat. I think chat is the real biased chat here, you know? I'm not biased. I'm the stream. How can I be wrong? I am the streamer. Luigit is actually pretty fast compared to other scripting languages. Yeah, Luigit's actually pretty nice. It's a, a really good implementation of a JIT. Um, I would say it's probably one of the best JIT implementations out there in terms of like cleanliness and performance and like portability. It's pretty damn impressive. Impressive. Um, Nude Thetter, thank you so much for the three months of support. I used Xmonad for a while. I've never tried it. I don't even, I don't even know what that, the, I don't even know what that is. I mean, I've heard about it, but I don't think I've used it. Now, now I'm curious if that's something that, like, things are built upon. Thoughts on Lith? I think it's okay. God damn it, didn't I? 
I didn't hit the button. Flute! <laughs> Flute! Xmonad is the Haskell one? Ew. 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 Which lisp? Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't care too much for lisp. That's not my cup of tea. Honestly, if it's not Rust, it's not a good language. We need a flute emote. I think, I think I have more slots now. We did cross over. We did cross over a hundred thousand views. A hundred thousand views on this channel. You know what? You know what we can do with a hundred thousand views? I don't know. I'm legitimately asking. <laughs> oh man, well deserved. Hell yeah! Thank you so much. Fiolentano Camel, I think, is a great inspiration to a great language, Rust. You know, I, I can't speak too much to Camel, but it made some decent inspirations to Rust, and Rust is a phenomenal language, and thus, by nature, that means Camel must be an acceptable language. But yeah, I've never written Camel. I'm not a fucking academic. <laughs> Buy a hot dog, boil an egg. I don't know. It's hard to get a, a single egg. Uh, and, you know, I would have to get a whole carton, and then I'd have to, like, scramble some eggs and fry some eggs and probably make fried rice. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff. Gonna learn some WebGL during this. Your streams are always motivational. Hell yeah, that's what we're here for. We're here to hype things up. I like C. I, I was reading chat. Sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't want someone to clip that. I don't want someone to clip that where I say I like C. That was DJ Clown in chat showing the real clown ways by saying that they like C. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I love I love my broken down rusty car from 1962. <laughs> no, actually, I love C. I think it's a fantastic language. It was a trap. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. I got debated. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Rusty car sounds good. Yeah, it's super safe. It's it's when you take a car and then you add a bunch of safety protections to it. You add a roll cage, a six-point harness, nice form-fitting seats, reinforce the chassis. Th that's, that's a rusty car right there. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the laugh track? Fuck, I forgot to do that. Gotta make that soundboard. <laughs> I gotta get that non-DMCA uh, uh, laugh track. <laughs> that, that feeling when you find like a soundboard that is uh, no copyright and then someone uses it in a copyrighted like YouTube video and then you use that laugh track and then you get content ID'd where they detect that laugh track and then it gets basically like absorbed into the copyright of the video and then you still get struck for it yeah uh-huh yeah <laughs> how do you concentrate during these uh streams for a long time my adhd brain can hardly concentrate for 30 minutes no matter how interesting the stuff is i, I mean typically i don't I, I i mix in some rants do some other things get up and pace and and do other stuff while streaming or use a food break as an excuse to get away from chat and all your weird stuff that you do um i don't know it doesn't, it's not too difficult. Typically, I get more involved in my code, and I just forget that I'm streaming, and I just, I, I just forget that chat is even there. I'm like, Z, the last language? Oh, man. Oh, that's gonna be a good language. Whatever it is, it's gonna be great. Um, are you going to talk about how you would design the Fuzz OS? Still looking for scheduler things. Ah, uh, maybe. I mean, yeah, we probably should start with talking about roughly the design of things in FuzzOS, but there isn't going to be a scheduler, so you're not going to get your answer there. Um, chat text-to-speech. Ugh. 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 I don't know. I probably should do that for, like, a donation thing. I, I recognize that that's a massive, like, incentive for people to donate. Not that I really give a shit if people donate or not. Um, but, you know, it's a little bit of hype. A little bit of hype here and there. Uh, no scheduler uh, for any of the fuzzing OS you wrote? Nope. I don't, I don't think I've written a scheduler in my operating system since I was, like, 
14 or 15. Like my first operating system, I think is the only OS I ever wrote that had a scheduler. One VM per core, absolutely. Yeah, there's no reason to do more than one VM per core. The second you use a scheduler, you start losing performance. It's only useful if you have more work than you have cores. And uh, in fuzzing, that's pretty much never the case. If it is, you're probably doing something wrong. All right. Oh man. What have I missed? Love what you did with the monitors. Gotta clickbait those views. You know, it, it, it actually works. It works quite a bit. It's sad. It's sad. It's sad that you fucks are lured in by basic ass monitors. When I've got nice servers in the other room, and then here I have a, a couple monitors. And then this is what Chad gets all riled up about. Not a nice server, but a couple fucking monitors. Come on. Come on. You some basic bitches. You gotta, you gotta get on a different operating plane, you know? <laughs> you gotta get to a new level. You know, transcend reality. Transcend consumerism. And get into this beauty of the praising. The good old teraflop. Love you, teraflops. <laughs> we need a server cam. Yeah, I'll just have the audio coming in there in the background where you just hear like <laughs> the whole time in the background of the stream. How was that sound effect? Was that good? Was that high quality? <laughs> oh, it's Santa hats on the emo. Tell ya. Merry early Christmas, you programming nerds. Absolutely. We're like mods to a light. Stop using our brains against us. How many monitors are on the right? Yeah, six. You use Wi-Fi or Ethernet? What? 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 What, what, what is that question? Do I use Wi-Fi or Ethernet? Oh, yes. Do I like my packets delivered occasionally? No. No one does. Nobody likes using fucking Wi-Fi. The only people using Wi-Fi are people who are irradiating themselves with COVID. And you got to get the little shields to put over your routers to keep, to keep yourself safe. Not Ethernet. <laughs> I found out that Ethernet was the way to go when I was nine years old, and the fact that y'all haven't figured that shit out yet, it's pretty embarrassing. You gotta up your standards of latency, you know? <laughs> uh, treat those monitors as makeup <laughs> and a 192-inch server. 192-inch server? No, the server's definitely not 192 inches. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely smaller than that. Uh, all right. Let's see here. <laughs> if there isn't anyone here who took that seriously. Whew. <laughs> fucking knew it. <laughs> oh, man. 100 messages left. Oh, yeah. <laughs> can Kimu or Box emulate Numa? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, everything can emulate Numa. That's pretty easy. I have work meetings coming up. See you later. See you around. Don't uh, don't fuck up your meeting. You know, don't tell your boss to go pound sand. 
you know, don't call him a shitbag or her, whoever your boss is, you know, D don't do those things. Not, not a good idea. Uh, what's your chair's tilt angle? Eh. Uh, about, uh, about that. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, uh, uh about 90 degrees. Um, let's see. <laughs> I watch Kamosa during meetings anyway. I mean, Desu, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like, uh, it doesn't sound like you have to work too hard to uh, outperform your coworkers there if uh, if your uh, rumors are uh, correct there. So sounds like uh, sounds like you can get away with uh, some coziness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is the angle of attack. Oh man. Have you looked into Risk Five before? Uh, yeah, we've written uh, Risk Five emulators on stream, and my most of my research I do on Risk Five. So yes, I've done a lot of Risk Five. That's that's probably I've probably spent some of the most of my CPU time emulating Risk Five. Actually, I I definitely have um, the majority of the CPU time that I've spent in my entire life has been on Risk Five. <laughs> oh man. X APIC or X2 APIC? Uh, it kind of depends. We're probably going to have to do the X2 APIC because the X APIC only supports 255 cores. And there can be some things in there based on biases. So sometimes it's more like 250. Um, so we pretty much have to use an X2 APIC if we want to use uh, more than uh, 256 cores, which uh, we'll bump into that. Um... My biggest weakness is that I'm very honest. My boss tells me he thinks it's a strength, uh, but I'll tell my boss I don't give a fuck what he thinks. <sighs> eh. I mean, I, it can be a strength if you know when to do it. <laughs> uh, do you just have measuring equipment at the ready? Yeah, absolutely. I've got, I've got plenty of stuff at the ready. Oh, man. My, my 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 micrometers are in the are in the garage. Otherwise, I would have taken out a mic, and then we we could have measured something very precisely. If, if no one has used a micrometer before, it is one of the the best feelings you can have. Micrometers are fucking gorgeous. Oh man, let me get my micrometer so we can share. Be right back. Micrometers are one of my favorite things in the world. They're, they're fucking gorgeous. So I've got a, a couple here for a bunch of different sizes. But they're fucking amazing. Oh, man. And basically, if you don't know what a micrometer is for, it's for measuring lengths. <laughs> yeah. Better be a stared or a muted toyo. What, 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 what the fuck do you think I would buy? Let me, let me see if I can focus that. There's no way. There's no way. Did I, did I do it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Oh. So what I can do, what I can do is I can, uh, we'll just rip out an eyelash. Not an eyelash. An eyebrow hair. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this... This eyebrow hair, this, br this brow, this 
the beefy brow, and I'm just gonna throw it in that anvil there, and we're gonna measure the width of my eyebrow hair. Uh-huh. Trying to clamp it in there good. And there you go. It's about uh, 54 micrometers. You can't see it in there, but it's in there. And that's, that's tightened until it, it clicks, until the ratchet goes, right? And there you go. And then uh, I blew it off, and then hopefully, hopefully, oh, did I? Nope, it's still in there. Thank fuck. That would be bad. And then we'll close it back up, and the temperature probably has changed on it, so it'll probably change. Nope, it read back to zero. But yeah, basically, micrometers are designed that I can measure things down to one micrometer uh, accurately. So stuff like that is really, really, really cool. Fuck yeah. <laughs> All right. Wait. Wait, there we go. But yeah, and due to that, micrometers typically only have like one inch of, of movement. So like this one can measure zero to one inch, and then I have one that can measure, it, it's interesting because they always have a gap. But like this one can measure uh, one to two inches, right? And it always has like a permanent gap. And that's kind of how these things work. Uh, they typically only do one inch at a time. So I have basically uh, all of those up to my, my big one here. This juicy boy, which is, I don't even remember. I think it's three to four inches. Yeah, three to four inches. Ho -ho. So yeah, I can measure anything from zero inches up to four inches um, within one micrometer. Fucking love these. They're gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous tools. All right, <laughs> using metric in the land of the free, hell yeah. <laughs> All right. Um. IP65 micrometer, hell yeah. It's actually really nice, because you can use it around, like, mainly, th those ones are, like, coolant proof, which is really nice for working on cars. So you can have, like, an engine in pieces and tear things out, and then you can, like, quickly measure some clearances of things while things have, like, a little bit of, of like, goop, you know, just on your hands and shit. You just pulled out a piston, you wiped it off, and you want to measure it. Um, and of course you're grabbing, you got fucking oil all over your hands. Obviously you don't want the oil in the measurement, um, but yeah. What time is it there? Four in the morning. Came for the fuzz OS, stayed for the micrometer. Hell yeah. <laughs> Focus, you fuck. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right. And here we thought it was going to be a coding stream. Absolutely. When I have an opportunity to do some show and tell on some fun, fancy equipment I have, super exciting. Hell yeah. Is he going to get the indicators out yet? I actually don't have any indicators. Um, I might have one, uh, but I, I don't have a table that I can use an indicator on, and thus it's pretty much useless. I don't have anything I can really mount, uh, mount it off of. Um, but yeah, I expect that if I get a lathe and a mill, I will uh, probably buy more indicators than I will, like, tools. <laughs> All right. Um... I need this to measure my IQ. Oh, God. Wow. That self-roast. Ouch. All right. Okay. Are you up early or late? I'm up early. How much code do you plan to borrow from Orange Slice? Pretty much none. Maybe the TCP stack. What kind of candle are we looking at? It's uh, it's supposed to be Christmas tree. 
And I think it, I think it does that quite well. It's not as potent as the Woodwicks, but it, it definitely has that, that scent. Um, the wick kind of bent over it. It kind of melted down in a way I didn't expect, so the, the flame's kind of small, but that's okay. So the, I, surely the Ikea desk is flat enough for the indicator. So yeah, absolutely. It's basically a surface plate. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hey, weird question, but how do you keep your glasses flat? How do... How do you keep your glasses flat against your face or just a little bit down the nose? Um, but do you? Oh, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Probably varies. When I have headphones on, they kind of stay in one spot. All right. All right. Anything else, chat? Any other show and tells we need to do? Fix your camera from sleeping? Nope. Nope. All right, chat. I think I think you're running out of things to entertain me with, which means that it might be time to start doing stuff. Let's see. Uh, let's let's see if we can get some diagramming software in here. Let's uh, let's grab Draw.io quickly. So we want to get Draw.io, and I don't know if that ships with Debian, uh, with uh, Gentoo. Let me go see. I don't even know if Draw.io is open source or not. So we'll have to go see here. Um, there's probably some like overlay for it. Any reason why you aren't using contact lenses? I just don't like them. It's just it's just too much work. Too much work. Oh, they're now diagrams.net. Okay. What? What? Diagrams.net. Okay. Um. Yeah, let's see. Do they still have a fork me on github okay so they are open source get desktop and they have debs and they have ripums and they have source so let me go see let me see here uh Ripums. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think I have RPM installed, so I can install from a Ripum just fine. But I'd like to use the standard a repo if I can. Draw IO. Hmm. Nope. Not seeing one. Okay, let's try let's see if I have RPM. I know you can't see the screen, but I'm not too worried about that yet. Um I should be able to install an RPM on Gentoo just fine. All right, we, we can we can show the desktop. Um Yeah, let's just do uh, let's just do this. sudo this downloads Dryo, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Is it gonna work though? <laughs> what? 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 Easy, fucking easy. All right, now we can uh, we can do some diagramming. I don't know what we're gonna diagram, but we're gonna diagram something. Let's uh, let's make a folder quick. Oh yeah, and then let me change my font size for stream. I know people here. I think I think we decided on fourteen last time. Let's see. Oh wow, wow that oh that looks so good. 
We're gonna be set now. Um, make dir fuzz OS, and then we'll go into fuzz OS, and then we'll start a diagram, and we'll just say architecture.draw.io, create. I have no idea where it saved that. Okay, it didn't yet. Uh, fuzz OS, and then save, and then uh, that file should show up. Okay, it didn't put a f hit. It wasn't kidding when it did not have an extension. Okay. Um, I kind of expected an extension. All right, let's uh, draw you. Do you play MapleStory? Nope, never played it before. Nope, it's new to me. <laughs> yeah, of course I play MapleStory. Everyone fucking plays MapleStory. That's what all the cool kids play. All right. Have you ever played agar.io? I think I have at some point. My previous message got lost in the stream. How, just, how much of the project do you intend to open source? Either all of it or none of it. Kind of depends um, what we're, what we're going to do there. So um, I don't know if we're going to open source it. I think we are. Like that That's the plan. I don't know why I wouldn't. Um, but if something comes up and we don't want to open source it, then we won't open source it. So, all right, so what we want to do is basically talk through roughly what we want to do, and we'll get my uh, little, little window up here so I know what I control and what I don't. Worst case scenario, recreate goes from stream. All right, so some of the first things that we need to figure out, and we'll just do this with uh, one of these boxes, and then what are the shortcuts here? Uh, let's see if there are shortcuts for the alignments of this text. And there, there has to be. We have to, we have to learn these shortcuts. Otherwise, it's going to be a pain in the ass. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. What? Is there not? There's no, like, hover over thing that says that. Well, that's a shame. Well, whatever. Okay. So some of the first things that we need to note is, um, uh, yeah, I guess. Let me check my blog quick and make sure that I'm not outrageously off with the things that I'm going, uh, that I promise that I'm going to do. Yeah, it looks pretty fair to me. We're going to write, uh, we're going to write an OS. Obviously, memory management, ACPI stuff for multiprocessing and NUMA locality, uh, TCP stack. Um, yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty good. So, basically, what I'd like to do today, uh, man. Uh, so, it's going to be a, a UFI based uh, kernel. Uh, and we're basically, uh, boy. Wow, that, that, why does that get blurry when I click on it? That, that is annoying. That is really annoying. And then I, okay, I can tab. All right. So, um, things to note here, we're uh, basically using uh, using Eufy as a loader, right? So Eufy, um, uh, we're only using Eufy for memory map and uh, let's just do screen printing or like uh, standard out, right? So basically, we're gonna be using the built-in features of, let me see if I can like feng shui these. Honestly, that's probably acceptable. And then this one, can I feng shui this? No. Hmm. Format panel, okay. Okay, well that's, okay. Um. So, Eufy provides a bunch of different functionality. If you're not familiar with Eufy, basically it just loads up an executable and runs it. Um, and in this situation, uh, Eufy executables are just portable executables, which are the formats used on Windows. Um, so, it's trivial to just create a file that is a Eufy executable and then load it in Eufy, and congratulations, you're winning. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to write, uh, we're going to read the Eufy spec. We've done this before on stream, although we're going to probably start from scratch just to kind of show people what goes through that process. 
Um, but effectively, Eufy provides like a bunch of different things. Um, and one of the things that it provides are interfaces for, I mean, literally everything. It, it, it supports way too many things, but it, it can do network access, it can do file access, it can do disk access, it can do uh, printing to consoles and to serial ports and memory map information and all of this different shit. And ultimately, the only thing that we really care about is getting the memory map, which effectively is the only way that we know what memory is available for use. Obviously, we can't put anything in memory unless we know what memory is available to use. Um, so that's one of the first things that we have to do is basically pull out that memory map. And then we're also going to use Yuffie's uh, outputting function. So Yuffie gives us a way of writing to uh, console. It kind of gives us a standard out. And typically, it depends on the firmware, but typically that means that output will get broadcast to the screen as well as to like all the serial ports on the machine. Um, and that means that kind of transparently, we can handle machines that don't have serial ports, um, but just have graphical displays. Now, obviously, we're always gonna use a serial port over a graphical display. All of my machines have serial ports and support serial ports. Graphical displays are a pain in the ass, but there might be some people who want to dabble and try out this operating system and they're not going to want to set up a serial port for whatever reason. And for them, it would be nice to have a way to still see output during the boot process. And thus, we're going to leverage that from Eufy as well. Other than that, I don't think we're going to do anything else um, uh, with Eufy. Uh, we're basically using it as a bootloader. Um, we might use the ability for it to download another stage. Actually, we're not. Uh, we're not going to do that. And I don't know how to tab in. There we go. Looks like Alt does the trick. You can find the shortcuts under Help Keyboard Short. Thank you. That makes sense. And sweet. I can have them all open here. Um, nice. All right. Um... Huh. I'm not seeing anything here that allows me to basically change that center left or right. Maybe it's just worded under something else, but anyways, it doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so. Uh, so we're using Yuffie as a loader, and then, um, yeah, that's about it. Um... Difference between Eufy and other kernel types? Eufy does not actually pertain to the type of the kernel. It is the, um, it's basically the way that the kernel interacts with the firmware on the system. So when you have a BIOS-based kernel, the BIOS is going to hand off execution to you at a certain location in real mode, which is 16-bit assembly mode, the way processors behaved in the 70s. And then you have to kind of manually upgrade all of those things. You're limited to a 512-byte uh, payload getting loaded. So in those 512 bytes, you have to then load the next stage, which is typically called a bootloader. Um, and a lot of those things are just outdated and old and not really a thing. Um, with Eufy, that's a type of firmware, a universal extensible firmware interface, or something like that. It's basically a specification of how to design your firmware, um, or more specifically, the interfaces and APIs, right? It's a standardization of the interfaces that you provide as a hardware manufacturer, or more specifically, a firmware developer. Um, what's really nice about Eufy is it's not from 1975, right? And since it's not from 1975, it has some things that make sense for modern day things. For example, it can load a file that's greater than 512 bytes. Big plus, big plus. Pretty, pretty impressed with that. Um, so there's little things like that that are important, but it also provides a, a bunch of kind of generic uh, interfaces. Now, EFI has been a thing for a long time, um, and you'll find like old uh, Power Max will use EFI. You'll find that new ARM processors will use EFI. Like most ARM things that are for uh, non-embedded uses use EFI. Um, and that means that this OS will be interacting with EFI through 
interfaces, and thus this OS would theoretically, um, until we get to some assembly and like page tables, which are hardware specific things, there's really nothing about this operating system that would just not work if recompiled for ARM64 and run on an ARM64 machine. It should just work. Um, and that's something that maybe we'll play around with. Uh, I was thinking about maybe doing that today. Once we have Hello World working, we can go and see if we can get a, a uh, an ARM64 EFI development environment set up. And if we can, then we can maybe, while we develop this whole operating system, try to do it in parallel on both ARM and on x86-64 at the same time. Um, because if we write an arm 64 hypervisor then we can uh, we can fuzz we can like natively execute uh, iPhone code right we can take an image off of an iPhone and execute it directly in our hypervisor and fuzz iPhones faster than anyone fucking fuzzes iPhones because we'd be doing it natively on arm 64 devices um, so there's some cool things that we can maybe do if we if we go that route yeah. Uh, does it have a Visa driver so your OS can print with a high resolution? Yes, Yuffie does. Um, Yuffie can download shit? Of course, yeah. No two-stage boot? Nope. Uh, so, it will. Um, and remind me if I don't hit on that, but that's actually one of the most important things of kind of how this OS is going to work. Um, and I'm kind of floundering because I don't actually know what the fuck I'm doing, um, but that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll be figuring that out as we go, because that's what we do here. We're winging it. We have no idea what we're doing. Uh, random question. Speaking of screens, anyone use a 49-inch ultrawide for development? I have a friend who just got a large, I don't, it's probably not 49 inches, um, but like a 40-plus-inch um, monitor that's 4K that has like built-in four-way splitting. So you basically have a four monitor setup, uh, but it's completely seamless. And of course you can use it as a 4K if you want to. Um, and he swears by that. He says he's not gonna change from that model. Um, I still like separate monitors just because they show up separately to the computer. And also it's really nice to be able to angle these at different angles um, so that Obviously, I get the best viewing angle experience with those. So stuff like that's pretty useful. Um, wonder if i3 works with that? Yeah, that was one of my concerns. I didn't find the best information on whether or not it worked. Um, what I would want is for it to show up to X as four different monitors. If it's the window manager, like basically manu manually tiling windows, I'm concerned that I'm not going to get the level of tiling support that I really want um, because at that point you have so many tiles on one workspace that it would be really hard to have good key bindings to organize those tiles. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> hey, Lexarian, how is it going? Man, I I cannot I cannot read what you're saying. And <laughs> uh, puto bitch, or is that puta? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm being insulted right now. I should my Spanish should be better than that. I've forgotten way too much of my Spanish. Sorry, Lexerion. I don't know if I should be offended or not. <laughs> All right. Um. What's the max resolution for Eufy? It's it's whatever your firmware supports, but like on on my machines, right, typically that that driver is going to be in your like it's up to your graphics card to show up as a Visa thing that then the firmware can generically use. But I know that my 4K monitor when I boot up EFI, it's 4K. It's 4K. Like, it is whatever resolution of the font that they pick. If they pick a 12-point font, then you have some ridiculous terminal on the 4K. And there's, it's really just kind of up to the uh, environment there. I have a group of friends on TeamSpeak that are your best friends. They even count your monitors. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Cheers. Hola, amigos. <laughs> cool stuff. Hell yeah, Biggie. Glad you're enjoying. Thank you so much for the two months. Do you think art of software security assessment is still relevant? I have no idea. I have not read it. 
I can't, I can't speak to if it's relevant or not, or was relevant. Aw, oh, Tamamasa, we love you. Thank you so much. Gracias. Hell yeah. Yeah, my Spanish used to be pretty good, so I played, uh, I played tibia growing up, and I learned Spanish in, uh, in, I guess, middle school through high school, so I had, like, six years of Spanish, which here made me relatively fluent, um, and then on top of that, I played tibia, which is really popular in Mexico and Brazil, and thus, I, I know, I know Portuguese and, and Spanish are different, but there are enough overlaps there that I kind of, like, at least learned some slang in both, and at, at one point, it's probably, like, middle of high school, my, like, Spanish was pretty damn good. I could, I could deal with, like, the current relevant memes. Um, I kind of knew how people were saying things and phrasing things and, and the like words that were in vogue and, and not and current curses and stuff. And I've forgotten so much of that. And it's really disappointing. I, I was in uh, uh, Costa Rica this year and it was kind of interesting. Uh, one of one of the people who like we we rented this like property, and one of the people who work on the upkeep of this property basically like was giving me a tour of like all the plants and the different things that are there. Um, but he didn't speak English well, uh, and I was able to piece together most of what he was saying. I can't speak Spanish well anymore, but I can at least hear and read it okay, okay. Um, still not perfect, but I don't know. I, I was thinking about maybe getting into that again. Growing up, Craig, you got over that face. Uh, are you using EFI Secure Boot? No, we're not going to be doing any Secure Boot. We don't, we don't care too much about Secure Boot. All right, so anyways, tangents aside, uh, we're going to be using Eufy uh, to do that. Um, and then the next thing is the kind of the loading of the kernel. And we're going to have a really interesting kernel model here, which is not standard, and you're not going to be able to find really any information uh, about this design. But we're going to have, well, you can find information on it, but it's typically more in the academic and supercompute communities, and thus it's not the most accessible content out there. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to write a uh, non-shared memory kernel. And this means, um, and we're actually going to have a spin-off here where uh, we're actually going to have a Rust-style kernel. And what that means is that the... Um, Memory can be shared between cores if it is read-only, right? And that means that immutable memory is shareable, and then, of course, mutable memory is exclusive to one core. And that means uh, that, effectively, there is no way that the memory can be changed um, on another core uh, without... Like, basically, this means that there's never a situation where another core is viewing some other memory get changed. And that has some crazy, crazy performance ramifications in terms of cache coherency, as well as, well, I guess, yeah, it's just like cache coherency is the main thing there, as well as um, this kernel is not going to have locks, so no locks. Um, there are going to be no resources on the system that need to be guarded by locks because there's no way that anyone does not have uh, non-exclusive access, right? If you have the ability to access a device or you have the ability to mutate something in memory, then you have exclusive access to that, and thus, there is no reason for locks in this entire kernel. Um, there are some exceptions there, which is basically the message passing that we use um, and that's going to basically poke exceptions in here in kind of two spots, but it's it's a tiny exception, right? That is code that we will not see. Once we write that internal code, that is the only exception that will be put be behind a door, and never again are we going to actually uh, deal with that, um, which is really, really cool. So we're going to talk more about that. I'm just doing bullet points right now as things come to my head, uh, and then we're actually going to blow these things up quite a bit and explain a lot more about what these are. I'm trying to just get my points out here, um, and then once I have the points out, we're going to go and turn these whole points into almost fucking diagrams themselves. So it's, 
A lot of these things, while they look simple as single lines, they're going to turn into much more complex things. Um, another thing here is um, that uh, page tables uh, don't uh, need locks, and we also don't need to do TLB shootdowns. Um, and we're going to talk about what TLB shootdowns are in a bit. So, yeah. All right. Um... What else are we going to do here? Um, like, yeah, we're going to make a TCP stack and a networking stack, and we're going to write a 10 gigabit Ethernet driver and a 1 gigabit Ethernet driver, and we're probably going to write a hypervisor. But we're not going to talk about those things because those aren't going to come up for a long time. Uh, we're going to only kind of do the diagramming and talk about the things that will probably come up today. Um, and thus, we're going to try and keep that simple. I'm going to scroll through here, see if there's anything that stands out. Um, that I haven't really described here, and not really. So I think we can kind of describe... Uh, okay, we're also going to have uh, soft uh, reboots, which is going to allow us to replace the kernel in place, and then that's going to lead into uh, a bootloader or a loader, um, which is kind of where things kind of get confusing again because we're using Yuffie as a loader, but we're still going to have to write our own loader. Um, but yeah. All right. Okay, I'm happy with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tuck that. Uh, hmm, what's the best way to do this? I kind of want to have like a window of windows here. Uh, but I think what I'm going to do is just make another terminal. And I'm going to bang this in a... Um, man, I am bad with the flute today. Um... Okay, and we'll just paste this down here. And of course, we probably should just have used a text file in the first place here. Um, because... Uh, let me f just format this correctly. Whoops. Ah, two tabs on that one. Two tabs on that one. Uh, and then we say no TLB shootdowns, and then here we go. Okay. Nevertheless, there we go. But, so, let's talk about, roughly, uh, what this bootloading process is going to look like. So, all we're going to do is we're going to write some... We'll talk about, uh, here, we'll talk about the build process first. Um, text, bink, and... Yeah, I hate... Doing the alignment here really sucks. Range. Where's the thing that allows me to align it to the top? Oh, this. Okay, here we go. So this is going to be a build, right? So these are kind of the build process that are going to go into here. And it's going to be really easy. We're going to have our Rust code here, right? And we're just going to pass that Rust code uh, basically just into... Uh, cargo, like it, it should just basically work where we can pass that code directly into uh, cargo and then cargo should just basically produce a Yuffie binary for us. Um, so yeah, I know this is worth diagramming, uh, Yuffie binary, right? And that's it. That's basically the whole build process there is, uh, we'll just, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's really nothing that we're going to have to do there that's really too crazy. Um, so the build process is relatively normal. And then this is going to go into the system here. Uh, and we'll just say system. And now we're going to have... Uh, we're going to put things in red as... Um, yeah, what we're going to have is red is going to be uncontrolled. And this is going to be the UFI. Uh, firmware, right? And and we can be more specific here for people who are curious on how some of this stuff works. This is going to have the BIOS, right? So, uh, and if we want to, yeah, yeah. We'll try and make this stuff, like, even more explained. Because I know a lot of people here probably have never done OS dev before. So we got to pretend like people haven't done OS dev before. So the way that this works is basically, uh, this goes to the reset vector on Intel processors, which is in the uh, BIOS um, uh, ROM, 
right? And this is located at like one, two, three, four, five, six, something like that. Like a lot, like a lot of F's, something like that. Um, and basically, that is just directly mapped into the address space. And the what's going to happen is the like. Yeah, uh, let's just say, jeez. Uh, okay, um, let's say uh, reset. Let's say reset here. This will go to the reset vector. And then, so basically, when you go to power on your computer, right? When you hit the power button on your computer, your computer is going to set the register state to a predefined state of things. It's a relatively well-known initial state of registers. Um, and what that is going to do is it's going to boot at, uh, I think it's like, um, it might be FFFO and then... Uh, Something like this. It's like a really weird uh, address that you can't actually load into segments. It's kind of in some hidden space. You can do it once you get into 32-bit uh, into protected mode, but it's kind of this, this weird thing that you go through. But basically, uh, when you reset or let's just say uh, hit power button, when you hit the power button on your computer, it is going to load up registers, uh, which is going to cause those registers. And we'll just say um, uh, load initial init register states, and then that is going to execute the BIOS. It's not actually going to go through a reset vector on x86, it's just going to load uh, EIP with a specific value, or more specifically, the hidden part of CS and IP with a specific value, which is going to cause the BIOS to get execution, which is living in ROM, in read-only memory on your system. It's, if you look around on your motherboard, it's probably some random 8-pin chip. Just this tiny, tiny, tiny little chip holds basically the firmware of your computer. That is the code that initially executes and boots um, and handles a lot of the transitions into the actual OS. So, um, it's going to load that initial register state. And if we go to Firefox, we go to sandpile.org, we can look at what that initial state is through initial states, uh, which is right here. And then we'll do this so we know that our windows are in line. And basically, this is the state of the processor upon an initial reset. Um, so it's important to note that uh, I should call this reset, not init, because reset and init are different things. So reset is like a, a physical reboot, and an init is kind of like a software reboot where you end up basically sending an init interrupt to the processor. And you'll find that uh, on a hard, like a cold reset, which sometimes this will be called, you'll see that pretty much every register is loaded to a defined state. And we can see that RIP is set to FF0, or F. FF0, uh, which are the bottom 16 bits of EIP. And then if we look at what CS is set to, the base of CS is set to FFF, 0, 0, 0, FFFF, and then a bunch of zeros. And that means when you add these two together, when you take the base and you add this rip, you'll find that the first, the first instruction that will get execution on x86 processors is located at physical address F F F F F F F F zero whatever it's all F's and then one zero it's a thirty two bit address um, and it's basically up to the motherboard and uh, the the manufacturers of the physical hardware to make sure that that location in memory that location on like the physical memory bus maps to the ROM of the BIOS. If it doesn't, then it's it's not going to know what to execute. So it's basically, it always loads the exact same address. And then uh, we got, oh, F's in chat. Jeez, I thought for a second the stream went down or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's effectively how that works. So we know kind of the initial state of the processor, but we don't get execution there. So basically, if the box is red, that means we don't really control that step. So the BIOS in traditional environments, if, if we wrote a BIOS-based operating system, we would find that the BIOS would transition execution to the... Um, 
uh, user code, and that's typically going to be a bootloader here. That's going to be like your Grub, your Lilo, your you know whatever your your bootloader is. Uh, but in this case, it all the BIOS is going to do, and this is like an IBM PS2 specification for BIOSes, is the BIOS. While the BIOS gets loaded at that F address, the user's code is actually going to get loaded from 7C00. And that's where execution is going to happen. And more specifically, what it's going to do is the BIOS, and this is part of the BIOS specification, which is very loosey-goosey. Um, it's going to load one sector from offsets uh, from the first sector on the uh, boot disk and load it to 7C00 and jump to it. Yeah. I'm not going to resize the box because we're going to get rid of this box and then we'll, we'll color this, uh, like this color, which I think is green, which is going to indicate that that is user controlled. But basically, the BIOS is going to load one sector, which is 512 bytes, loaded into memory at physical address 7C00, and then it's going to jump to execute that code as 16-bit real mode code. That's it. And then it's on to you as a bootloader developer to access more sectors from the disk, typically using some BIOS interrupts, which are basically BIOS calls that you can make. They're, they're, they're functions that are implemented by the BIOS, by the standard that it's supposed to support, and you use those to load more code, and that's what you do. And that's what we did in Chocolate Milk and pretty much every OS I've ever done in my life. However, that 512 byte limit means that you have to write some 16-bit real mode assembly that's kind of the entry point. And typically in, in the world of, of Pixie booting, where you're booting over the network, which is what we're going to do. We're going to do a Pixie-based uh, uh, boot. So we're going to say uh, Pixie boot. Uh, basically, that means we are going to boot over the network. Now, Pixie boots on uh, BIOS-based systems actually load up 32 kilobytes of executable code or whatever your, your bootable image is. Now, what's amazing about that is 32 kilobytes is actually enough for me to write a bootloader. I can fit a PE parser in there. I can write some code that uses Pixie routines to download a second stage kernel, load that into memory. I can do memory management in that. I can fit a lot of shit in 32K, and we did that. If you look at Chocolate Milk, you'll find that we wrote uh, a bootloader pretty much entirely in Rust that um, obviously we had like a couple lines of assembly that we are forced to have as that initial 16-bit entry. Um, but that was a 32-bit bootloader that the 16-bit code trans transitioned the processor to 32-bit mode and then executed that bootloader. Now, what's amazing is that when you have Eufy, we don't have to do that. We can skip that whole process because Eufy, over the network or from disk or from whatever SD card, whatever the Eufy firmware is capable of reading and accessing, like whatever disk implementations it has, you can boot from an arbitrary sized PE and it will get loaded as the processor that that PE is. So if I make a 64-bit PE file and I hand that down to Eufy, it will literally boot that. It'll load it up as an executable, perform relocations if it needs to, it will move it into memory, it will load all of the different sections, make sure that they're laid out correctly, and begin execution. What that means is that we can have code executing in Eufy without writing any assembly. Without any assembly at all, we can have code executing in Eufy, which is really, really, really cool. That has gotten rid of these 32K and 512-byte limitations that require us to have kind of a smaller stage that's been designed. Maybe it has shittier logging support because we've basically cut down, like... When, when you're writing a bootloader, if, if you need to fit in a 32K limit or whatever the limit you impose on yourself for your size is... You basically are always stripping debug strings, you have limited interactivi interactivity, you have shitty debug information. You just end up stripping out a lot of the information that makes debugging and understanding what's going on in a bootloader, it, it becomes very difficult. And you'll see that in our chocolate milk bootloader, we didn't use strings at all. We didn't use format strings. We didn't print status messages. I think we printed a couple, but it was very basic, no formatting, no, we couldn't print hex. 
We couldn't print as structured content. We only could print a raw ASCII string effectively. Now, uh, since we're using Eufy, we don't have that constraint. And we don't give a shit. That's one thing that we'll put in here. Uh, considerations. Um, we don't care about machines with less than 4 gigs of RAM. We don't give a fuck. We don't care. We don't, we don't even remotely care. We're, we're not gonna bother designing this operating system. Now, it's still going to work on machines with, like, 2 megs of RAM, but if there is some decision that we make along the way of, like, we can ship a version of the kernel with debug symbols embedded in it, and we can parse those debug symbols to give a good backtrace on a crash, then we'll fucking do that. If that means that we're shipping down a 3 meg kernel when it's only 100k of code, I don't care. I don't care. Um, we are not going to cut corners and cut usability and debugability by trying to make things smaller or work on a wider variety of hardware, right? The 4 gig limit is ridiculous. We're, we're not, of course, this is going to run on a machine with tens of megs of RAM because we're not really going to be that picky with RAM. Um, but that is to kind of show my thought process, right? If something were to come up that if I require that there's 4 gigs of RAM and it allows me to get a 2x performance speed up, then I'll do that. Then I will gladly say, if you don't have 4 gigs of RAM, you can't run this OS. So that is an important consideration to understand that we don't care about things like that. Um, and thus, when we have this Eufy loader, it can load an arbitrarily sized executable. And that means that we can make the most verbose boot process we want. We can display a lot of strings, we can format structures, we can dump uh, internal versions of tables that we parsed out to see if they look correct. We can spew so much shit and format so much stuff because we don't care. We don't care about how big this binary ends up becoming. Um, and unlike our standard bootloader that we wrote for chocolate milk, we're going to have a lot more verbosity and a lot more information there. Cool. So... That is, uh, that's one of the reasons why we're doing that. Now, that means that we're not going to support machines that are from, like, prior to... I think, like, 2012 is probably the latest that you can get a machine that doesn't have Eufy support. I don't care. Once again, don't give a shit. Buy a newer computer. Sorry. <laughs> it, it just, I don't care. I, I don't have time to support legacy things. We have no interest in legacy stuff, so we'll also say that. Um... Uh, we don't care about legacy machines. Uh, if you don't have Eufy, too bad, right? It's cool. We're not even going to remotely think about adding bio support. So, yeah. Um, all right. So, basically, that Eufy firmware is then going to load. Uh, in this situation, it's going to uh, download a PE. And then that PE is going to get loaded. Oh, it's going to load PE. And then it's going to jump to the entry point of that PE, um, PE entry point, as, uh, in this case, 64-bit uh, long mode with a small identity map. And an identity map basically means, so in 64-bit mode on x86, you are required to have page tables. Um, and if you're required to have page tables, then um, you need to have some model of virtual memory access. And the model that they went with is simple. Just basically have virtual memory show up the same as physical memory. And they typically don't map all of memory. So if I have 700 gigs of RAM, it will probably only map in the first maybe 4 gigs of RAM into those page tables. So we'll have four, you know, probably four one gig entries, or maybe we'll have a bunch of 4K entries, but they will map in the first amount of RAM that we care about. But that is when we get code execution. That's it. So these are all things that are out of our control. At this point, we now have control. Now, what we're going to do is once we get that control, we're going to uh, use a Eufy uh, code to uh, display to standard out. So we're going to use that to basically, we're going to use the Eufy routines to output to the display. Um, and then I guess these things are like not in a particular order. We're going to use Eufy to get a memory map. Um, and I have the code to do all these things, and I might borrow that code depending on how clean it is, and we'll kind of see. But basically, we're going to use Eufy to get memory maps. We're going to use it to display things to standard out. 
And then what we're gonna do after uh, those things are done, and they're not necessarily operating in parallel, it just means that we don't really care when they do happen, uh, is what I'm trying to indicate with that, but I don't know if that's clear. Um, once those things are done, then what we're gonna do is actually create a new page table. So we're gonna have to have page table modification code in here. Um, and then we're going to uh, reload the kernel into the table. And then we're going to jump into the, um, and then this is uh, jump into our entry point, right? So Yuffie is going to jump into the actual entry point of the PE file, the executable. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to jump into our own entry point. Or maybe we'll jump into the entry point, but there will be some flag that will determine that it will then just jump to ours. What, whatever, however that will work out. Um, so effectively, the reason why we want to do that, and that arrow is very wrong. Uh, the reason why we want to do that... Um, is that we want to be able to handle soft rebooting. And soft rebooting um, is basically the concept that we are able to replace our executing kernel with a newer version of the kernel. And to do that, I don't want to have this transition. I don't want to transition from an unknown, uncontrolled execution environment into a controlled execution environment. Because we are going to have to do these things. When we do a soft reboot, right? When we have a soft reboot, let's say this for some reason did a soft reboot, then effectively we jump back into here where we download the latest version of the executable and then we load that executable and then we continue. Now, obviously, that is relying on Yuffie. And once we get to this stage, we might kill Yuffie, right? We might no longer have support for Yuffie when we get down to here. We might unload it. We might tell it to go fuck off so it frees some more memory and resources for us. Um, but ultimately, we might lose access to Yuffie. Now, we could design our kernel in a way that we always have Yuffie access. But in our situation, we're probably not going to do that. I'm not 100% sure yet. That's something that's up in the air. Thus, what we want to do is make sure that we can just do this loop instead, where we can go and kind of reset by jumping into the thing that loads the kernel itself. Now, another thing is that Yuffie is going to load that executable at, like, in a way that we don't necessarily understand. We can go read the spec and figure that out, but we might want more control. And one of the things that we want more control about that's a very exotic to the design of this operating system is we're actually going to do this, um, these stages, uh, we can get rid of this. This is going to happen for every core. And this is where it gets very strange, and this is one of the reasons why we need our own loader, is because these are going to actually happen um, on multiple cores. And the reason this is going to happen is because we have our rule that we talked about earlier, uh, that Rust-style operating system where uh, memory can be shared between cores only if it's read-only. Now, in this situation, the kernel has multiple copies. Uh, these have, like, globals. These have data sections and BSS sections that are mutable. And they're mutable. Like, we are not going to be able to change the compiler and the linker to the level that we can have it understand the environment that we're having it running under. So the best way to handle this is to literally load an identical copy of the kernel for every single core. So we are going to figure out the number of cores that we have, and then we're going to create a new page table, load the exe into it, hand that off to a core, and then a core is going to boot off of that, and then we're going to do the same thing for the next core and the next core and the next core. And once we get through this whole process, we will eventually converge to a point where every single core is running a completely different copy of the PE. Now, that has a really, really interesting side effect where ultimately globals are now thread locals. The, the, global, uh, the globals on your system are actually now thread locals. Right, because there's a copy of the PE for every core, and thus 
globals are thread locals. And that means that static mutables uh, are actually okay now. Um, now, there are some exceptions there. Uh, one of the biggest exceptions there is, of course, interrupts. Um, now, we're not going to have interrupts for devices. We're not going to have interrupts for doing networking. We're not going to have interrupts for timers or any of that boring old shit. Um, and that means that the uh, effectively, um, we might have... Uh, we're definitely going to have exception handlers. And we're going to have kind of two exception handlers. One exception handler is going to handle a fatal exception, which at that point, it's just going to basically display something that's like, fuck, I give up. Um, and then on the other point, we'll have an, another type of exception handler for page faults because we are definitely going to leverage page faults. Uh, a lot of this operating system is going to be built around page faults as a central mechanism to this operating system existing. Um, that is how we are going to handle uh, using very little memory. It's how we're going to handle sharing memory between cores. There's some crazy shit we're going to do, and page faults are going to happen a lot. Um, so that is effectively what I want to figure out. So uh, today, what I would like to do is uh, basically get most of this done. Um, hopefully, we'll get to multiple cores today. We're probably not going to do soft reboots today, maybe. Uh, that requires that we run a PE loader, although we can probably do a PE loader in an hour. So I think there's a small enough amount of work here. Uh, basically, um, write this first stage loader, write the Eufy data structures that allow us to interface with Eufy, allow us to display things, uh, write page table modification code that allows us to create page tables, write a physical memory manager that allows us to basically uh, know what physical memory is present and allocate that physical memory, uh, a virtual memory manager which is relatively basic where we can lay things out in virtual memory, an ACPI parser that's going to go through the ACPI tables and figure out how many cores are present and what the NUMA locality of memory is such that we can load these things into uh, the respective cores. Um, yeah, uh, basically what I like to have done at the end of today um, is having all of the cores being brought up and booting into their own copies of the PE. Uh, and that's effectively what I would like to do. So, that is the plan. Will you make the kernel fully pick uh, and or self-relocatable so you can fully customize the address space of the target? I don't plan on doing that, mainly because it it, it incurs a uh, performance penalty. So, we're going to actually do fixed address. We're going to load the uh, kernel at a fixed address um, because I, I don't want the extra instructions emit in the code because uh, pick code gets pretty expensive pretty fast. Um, so we're going to get rid of that, and it also means that constant propagation works better. Um, we're going to compile this to one big static unre unrelocatable executable if we can. Uh, Eufy might require some level of relocations. I'm not 100% sure. So we'll see. And obviously, even on a static binary, you still have to do some relocations. Well, I guess you don't have to do any if you literally load it at the same address. Um, but a pick binary, sometimes you have to fix up some like data sections. Um, but I don't know. We're probably not going to uh, do that. Uh, actually, I know we're not going to do that because I, I have no interest in that. It's unnecessary extra complexity that uh, decreases performance and increases complexity. And uh, those are two things that I want to avoid, like the plague or COVID or whatever. Um, Frank NK3, thank you so much for the two months of support. Absolutely. Hell yeah. All right. I'm going to take a quick bio break. I'm also going to crack open a bottle of wine. Uh, I'm going to throw a burrito in the oven, and then I'll be back in uh, probably five four or five minutes. Be right back.
Alright. Alright, we got some wine. Making the original SEO Unix that didn't have shared libraries either. Oh, fuck no. Yeah, no shared libraries here. I've never done sh uh, shared libraries in an OS. Oh, I love you too, Willbo007. Thank you so much. Wine time. Hell yeah. Oh, I got the... Oh, man, that... <laughs> the reindeer actually works really well on the Yeti. I don't understand anything, but I like burritos. <laughs> A burrito and wine, the finest of meals at 5 a.m. Hell yeah. See? There's steak in the burritos. Um, what time is it there? Yeah, it's 5 a.m. Cracking open a bottle of wine at 5 a.m. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. I worked on writing an ODBC driver manager for SEO Unix 95. Fun when there are no shared libraries. Wow, that's crazy. That's really cool. 5 p.m. somewhere. 5 a.m. locally. Yeah, see? What wine is that? It is a Cab Sav. I think the, I think it's a, a Josh. I don't, I don't know much about it. It's actually really good. Uh, but we're gonna wait a while for that to open up. So I probably, if I can resist, I'm probably going to try to resist drinking that for about 30 minutes and let that uh, air out nicely. Um, I probably won't be able to resist. But yeah, it's a cab staff. Um, so is Pixie Boot basically the starting point for grabbing the Yuffie binary after Cargo makes it? Yeah, so basically Cargo, we'll use Cargo to build this binary, right? And, and that'll be like any other thing that you build. It'll just end up in the target directory, this executable. Then we're going to copy that executable into wherever our Pixie server, or more specifically, our TFTP server is hosting it. So the way that it typically works is your DHCP server... Um, basically when you're, when you boot your computer and your computer, your BIOS goes to get a DHCP lease, it will go over the network and send that broadcast packet to request a DHCP lease. Now DHCP, if you've never worked with it before, it's a bunch of TLV options. It's, it's just a bunch of TLV fields and the T just specifies different things. And, and you, that can be your your domain name, that can be your boot file path, that can be your actual address, that can be a, a router path and an NTP server path. Basically, DHCP can convey a, a nearly arbitrary amount of information because you can just add a new uh, option value or option enum variant or whatever you want to call it. Um, so the way that it typically works is you go into your DHCP server, whatever, whatever is actually responding to DHCP broadcasts on your network or subnet, whatever your network configuration is, that is on you. Um, and then you modify your DHCP server to ship up a boot file name as well as a TFTP server name. Um, and sometimes that's like the next boot server. It, it It's the terminology there can sometimes be unclean in, in the way that it is done, but basically, in the DHCP lease, you provide the IP as well as the name of the file to fetch, and then the bootloader will get that information from the DHCP lease, it will go to that server, and then do a TFTP request, it's basically TFTP, Trivial File Transfer Protocol, it's a super, super, super simple UDP-based um, file transfer protocol, and it will go over that file transfer protocol and request that binary, pull it down, and of course, now your server has that, has the file, right? The file has made it from your Rust build directory that you copied into whatever your TFTP server is, maybe you had to copy it to another machine on the network that is the TFTP server. Once again, that's up to you. So there's a couple things in play that um, I think can be a trap for young players because uh, some of this configuration is confusing, but the DHCP server tells the BIOS or tells the receiver of that lease where the, where the TFTP server is and the file name to request from that TFTP server. And then the TFTP server, it's on you to host a TFTP server at that IP that you specify. And then you configure your TFTP server, and somewhere in the config file, you probably tell it the directory that it chroots into and serves files from there, and thus that file name now 
corresponds with the file that you place there. So you have to make sure that it ends up in whatever TFTP server code that you have. Um, and then, of course, once the server has actually downloaded that binary, it just it loads it, right? It's a PE file. It has a PE loader. It will parse the PE sections, figure out where things need to be placed in memory, place them at those locations, and jump into it. And that's it. Um, uh, that's, that's it. Super simple. Uh, just a fast question. How do you implement a tool like Maces in Linux? Uh, just the exact same way as Maces is done, except you'd be using the uh, Ptrace APIs. Um, it's going to suck more because Ptrace is awful, and I'm going to resist drinking this wine until until it breathes, uh, I think. I'm going to resist that. I'm probably not. Um, once I start writing code, I probably won't be able to. <laughs> but yeah, I hope that answers your pixie boot question uh, quite well. Hell yeah. Can't you just TFTP from the target directory? Um, I mean, sure, there's nothing stopping you from doing that, but most, most enterprises or most networks um, have a TFTP server on the network. And obviously, you're not going to have multiple TFTP servers on the network. So if, so if I'm working on a team and we've got 50 people in the office and we have a Pixie server that is serving up an Ubuntu live CD image as well as a Windows live CD image, of course, I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to be able to hijack the DHCP. Obviously, like, technically you can. Um, but in most real configurations, there's an existing Pixie server already configured, and you have to place it in there. But yeah, for locally, when you're doing testing, yeah, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from just feeding those files directly out of the target directory. And that's relatively close to probably what we'll do here. Um... Is the wine breathing thing an actually true? Absolutely, it it absolutely is. Yeah, it, it's a it's a it's a major major difference. It, it gets much much sharper. Um, it, it just it gets much more intense. Um, and I like earthy intense wines. So typically, right out of the bottle, they like even if it's not a very sweet wine, it often tastes too sweet to me until that air really starts fucking it up. So it, it is. It is a, a very, very strong difference. It, it's not it's not the subtle difference that, like, some snooty person would say. Like, a, an average person would absolutely be able to notice it, 100%. Um, let's see here. Sure, but you're not in a team. You're doing this by yourself is a practical question. I also have TF TFTP servers, right? I have a network here comprising of, like, 30 different servers. So I... I probably have a more sophisticated network here than most 10 to 20 person companies have. So like, it also applies. Um, as wishing I had wine, it turns out I do. Ah, oh, that sounds fantastic. Um, so the main idea is to place a CC opcode at every basic block. Uh, it seems like the perf would be super awful. I mean, it's not, right? The the perf, once you remove the breakpoint, there's no cost, right? The cost converges to zero. Um, and that's why Maces is so awesome. Like, breakpoints don't cost anything if they don't exist. So they, you basically, you pay like a, a 0.1 millisecond, like a 100 microsecond cost every time you hit new code coverage. And then after two seconds of running your fuzzer, you're basically never hitting new coverage anymore. <laughs> like, because it's so logarithmic. How does your network setup look uh, at a high level? Just a bunch of switches and PFSense. That's pretty much it. Obviously, I have, like, a bunch of NTP servers and TFTP servers and and uh, the DHCP servers that those, I guess, come off of uh, PFSense. Um, yeah, mainly I just have, like, a... I do most of my stuff through just SSH alone, pretty much. Um, everything Ubiquity? No. No, I have no Ubiquity stuff. Um, I guess technically I have a, a Wi-Fi access point that's uh, Ubiquity, but my online network, I don't have a... I don't even... I don't even have any servers on this network. It's it's literally like my laptop, my desktop, and my phone, and my router are on this network. It's very, 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 very light. Um... This network's boring as fuck. <laughs> this network's super boring. All right. 
Um, okay, so the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we are able to build a kernel in Rust. And uh, since we are on Gen 2, sometimes these things can be a bit of a problem. So uh, let's just go into Fuzz OS. And we'll do cargo uh, init bin, and that has created a new Fuzz OS. Obviously, that's not going to actually work like that. But we can change cargo toml and... Um, in this window, I guess I can go into Yuffie. Yeah, let's just see what we did here. So we used a make file, and we're actually not going to do that. Um, so we should be able to do this entirely with cargo config. Uh, so we'll do cargo, and we'll do a config. Oh, you know what? It's now config.toml, I think I read. I'm going to check that quick. Uh, Yeah, they, they changed the um, cargo config. Yeah, it's now uh, config.toml. So, yeah, both work. Yep, but this is more correct because this is the direction that they're going. Um, oh, command aliases. I didn't know you could do that. Oh, that's really cool. And then what we should be able to do is build, and then we can say uh, target. And what I'm looking at right now, uh, sometimes I'm not going to put these things on the screen because I only have so much real estate, but I'm basically looking at this. Ultimately, all I really care about, uh, target is equal to moose, and then hopefully when we go to build this, it will fail. Um, you know, I'm going to move this over here as well. Okay, and then we'll go into Fuzz OS, cargo run, and uh, let's see. Yeah, it doesn't know how to build for moose, and that is fantastic. So what we want is Rusty uh, print target list. And we have to pick which one of these sounds the best. And if we just grab for EFI, we'll find that there's an x 664 unknown Yuffie. And that is clearly the one that we want to use. Um, and we should be able to do cargo run. Can't find crate for standard. Um, so let's see what I can do here. Rust flags is equal to... Oh, wow! Nice! I think that's new. There was not Rust flags before. Wow. Huh. Okay, so we should be able to say um, that we want to pass in build standard, uh, which is basically a flag indicating what we want to build. And we'll say we'll build the core library for now. Um, is that going to work? Dash C. Oh, it's dash, dash Z. Thank you. Oh, wait. Wait. No, I think it is C, isn't it? What? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's definitely Z. What is going on here? Build standard, a cargo run. I guess maybe it's... Hmm? Unknown debugging option. Oh, this is a cargo flag. Um, so how do I pass to, how do I pass in a cargo flag? Um, let's see. Now I can make a make file, but I'm trying to, the, the more things that I can do in the cargo environment, the better, because then I don't have to worry about uh, having Windows versus Linux compatibility here, right? Uh, ideally, this is just gonna work fantastic. So cargo config toml, and then maybe there's just a thing I can pass in here. Oh, is it just this? Can I just do this? Unused key, okay. Um, unstable? Expected a list, but wow. Wow, that's so cool! Nice! Okay, so obviously that's not going to run yet. Um, and then we can maybe, we can actually probably make cargo run work, maybe? Um, 
All right, there's no standard, of course, and that is because our actual code. We just need to say uh, no standard here. And let's start with that. See if we can still have a main entry point. I don't know if we can. We need a panic handler. So I'm just going to go and grab that. Um, uh, I'm just going to steal a panic handler that I have already. I have no idea why I'm not able to... Oh, I have caps lock on. Okay, that makes sense. There we go. All right. So the panic handler is basically something that handles panics, and we'll go and write that ourselves when we get to it. Um, and we'll pull in panic info, and we'll move this into another file as well. But effectively, we have to implement that. And this is the code that executes when a panic occurs, right? So when the OS panics, that's going to happen. And then we also need to do... Um, I'm just going to steal this as well. And we'll just say no main. No main. And then, of course, uh, we'll implement those things later. But this should now be an entry point, And we have successfully built that. So if we do a object on D target. Oh, you know what? So I saw something here that was beautiful. Check this out. So in I can do an alias here. And I can do a uh, disasm, and we'll do, um, I guess, will this rely on it building? I don't know. I don't know how I make this depend on it building. But we'll just do obj dump uh, d or m intel. Oh, these are going to add to cargo flags. Shit. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do that then. Hmm. Unless I could escape it in some way. Maybe I could. Uh, but anyways, we'll just do objump m intel d target this debug and then fuzzos.efi. Okay. So obviously we don't have any debug info in there. So what we're going to do... and we, we do. This is actually probably made like uh, PE information, and we're gonna just switch this to using uh, dwarf debug information, and we'll do this by passing in a linker flag. So we'll do link args is equal to, um, oh, can I do that? Link, um, So there's build script override. I can do flags for that target. Yeah, so I can, I mean, I can obviously add that with Rust flags here, um, but I'm trying to see if there's a more correct way for me to do that. And I don't see one, so we'll just do Rust flags is equal to, and more specifically, we can now say, um, that sets the default target, and then here we can say target x6664, unknown Yuffie, and we'll say rust flag c uh, link args is equal to uh, debug dwarf. And what that is going to do is basically uh, set things up such that we use dwarf debugging information uh, when we build this. And that means that uh, the standard Unix tools will actually understand the debug information. So it's kind of weird. We have a PE file with dwarf debug information, but that works totally fine here. Um, so we should be able to now see that. And yep, now we see that this is called EFI main. Isn't that cool? Isn't that nifty? What's your words per minute? Uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 80 to 120, depending on the, the feeling. So yeah, isn't that cool? So now we see that debug stuff, and this is now a valid Eufy program that we can go and boot up. So what I'm going to do is C. Um, hmm. I'm trying to think if I want to use a make file or not. Now, obviously, I have everything here, and in, in the fact that I can just do cargo build. Uh, is super, super fucking cool. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, that is going to fault to uh, Rust LLD as the linker. 
Um, so this should just work out of the box on Windows as well, which is really cool. Um, oh, cargo install directory. That's kind of cool. And profile all that information. Do do do. I think this is pretty good. You wrote a, a project with uh, EFI console out and memory map uh, quite recently? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we're probably going to use some of that. So, but here's what I'm going to grab. Um, uh, we're going to do kimu.sh, and then we're going to make a script. And this is going to run our program in Kimu. And let me just see if user share OVMF, mm, user local share OVMF, mm, user find star grep OVMF code. Okay, so I do have that. Um, this. So basically, and, and we can clean this up. We'll say uh, run with KVM support, amount of memory, no graphic, uh, the BIOS that we want to use, and then this is going to be basically that uh, UFI firmware. Then the device, um, and then this is kind of confusing, but what we're doing is uh, Kimu has an, a built-in TFTP server, and what we're basically saying is uh, use this as the TFTP directory, uh, and we'll just say debug for now. And then the boot file is going to be equal to uh, fuzz OS. So effectively, this is going to create a 64-bit Kimu VM using KVM for uh, uh, virtualization acceleration. We can build this, we'll give it 128 megs of RAM. We're not gonna have any graphics on this. Uh, this is gonna be the UFI BIOS that we're gonna use. We're gonna have one device, which is an E1000 network card. And then that is going to be networked with a fake TFTP server, which is going to serve out of this directory and boot uh, this file. So what we should be able to do is kimu.sh and hopefully um, this will just do its thing. And there we go. So it booted and it probably ran and just did nothing because our OS does nothing. Right? Um, so what I'm going to do is chemo.sh. We're just going to do a cargo build in here. So part of that, okay, so that'll make sure, and then, okay. And I don't know why Kimu is so slow here on that uh, initial access, but whatever. We're just going to do unsafe, and we'll just do standard uh, core, core pointer, write volatile. Uh, uh, we'll just do this. We're just going to write that, and this should hopefully crash. Oh, no mem compare, no mem set. Okay, so there are a couple things that we have to implement, um, and I'm going to go grab those quick from... Just because they're boring. Um... Yuffie core requirements, why 1000, and we're just going to grab this. Uh, source core requirements, requirements dot uh, rs, and then this, this holds the lib core, and then we're going to just look through here and make sure they're sane. So uh, mem copy is going to just do a uh, move sb uh, of rcx bytes. RDI is the destination, RSI is the source, okay? Then we have a memcopy implementation, which is going to go to memcopy internal, memmove, uh, which is going to find those correct directions, and it's going to copy n bytes at a time. Um, and I think we actually polished this code relatively well. Uh, storing bytes, just stow sb, so that's memsets. Um, 
And that looks good. No mangle on all of those. Basically, we implement the things that like the internal compiler uses. Uh, and we're just gonna do a pub mod core requirements. Can I just do mod core requirements here? Oh yeah, and then we'll just have to do uh, feature is asm. And I think we are using the latest assembly. Let's just double check these and we'll, we'll read through these quick. But yeah, that, that's fantastic that that crashed. Um, so libc mem copy. We've got a destination, a source, and number of bytes to copy. Then it returns a pointer to the destination. Let's just double check. Um, and this is returns um, pointer to uh, dest. Right. Okay, and we specify that this is only for x86-64. Um, so if we tried to build this for ARM, it wouldn't it wouldn't happen. And uh, repeat move SB, uh, RCX size and bytes, RDI destination, RSI, and then we know that the Eufy spec specifies uh, that you must you must. Uh, have the direction flag clear. So we can rely on the direction flag being clear, and that's good. Um, same thing here. Uh, man, yep. So we have that internal implementation. And I don't know why we have internal, but what we're going to do is just have no mangle on this one. I actually have no idea why we called that internal. Oh, I guess we call it from those. Hmm. I can't remember if there was a reason for that. I'm going to just nuke it for now. And let's double check our comments. Memcopy implementation Rust. Uh, it's not overlap safe. Okay, there we go. Libc memcopy implementation in Rust. Um, it's not overlap safe. Obviously, that is going to have issues, and that is good. That is memcopy. Wow, is that food already ready? Be right back. All right, so I do have my burrito here. Um, let's just double check these. That's That mem copy looks fantastic. So dest, source, and n. Then we're going to copy there. Okay, libc mem move implementation in Rust. Man, mem move. And then we're going to look at this. And this returns a pointer to dest. So we'll also put that in there. Fantastic. Uh, why not using build standard features, compiler built-ins mem? I guess I could, but I think they have pretty bad implementations. I think their mem routines are very slow. Um...
Like, on a factor of, like, four times slower. Okay. So here we made a mem move. Returns that. Death source and N. And then... Let's just double check this code. Check if there's overlap between them. So if the dest is after the source and source wrapping at n is greater than dest. Um, yep, so if there is overlap, then we do this overhang thing. Otherwise, we just copy forwards. Um, that point, there's no longer overlap. Oh, so that will adjust those pointers. Dest and source. Okay. Let's see. But yeah, this logic was relatively complex. Um, compute the delta between the source and the destination. If the overhang is less than 64, if it's quite small, don't even bother doing forward-based chunk copies, just copy in reverse. So 8 byte align the destination. Uh, while n is not equal to 0, then... Um, Yep, wait for it to be aligned. Okay. And we just do the copy, then do it eight bytes at a time. Okay, subtract the eight. Then we do the read and the copy, write the value in, then copy the remainder and return dest. Okay. And then if there's a large discrepancy, then we'll call like mem copy in a loop and go forwards in those chunks, um, and that looks good. And then check if we copied everything. And if we didn't, then we fall through here, and we copy forwards for the remaining part out front. Fantastic. Okay, then we have mem set. Um, SCN, and then we'll just say uh, returns original uh, pointer to S. Okay, and let's just double check. Um, EAX, yeah, EAX does not change in this case, which is good. Um, and Stos B, nice. Then mem compare, and then this is uh, returns. Um, the difference between S1, difference between the first, um, difference between, ah, the difference between the first unmatching bytes between uh, S1 and S2, uh, or zero if, the two memory regions are identical. And I think we tried to make a faster version of this and it just didn't seem to be a big performance increase. Okay. So those look like good implementations, actually uh, high quality, um, which is nice. Normally my OSs don't have those. Isn't that the memcopy implementation that gave birth to the pizza signal? I think so. Okay, we had an invalid opcode. I see. Um, but yeah, we're, our code is obviously running because we see that value in R9. All right. And we should be able to object dump and we can see all of the code for our kernel. It's not optimized for size or anything, so obviously it's going to be pretty bloaty. All right. Okay. Um, fuck yeah. Sorry for eating while chatting. But too fucking bad. That's what you get here on this stream. <laughs> too Fucking bad. 
All right. Um, so. What do we want to do? So I think I have some of the EFI structures. I'm going to just grab that. Uh, honestly, I think this code was pretty good. XD. And let's make sure this code quality is good. We'll, we'll basically just do a read through. There's no reason to rewrite this code. If the code quality is fine, obviously if something looks amiss, then we'll rewrite it. <laughs> Nine monitors are enough. Barely. I mean, technically I have 10 here. <laughs> Hey, chat, chat doggy. How are you doing? Chat doggy. B shocks. Thank you so much for the three months of support. Hell yeah. All right. Um, this file contains the basic UFI FFI structures. These are not complete and are intended to only be filled in with the information that we use in our kernel. If a structure variable name is prefixed with an underscore, it means that the variable is filled in with an equivalent size representation, but not the actual type. We'll use this to lazily set a pointer to a complex type um, as a use size if we don't actually have a use for the structure. Cool. And this is what I would have implemented anyways. <clears throat> um... A pointer to the EFI system table, which is saved upon entry to the kernel. We need to access this table to do input and output to the console. Okay. So I effectively make a... Um, I effectively make a global here that just holds kind of a pointer such that we can use it later. Register system table pointer. This is, of course, unsafe. Um, yep, so I use that when I provide that in here. So what I'm going to do... We're kind of basically just starting off with what we had before in this kernel. And what we should be able to do is pull in uh, EFI. And we'll pull in the things that we use in EFI as well. And I will do these afterwards. Okay. Oh, do I have prints in here already? Shit. All right, we'll uh, grab that code quick too, and we'll take a look at we'll take a look at this code once it's building, and just uh, show you kind of what what this does. But it it's basically gives us printing, and we wrote this recently enough that there's really not much room for improvement here. Um, and then here we can do I guess macro use mod uh, print. Is that what I want? Oh yeah, I have to do that first. Okay. And then if I status, found that, 22 at the end here, okay. So there's a couple things that I think I do with EFI. I'm, at this point, I'm basically just stealing the things that I've, I've done before in the previous kernel. Um, register the system table. And then uh, we'll just uh, we'll just panic here. Moose, that's gonna be our panic message, and then we're gonna steal the old panic that we had, and we'll paste it into here. Okay. I know it's really boring when we copy paste stuff like that, uh, but we're just trying to get this done, building, running, and then we can talk about what's actually going on and do basically a code review of what we're doing. So we'll do a uh, panic info message. All right, here we go. And hopefully we get a panic here. And there it is. So you got a panic, um, a source and a line. And then of course the uh, panic message. Okay. So let's look at print because it's very simple. Um, 
This file has, handles the print macro, which allows displaying information to the UEFI standard out console. Um, we have a dummy screenwriter, which has no payload. And that's basically what we implement the screenwriter trait on. Um, or we implement write on screenwriter, which then means we can use it uh, down here. Write string is just going to call uh, EFI output string and pass the string. So that's where all of that logic actually happens. And then this is the standard Rust macro. So this is going to support a bunch of arguments, um, or the standard print macro. It's going to support a bunch of arguments, and then it's going to pass those to format args, um, which it will pass as an argument to a screenwriter instance uh, to write format. And we're using full paths here because we are using this in a macro. And that means we might be uh, using this in, in many different uh, contexts where we have different paths for the current module. So we use uh, hard-coded full paths here. But effectively, all this is doing is it's calling write format on screenwriter, which is implemented for us as long as we implement write string. And then we pass in a screenwriter instance, which is just a unit structure. It holds no information. And then we pass in the format arguments. Uh, we use the format arguments macro on that, which will invoke the right, or will create an argument structure, which will then have the right format implementation called right string when it's needed to. Effectively, this just is the print macro, and I see nothing here that I want to change. This looks totally fine to me. Okay. I, I seriously see there's nothing in here that I would change. Um, so I'll move on. Um, core requirements, we already looked through. So now we're looking at this. This is the EFI stuff. Now the reason why we have to save that system table in a global, that is because the, um, the print macro doesn't get a self argument. It doesn't get a this pointer. And thus, the only way that we can get access to that system table in a print macro is if we placed it in a global. And we do that with an atomic pointer, so we store that in here. So this function is an unsafe function that we use. Um, compare and swap. If it is null, then replace it with the system table um, and do it sequentially consistent. There's no reason to go with a more relaxed memory ordering here. It doesn't matter. Basically, this allows us to register that table, which is passed to us as an argument to EFI main. So that's passed to us through the, uh, through the EFI firmware. And all we do is we just register that. We just say, this is where you can find the EFI, e, UEFI or the EFI system table. Okay, here's output string. So once again, we don't have a this pointer and thus we just have the string. So the first thing that we do is we get the system table. If it is null, then we return because obviously we can't do any printing. And if it's not, then we get the console out from that uh, EFI structure. We create a temporary buffer that's capable of holding 31 characters at a time, plus a null terminator. Um, basically, we're going to do a UTF-8 to UCS-2 conversion. Um, so apparently, UFI uses UCS-2 and not uh, UTF-16. So we don't have to worry about 32-bit code points. Basically, we just have to convert everything um, into their 16-bit code points. So we'll go through all of the characters, encode them into UTF-16. This is doing an iterator. Um, if it's equal to a new line, um, then we will add... Um, we will add a carriage return and update in use. So basically, this will convert all new lines into CRLFs, and that's going to help us with output when we're working with... Um, Certain like consoles, especially serial consoles, require carriage returns. And this means that we don't put carriage returns on everything in our code. Uh, we will just have the carriage return added whenever a new line occurs. So if we see a new line, update that in use plus equals one. Then we store the character um, plus equals one. If we made it to the end of this buffer, then we null terminate the buffer write out the buffer uh, by calling output string. That's actually invoking the UFI code. Clear the buffer and continue. And this is basically allowing us to convert on the stack. Um, and then if in use is greater than zero at the end of the function, then we write out the remaining things. And you just saw that reboot here. Um, and there's actually a reason for that rebooting. Uh, UFI has a watchdog that I think is set to five minutes by default. 
and we don't disable that. To disable that, we need to basically unregister the UFI services, and that's something that we'll have to do. Well, fuck. Um, maybe replace macro use with explicit macros import. I'm pretty sure you have to use macro use for that. Um. It's the only way that you're going to get access to that macro without using it every time. 6 Am burger? No, this is a burrito. <laughs> okay. We have a get memory map. Um, get the system table. If it's null, return. Create an empty memory map. Um... And I think we encode the memory map in there. If I handle, it's a void star, status code, scan codes. These are just a bunch of like enums. Um, this is, if this is available post exit boot services, this will take a memory type and basically tell you whether or not that memory is usable after you exit. Um, once you stop using boot services, there are some things in EFI itself that become available for general purpose uh, memory. So we do that. <clears throat> EFI memory type, that's just a from. That allows us to kind of round trip those. Table headers. These look good. <laughs> Honestly, these look pretty good. Boot services. There's the actual function call for memory map. And then we'll have another function call exit boot services there. Text protocols, uh, reset. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't see anything there that's really a problem. Nice. Um, so, let's do a get memory map. This will, in theory, uh, get the memory map. <laughs> How complex is that? Uh-oh. EFI status. 114. Ooh. Ooh. You got a failure. Okay. Well... Hmm. Why would that fail? Strawberry Hacker, thank you so much for the four months of support. Hell yeah. For some reason, that's giving us an EFI. Okay. Let's find the Yuffie spec. And we got to figure out why that's happening. All right. Here is the Yuffie spec. And we need to go figure out what that status code is. <coughs> Fakinor, thank you so much for the tier, uh, for the Twitch Prime sub. Hell yeah. Fasinor? Fasinor? <laughs> I have no idea how to say that. Hmm. And where's the status code? EFI status. There we go. Um... Okay, main spec in this range. And then if the high bit is set, then a five is buffer too small. Oh, huh. Well, look at that. <clears throat> oh shit, we got a train, hype train. Hell yeah, thank you so much. The, the X even, 
the Exavin. Thank you so much for the three months of support. Another hype train. Yeah, it's fucking crazy, guys. Thank you so much for the submarinos. Um. So that's an easy fix. It just means that. Oh. So. Is the memory map just bigger than 2K? Um. What? <laughs> All right. Four K. Here we go. Okay, sweet. That worked. Uh, I'm going to uh, get rid of this plate. I'll be right back. Oh shit. Re Rebel e Rebel Elder? Thank you so much for this tier one sub. Hell yeah. Got a little apple here. We're gonna have a good healthy snack. Sorry man, I wanna sleep a little more, but I'll be back in an hour. Get some sleep. Hell yeah. No problem with that. This knife is almost too small for this. This is a gigantic apple actually. Fuck, it's struggling. It's struggling! We got it. We got it. The hard part's done. Oh, yeah. How's everyone doing today? Anything fun? Anything exciting going on in people's lives? Are people starting their holidays already? About to finish work. Oh, nice. Nice, you.
Nice. Uh, Shadowlands is super fun, really? Uh, I don't want to hear that. That's not what I want to hear. I'm invested into classic. I can't play Shadowlands. Got too much going on. Can't parse on two characters. All right. Noise. And now I got an apple. Oh yeah. What do you use for your offline cargo mirror, Panamax? Yeah, I switched to using Panamax recently. It's okay. It's got a, it seems to break every once in a while unless I delete the index, but whatever. Okay. So what we can do is we can see all the memory here that can be used. Um, oh. So see that five minute reboot? So we have to unregister the boot services. And we'll do that by calling this, which is on the same as get memory map. And we have to pass it the EFI handle. And then the map key. I forget how that works. Um, okay. What? I, I swear I saw it right there. Exit. Exit. Boot. Oh, yeah. It's a PDF, so searching doesn't fucking work. Um, <laughs> let's just look at the... Hopefully the system table. Uh, let's just find it. Probably take less time. <laughs> Fucking PDFs, dude. They're so bad. Come on. Where are they? Um, maybe they're down in here. Um, so this is the set watchdog timer. So this is how you set that uh, watchdog timer. But I think in our situation, um, exit returns control back to boot services exit boot services terminates all boot services uh it's called by the currently executing ufi os loader to terminate all boot services on success the ufi os loader becomes responsible for the configured operation of the system oh yeah i remember how this works now you do a get memory map and then that gives you a key and then you pass that key to exit boot services um Yeah, that key. Um, okay. And what does it do? Um, on success. It owns all available memory in the system. Um, can treat code and data as free. EFI boot services code and data. Let's double check those. EFI boot services code and data, conventional memory and persistent memory. Yep. Um, it's a toggle bit. Thank you so much for the raid. Hell yeah. How are you doing? How's your stream? I'm getting a development board tomorrow, but I'll wait until uh, January to set it up, I guess. What uh, what kind of dev board are you getting? Where are you going to try to dev? Hmm. No further calls to boot service functions or EFI device handle-based protocols may be used. And the boot service's watchdog timer is disabled. Okay, cool. Several feuds to the EFI system table should be set to null. Con in handle, con out handle. Oh, shit. Am I using those? Hmm.
Wait a minute. So, am I using those? Well, um, things in the system table. I think so. I was hoping I could use this once I exit boot services, but maybe I can't. Eventually, I'll be able to give you your 2,500 viewers back. Oh, yeah, that was just temporary. I'm not worried about it. Um, con out? Hmm. Yeah, console out right there. I feel like I didn't read that before. And you gotta clear those things? Fuck. Wait. How do I make that work? Um, they should be set to null. They include those. And why, though? Why would these be in the system service table if they're a boot service? Um, I don't get it. Um, wait, are you 27? You're 27? Hell yeah. I'm 27 and I look like I'm 27. Have you, have you considered going bald? Have you considered balding? Um, anyway, nice setup. Hell yeah. Thank you. Um, that returns a valid parameter. Yep. So we can call exit boot services, but do I want to? I guess I have to, unless I want to use EFI for allocations. Ah, man. I mean, like, right, I can write a serial port driver. That's fucking easy. But, like, I kind of really wanted to use their built-in display stuff. Right? Hmm. And now I'm kind of sad. Okay. Um... Set mem, copy mem, memory allocation services. So let's see here. I mean, do I just not? I don't know. I think I think I want to exit that process. Allocate pages. Memory type. Yeah, I don't want this. Like, it, it does roughly what I want to do, but not quite. And you can't even give it NUMA node, can you? Nope. No, you cannot. And it's only contiguous? Yeah, that's gross. Um, so, I guess we just have to write a serial port driver. We lose our ability to display. That makes me sad. That makes me really sad. I can't believe they make you do that. I mean, it does make sense. Um... Must be signaled. 
must be signaled before that return success. The events are only signaled once, even if it was called multiple times. Um, get the map. Returns invalid parameter and that blah, blah, blah must be called again. Uh, from an implementation may choose to do a partial shutdown. Shouldn't make calls to anything else. Wait, it shouldn't, should not make calls to any boot service function other than the memory allocation services? Why would I be able to call those then? Hmm. Uh... Owns all of this stuff, including services code and data. No further calls to these or device handle based protocols may be used. And the boot services watchdog timer is disabled. On success, several fields of the EFI should be set to this, which include these handles. Um, okay. And since fields of that are being modified, then the CRC must be recomputed. I'm actually not going to zero those out. What I'm going to do is. I'm just gonna disable EFI then at that point. So what we're gonna do is when we get to uh, get memory map, unsafe, and then this is going to unregister, um, or this is exit boot services. Services. And then what does this look like? Something like this, yikes. Yikes. Nice, nice typing. Nice typing. Uh, we're just going to do exit boot services. Then we have an image handle, which is the EFI handle, and then the map key. Okay. Handle that identifies the exiting image, which is, I'm guessing, this. So we'll just say image handle. Then we'll pass that into here. Oops. Uh, image handle, EFI handle. Then we'll pass in the image handle here, and then we'll pass in the uh, this key here. And we'll just do key plus one, just to see. And then assert ret is zero. We'll just start with that. This should fail. Good. All right. This should not fail. Fuck. What is that error code? Invalid parameter. We pass in the image handle. That goes into here. Boot services. Exit boot services. It's just C matrix over there. Um, okay, well that's confusing. I'm trying to figure out why that's returning a failure. It, it shouldn't be. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe it should be. Key. Let's, uh, let's print the key. See if that's a good looking key. I don't know what a key is supposed to look like. I'm assuming relatively random. That might be relatively random. I'm so confused. Why would that be failing? Um, that 
once you call that, only these things are valid. Yup, and that's fair. Um, matrix wallpaper is a bit cliche. That 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 might be the point. That might be the point. Um. Where the fuck is this? Okay. If the map key is not correct, it returns invalid parameter. I did save the code, right? Yep. Exit boot services. Pass it the image handle. Um. Shit. God, this apple's so fucking good. <laughs> this apple is unreal. Oh, wow. I fucking love apples, hell yeah. <laughs> Where's your hair? It's right here. It's right here. You see you see this? You see this hair? I understand. Yeah, it slid down. Cyberpunk barely runs on Grizzly. Oh shit. Yeah, let me catch up with chat. I feel like this is the third or fourth time I've watched you write a serial driver. Yeah, that's pretty fair. We do this a lot. Um, I really like the camera vantage point of this stream. It's refreshing to get an over-the-shoulder uh, view you don't uh, see in many streams. Okay, can we get a yays in chat if you like the camera angle and nays in chat if you don't like the camera angle? Because I have kind of always wondered if it's a good angle. <laughs> Okay, okay, everyone likes the fucking camera angle. <laughs> okay. Uh, have you ever surfed or skied? Oh, yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of ski. So I started out as a snowboarder in middle school, um, and maybe even before then. And then I switched to skiing maybe like a couple years ago just to change it up. Um, I don't know, like, to be honest, the reason I switched from snowboarding to skiing is because the the level of the the level of risk that I needed to take on a snowboard was getting to enjoy snowboarding was getting to a bad level so I basically switched to skiing because now I suck at it and I can pizza down a green and I'm like fucking amped <laughs> Skiing feels so much freer though. Yeah, I haven't gotten that yet. Mainly what I want to be able to do is like glades. So I want to be able to just like weave in and out of trees and shit. And snowboards are just not the best for that. They're, you can do it, uh, but they're just not as good, of course. Um, but I still love snowboarding. I love fucking doing tricks and shit. It's so goddamn fun, dude. <laughs> Ever in Europe? No, I've actually never been to Europe. I'm, uh, I've been missing out on that. So, I really need to, like... Well, I was gonna go this year. I was gonna go to Europe multiple times this year. Michael Reeves almost raided you again so close. Whew. Whew. He had me sweating. <laughs> I saw someone was saying that earlier. I was like, fuck. Hey, <laughs> we got code to write. <laughs> You would love Switzerland, Austria, and Italy in the context of skiing. I've thought about moving to Switzerland, actually. Um, skiing is so much cooler than a snowboard. I mean, come on. We all know snowboard snowboarders are just cooler. Like, you're not going to get pot off of the skiing, dude. Come on. Like, if you're on the chairlift... 
And you got some snowboarders on there. <laughs> you know, you know what's gonna go down on that that lift. Skiers? Nah, too basic. <laughs> Um, pretty sure the invitation to Rube is still open. Percent COVID. When is that? P zero is that Swiss, uh, Project Zero at Switzerland? Yeah, that's what that's what I've thought. Is like do Project Zero in Switzerland? Ruhr University Bochum, Bochum. I have no idea how to say, like, half the fucking German universities. I guess I don't know if they're German. I'm assuming there's a Europe, uh, a German influence there. <laughs> Rube is German. Okay. Whew. Um, all right. Why is this not working? Uh, old timer event activity must be stopped. That's firmware's job. Not my problem. Um, map key is incorrect. Okay, so apparently that only happens if map key is incorrect. But, 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 mom, fuck. What? Uh, is it changing during that first memory map? Let's just call this twice. Uh-huh. When in doubt, call it twice. Uh, it failed the second time. With a with a 5? What? Oh, because those got updated. Okay, fair, 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 fair. Wait, do I have to give it a size of these structures as an input? So, I'm curious if I got really lucky with the last implementation that I did. Maybe key has to be a zero? Oh, no, it's size. It's size. 100% just size. <laughs> that four monitors, yeah, ten in total. All right. The the che is like the back of your throat kind of sound. University. <laughs> <laughs> Eighty percent there. <laughs> what the fuck? I was like, I was, I was mocking it. I was, I wasn't trying to be right. <laughs> Pretty happy with that. Um, <laughs> all right, so if no one noticed what happened there, the key changed. Basically, the key changed by doing the the. We got some we got some Schrodinger in here. Basically, by observing the memory map, we changed the key. Um, or it just always increment. No, that did not increment by one. So, mom, 
Mom, why is Yuffie so difficult? Um... Try 100 times to get the memory map and exit the boot services. Um, this is needed because getting the memory map seems like it can change. Wait, did this still fail? No, that still failed at the end. I'm curious if that even matters. Key. Like, the key, the key changed. Well, that makes no fucking sense. It didn't change again, did it? No, uh... No, uh... No... N3K, 1990. Thank you so much for the three months of support. Wait, what? That's a tier two, and it's for three months in advance? I didn't know you could advance things, but thank you so much for that. Hell yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that existed. When did they add that? Shit, I hope I haven't missed other people who've been doing that. I, I had no idea that even existed. Fuzzo has funded, hell yeah. So... What's going on with this? How many hours are you into the development of this OS? About two. About two. <laughs> Need them emotes? Yeah, I do. Thank you so much, G33. Cow work. Thank you so much. Oh, or, wow. I've always read that as cat work. You're geek at work. Not... Not G33 cat work. I thought your name was cat and you use this Twitch account at work. Um, um, I mean, I knew that, but you know. <laughs> Lua KT, thank you so much for the two months of Twitch Prime. Whoop, whoop. Another train. Hell yeah, dude. I got somehow, somehow I got to pay for these candles, right? These candles don't wax themselves <laughs> we're literally burning twitch chat's money right now F actually <laughs> uh i'm at work for some definition of work oh man are they gl are the gluten free are the candles gluten free i don't know um oh my god i only got that name now as well <laughs> oh man the, uh, the hype fire. Ooh, that's a. I like that. Can I use that? No, no, no. Twitch doesn't like me. All right, chat. Why is this not working? Is the image handle bad? Image handle. The existing image. Key to the latest memory map. <sighs> Called immediately before that. If map key is incorrect, then it calls that. Uh, and that with that must be called again. Do I put it in a loop? Is there a trade for EFI? Yes, there is. Yeah, someone has all the bindings. Loop. All right, we're just going to loop there. We're going to assert that that is not equal to zero, and now we're looping forever. Will it ever work? No. No, it never works. Is it? Is it just bugged? Like, is the firmware just broken? 
My name isn't really uh, taken anywhere, even though it's somewhat common. Jan Polak, really? Well, good on you for getting that name every time. I feel like Gamoza is pretty much free everywhere, and that's always been nice. Um, I have the goal of writing my own operating system in a few years when I start a university. Uh, I really will be trying to learn from your stream. Thank you for doing uh, such a thing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's important to note that the things that we do here on this stream for OS development are definitely non-standard. Um, so a lot of the things that we do here uh, would get you in trouble in university with your professor where they're going to be like, no, that's not how you do that thing. Uh, ultimately, we understand how computers work here, and thus we just do things based on what we need the computer to do. We don't do things based on like, oh, historically, this is how people kind of design these sorts of operating systems. We don't care about how people do things or the processes of doing things. We just do things. Um, so a lot of times we're working with the ground truth of what is possible and not what have other people done and what are we going to mimic. Um, and in this case, uh, we can't even do basic things. So uh, we're not on a, a great foot here. But I have no idea why this would be failing. Exit boot services. Let's just make sure we're in the correct order here. Um, like, I'm pretty sure I did this before. Let's just double check. M maybe I had, like, a different... I know I ended up calling exit boot services in one of these. And I just, I just don't know where. I don't know what implementation. It looks like this is the only one where I would have done it. And it has me seriously questioning if there's a firmware bug. Fancil given a gift one, or tier one sub to Liskel. Thank you so much for that. Hell yeah. Thank you for the continued support. What the fuck, man? Do you see tags? Yeah, I use C tags all the time. Not, not on code that I write, but on code that I'm analyzing. I think it's pronounced Jan. Oh, that's probably right. Like Jan Horn at PZ of MLPDS fame. Like the Intel bugs, whatever. Um, what the fuck? I'm so confused. I'm going to just pull this up for reference on the site. And uh, header. Yep. Raise, lower, um, allocate pages, free pages, memory map, allocate free, create event set timer, wait signal, close check, uh, install, reinstall, uninstall handle, uh, reserved. Register locate, device path install config table, load image start image, exit on load image, and exit boot services. I <laughs> Maybe the print between makes them invalid? Oh, honestly, dude, I think you might be right. Because it says I can't use those handles anymore. I still have a print. Um, it says I'm not allowed to use those handles anymore or use like the print stuff. Uh, so we're gonna see. And there we go. Uh, whoa. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy. Whoopsies. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> we broke KVM! Yikes! <laughs> Let's fucking go. 
First time we've done this. Oh yeah, never never found a bug in KVM before. Rock rock solid code there. KVM is the, the pinnacle of hypervisor quality. <laughs> oh man. That top screen is frozen. Let's see. My top screen is frozen. I wonder if something's upset right now. Oh yeah. Yeah, Colonel's Colonel's throwing a temper tantrum right now. Uh hopefully that doesn't affect this the stream. Uh but the Colonel is very upset with me right now. Um sorry Colonel. Uh I'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry. I I apologize for all of the things I've done. Let me uh let me see if I can fix this monitor. This might break the screen the stream, who knows. Oh. Hey, it came back. Okay, sweet. And then one more time I'll lose you. How <laughs> is there no unit? Close enough, right? All right. Uh okay, we fixed it. <laughs> okay, so uh Cheers, cheers to that, KVM. <laughs> nice. KVM internal error. Like it out a bit. Yeah, that, I expect that. Okay, so yeah, it was printing things. Thank you so much for that. That was definitely correct. Uh, get memory map failed, and then we just print that. And then here we can... Go through all of those things and then exit boot services. And in this case, I'm just gonna get rid of this print. And we're gonna say assert that that is equal to zero. Get rid of the loopy loop. And then we'll just uh, assert this is equal to zero. Failed to exit boot services here. And if we fail to exit, then we're fine. And then we don't want to print anymore. We just want to get out. Oh, yeah. Um, now that uh, we're done with boot services, kill the EFI uh, system table. And we can do that trivially by doing a store to the EFI system table. We'll just do a store. Uh, core pointer null mute. And there we go. So that will disable things from using the EFI system table because we get rid of the EFI system table. Um, so this should just hang. Nice. Okay. Um, and that's good. That means that's working. And then if we do plus one here, this should fail with a message. Thank you so much for the two months. Twitch Prime, hell yeah, hail to the Fuzzing King. I'm not the Fuzzing King. We're, we're just doing OS now. <laughs> I've given up on my Fuzzing career. I'm now, I'm now an OS developer. Just ignore, just ignore that this is an OS for Fuzzing. Um, nice. Thanks for the 2020 celebrate. Ooh, fancy. I haven't heard that Flash videos in ages. What is that? What Flash video? If you thought I was making a reference to something, I was not. <laughs> All right, let me see what this is. <laughs> okay, yeah, I have seen this. I have seen this. Oh, m wow. <laughs> Wow, that's some that's some good shit. Wow, that's a throwback. I mean, that's probably where I got the idea from. Actually, I was thinking the um, I was thinking the office, um, uh, where Andy does like the or what you know, you know, yeah, whatever. I can't do it well. Nice emots, thank you so much. <laughs> I put, a, I put a lot of zero effort into making the emotes, and they actually came out really cute, so I'm happy. I'm happy with that. 
<laughs> oh man. I have an i5 with 20 gigs of RAM. Can anyone say we'll be able to do Linux from scratch? Of course. Of course. I did Linux from scratch on machines with like zero RAM. <laughs> totally fine. That being said, I wouldn't recommend doing Linux from scratch. Unless you're just doing doing it to learn. It's popular like 15 years ago. Yeah, Crazy Frog. Yeah. Oh, it's 7 in the morning. <laughs> there was a truck going to the, the water tower to up the service road. And I'm like, what the fuck is someone driving on that road for at a random time at night? And, oh, it's morning. It's reasonably morning time. Sick. <laughs> Crazy Frog, that's where. Oh, man. Yeah, Crazy Frog. I remember, like, E-Bombs World. That was fucking big. The end of the world. Uh... Honestly, by the time Newgrounds was a big thing, I was, like, kind of out of that phase. Crazy, Crazy Frog was 23 years ago? What? End of, end of the world, yeah. Wait, what? God damn. <laughs> what in the hell year is it? Can we say that Gen 2 is not equal to LFS? Yeah, for sure. I wouldn't say Gen 2 is anything like LFS. Um, do I even want to use the EFI fucking message stuff if it's going to be this much of a bitch? The animation was 2003. Original audio was 97. Oh my god. Don't 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 say years like that, man. Those are those are scary years. Um So I think I'm going to grab the cereal driver from Chocolate Milk. Uh, might as well. It should work. Um, and then we're basically just going to completely get rid of the... We're just not going to use the EFI standard in, standard out stuff, which fucking sucks. Um, but if it's going to fight us, then we're not going to use it. Nobody in here is older than the internet. Ah! I don't know, dude. We could have some Unix. We could have some Unix wizards in here. <laughs> Imagine saying to a kid, "You're older than the internet." Maybe last mile. See exactly. <laughs> you old gray beards. <laughs> All right, what are we doing? We're going to go in here and, uh, con, con, con. Let's just search for console. Do I need EFI system table anymore? No. Okay, so now we're doing a refactor. Everyone here who wanted the refactor, here we go. Here comes the refactor. Everyone put on your refactor horns. Choo, choo. Choo, choo. All right. <laughs> um. <laughs> Dogpile, Ask Jeeves, Alta Vista, Lycos, Yahoo. Yahoo's still like popular. I think in Japan. Um. I sure miss the old Netscape days. Oh man. Are you using a crate for the Yuffie stuff? No, I don't. I don't use crates. I don't like using crates. Um, input and output protos. Bye. So sad deleting code. J K feels fucking good, man.
Deleting code is one of the best feelings in the world. Bye! Okay, so obviously none of this shit is going to work anymore. Um... Okay, and then that, we have to pass uh, pub unsafe. And then that, we'll just do that for there. And then uh, system table unsafe. Okay, uh, ballpark's looking pretty good here. So we're gonna have to edit print. Obviously print is gonna have to change here. Uh, output string. Let's just comment this out. This will basically turn prints into a nop. And then uh, EFI system table. Get rid of that. Okay. So this should work. Um... If I handle, that's good. If I status, I like those. Uh, input key, we can get rid of that. All right? Yes, we can. If I memory type, obviously we want those. Table header, obviously we need that. Memory descriptor, boot services, system table. That looks good. It looks like you've stripped that down. Out. Okay. All right, so now we want to bring in our serial driver. So that's going to be relatively easy. I'm going to do that up here. You're not going to be able to see it, but I don't care. Um, fuzzos cargo.toml. I'm just adding this dependency in here. So we're just adding uh, serial as a file based dependency. I think path equals shared serial. Okay, so now we're going to be building a serial port. JK, XD lol, 360 no scope. Okay, um, shared sor uh, serial source lib. Okay. Basic 8250A serial driver for x86, uh, collection of the serial ports. Here we're going to identify those based on the BDA base. Uh, there should still be a BIOS data area, so we should be able to identify the serial ports off of that. Then we're going to program those ports, save that we have initialized and found a port, drain all of the bytes. Um, yep, read byte, just consume all of those. Read a single byte, write a byte. Ah, I guess we have read byte, might as well have it, doesn't matter. And then uh, write a stream of bytes. And then we just need CPU in here, um, and we'll make that as well. And I'm just gonna do this. So let's do a config target arc x86.64. So we're going to say that this driver is x86.64 specific, which it is. Um, and if I just said x32, this will, well, that's going to fail because it needs CPU. And then CPU, what do I want to do there? Do I actually want to make that library? I think so. So we're just going to go into, hmm. Backup pleb, chocolate milk, shared CPU. Copy that into shared. Okay, so this should work. Nice. Um, new BDA base. That returns as self. So we can use this to initialize a serial port. Let's just make sure this works. We're going to try and write to the serial port, so we'll do a uh, serial, serial port, new, uh, let's sir, and then sir dot, 
write byte uh, port zero. Oh, I can just do write b apples. Okay, so this is gonna write apples. Expected an argument, the BDA base. As const u16. Oh, and that's unsafe. Well, that's cool, because we passed at that pointer. Fantastic. Uh, and then make this mutable. All right, so hopefully this writes apples to the screen. Not a good look. Um, I'm curious if that uh, BDA is not working. I should really scrap bash.org before they go down one of those, one of these days. Are they still there? Damn. I'm surprised it's not already down, to be honest. You know when I was sad about deleting the code? When I wrote a shit ton of comments about function usage. And the tech lead said, no, we don't need comments. The usage is obvious from variable naming. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, that's how that works. Is that not finding the... Like, is this serial port? I would imagine it is. I wonder if... I wonder if there's no BIOS data area. What the fuck? Well, now I'm confused. Because <laughs> people spend too much time reading bash org. Oh no. Stop attacking me. Not attacking you, just pointing out the obvious. Hmm. So, I mean, I could maybe find the serial port information from Yuffie. Like that, that sounds plausible. Um, let's see what the spec says. Console support. Unless I just don't exit the boot services, is that an option? I don't know if it is. I don't know. Hmm. Things are uh, usable afterwards. Okay. Set virtual address map. If the Yuffie image is a Yuffie OS loader, executes an either returns, calls the EFI exit, or calls exit boot services. EFI will not regain control until it's reset. Hmm. 
Hmm. I mean, I could do this as an EFI application and not exit those services. I don't know what the ramifications are of that. Like, I don't know how many things... I don't know. I think I have to exit the services. I'm too concerned about, like, having it stomp over my uh, devices. So... SPCR, yeah, I know the ACPI will give me that info, but, hmm, I don't know, simple text, input, output, serial I.O., get the mode, yeah, So, ACPI protocols, let's see what we have here. Install ACPI table. Can I get the ACPI table from EFI? Got this. Set watchdog timer, stall. I hope I don't have to search for the ACPI table. Oh, I'm going to, aren't I? Dude, what is this fucking search, Firefox? Stop, I wanna search in here. What the fuck? Why can't I search this document? Like, I've done it a couple times. I can't type it in myself. What the fuck? Alright, if I hit control C, F, control V, then I can search. Sick. Um. ACPI table protocol. Install that. Remove one. Hmm. Okay. I'm not seeing a way. It seems like a Firefox bug, yeah. Yup. How'd the Wikipedia engine go? It went f fine. We didn't really finish it, but it works good enough for what I use it for. So I'm happy with it. So I guess we can't find ACPI with this. Do I have to search for ACPI the normal way? Because that's really annoying. Jacob Mishka, thank you so much for the seven months. Holy shit. Hell yeah. Hmm. Output string. Need to find a good Linux PDF here? There aren't any. <laughs> there aren't any. Um, so do I just have to do ACPI if I want to find that? In which case I probably want the initial serial from Yuffie. Uh, how do I want to do that? A UFI ACBI table is format. Okay. Uh, 
Um. Hmm. So I, I basically I'm making decisions in my head about how I want to architect this. Um, I think I do want to exit boot services. If I don't exit boot services, I get a lot wider support. Um, but I'm also concerned that I won't get full ownership of hardware. Um, and that's something that's a bit concerning to me. So, event signals, we'll see up all those things I lose, but that's fine. I'm just really concerned I can't clean all those things up. So... And then that means I need to have my own serial port driver, which is not too hard. But that becomes very difficult for random, like, hardware. Um, like, random, a lot of embedded things. I mean, maybe I just should not care about ARM64 support right now. Because it's just not, not something high enough on my priority list. I was really hoping I could use the boot services for outputting to the console, and I'm really upset that I can't. Um, and I don't want to parse ACPI tables without having output because there can be errors and just information that I'd like to display. So I guess... I guess we just parse the ACPI tables? And I think I add back in the code that I had before uh, for outputting. Do you need to exit the boot service? I have no idea. I think so. I probably should. Like... Technically, there's nothing that will give, like, if I hijack the interrupt table, um, yeah, the problem is that I think it's required that they implement these things without interrupts, and that's what's confusing to me, right? I think I should be able to get the interrupt table working. Oh, I can't fucking search. Ugh. Come on, dude. Let me see uh, about config. Okay, let's see if this fixes it. No, it's it's broken. Okay. I have no idea how I did that. <laughs> I have no idea how I just flipped that. You son of a bitch. I hit control F and it like fucking flipped it. <laughs> um Hey, now search works. Maybe I should have just refreshed. Um So All of the runtime services may be called with interrupts enabled if desired. They will internally disable interrupts when it's required to protect access. Um, rules for re-entry. Hmm. Upside down string. Yeah, it's still flipped after refresh. It rem remembers the settings that I want. I want it to be flipped over. All right. Um. Oh, these are really hard decisions. These are really fucking hard decisions. We're going to use... We're going to use Yuffie for outputting uh, during early boot. Um, 
let's just get this back to kind of where it was. Oops. Um. Okay, we're gonna comment that out, and uh, we're not gonna exit boot services, and this should be kind of back to where we were before. We're gonna undo this back to here. Okay. Um, we're gonna want that serial library, and that's fine. And then why is that not printing? Because we have to update print to here. Okay, so this should be basically back to where we were before. Um, I'm gonna get rid of that uh, warning right now just by uh, underscoring this so we can get the memory map. Okay, so what we want to do is we're just gonna write our ACPI parser uh, right away. I am going to remove uh, the shared code, which has like the serial stuff. Honestly, I don't need shared anymore in this kernel. I don't need the multiple crates like I had before. And then we'll edit this, get rid of that dependency, cargo clean, uh, Kimu. Okay, so um, this should build. We should be able to see our output. This will work on other systems. And this means we'll be able to print error messages and things uh, basically during the early stages. So if we detect it's not x86, right, we can print a message and say not supported or whatever. Uh, okay, bytes free. Let's just see how good that is. That's pretty good. Uh, looks like uh, looks like a couple megs are taken for the bootloader. I guess it, we have a 1.8 meg image, but not a big deal. That looks pretty solid. Okay, so uh, what we want to do is implement ACPI parsing. Um, and I, honestly, like, I hate, I hate taking this code from chocolate milk. Um, but honestly, I think it's good. Uh, ACPI. Let me just see here. Yeah, I, I just, I, I think it's already pretty good. Let's first see if that builds. Uh... There's like no way this is gonna build. Um, yeah, we don't have B tree map. Parse S rat. Um, that's okay. I wait. Is it? Fuck. Do I have a basic allocator? Hmm. Hmm. I feel like I don't want to use an alec catered this early. Love me some chocolate milk. Hell yeah. I don't know. Maybe we'll rewrite this code then. And it parse header. Okay, let's just see. Uh uh arrange set page table. And then max number of cores. Sick. Different states for ACPI Apex to be in. Buy. Total cores. Buy. Apex. Buy. Apex to domain. Set core state. Core state. Core check in. Num cores. Buy. Really, all I care about is parsing the ACPI tables right now. Um. Parse the header. This is gonna generically parse an ACPI structure. Um, spec says we have to scan this. 
Uh, ooh, get a pointer from the BDA. Ooh. I'm curious if that's going to be invalid. But whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, so we're going to search for that. Um... Let me just comment out everything else. And these are the parsers for the different tables. Get rid of those. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Uh, 108 Fizz Adder. How do I want to do physical reads? Um, we're going to do an identity map kernel because it's faster. <laughs> so we're just going to say... Uh, read fizz. I still might do that. I still might make a read fizz helper because I think that's cool. Looks cool. Uh, source mm.rs. Um, memory management routines. And then we're just going to do f uh, pub fn read fizz. Uh, type t pub unsafe fn. Then we're going to take a physical address. Um, um, pub struct fizz adder, uh, that's going to be a U64, uh, physical Okay, T size, size is implied, isn't it? You only have to say not sized Size should be implied by default um, uh, read a T from physical memory at patter, and we can do uh, standard or core pointer read volatile uh, patter dot zero as const T. Then we're going to do inline. Beautiful. OK, use mm. Mod mm. Go this way. Um. Uh, memory management, physical address, we'll get from there. All right, that's looking close. Pub U64. All right, and then uh, we'll just derive some shit on this. Clone, copy, debug, partial EQ, EQ, partial ORD and ORD. That should get us the most of what we'll ever use on this. We can always add more later, but that should be a good initial set. Okay. Okay, and let's, instead of calling get memory map, we're just gonna do acpi init. Pub on safe init. Okay. I think this is going to crash. Yeah. Um, let's just not look in the EBDA. Search in this region. Build to find RSDP. I'm just going to. I'm. Oh. I'm going to try this. Um, well, that's out of date now. Yes, it is. Um, okay, I can't read all of that memory. Um, how the fuck do I get the ACPI table base? 
I would imagine EFI would tell me that. Because EFI and ACPI are our friends. Um... Hmm. EFI system table, services table, EFI configure table and properties, okay? Ah, ACPI table GUID. Do I need to go through those? Let's see. I think I think that, uh, this is probably it. It's yeah, this is probably pretty easy. Um, we're just gonna go into EFI and then we're gonna want to find uh, pub fn get ACPI base, uh, and then we'll just go through uh, get the base of the ACPI table, um, get the system table, do all this shit. Then we're gonna say, um, table header, CRC, don't care about that. Runtime services table, no. Is it just an array of tables? I need to basically figure out how to find these Yuffie tables. Um, I'm curious if they are an array of some sort. That is my hypothesis right now. We have the system table. Configuration table, this. Number of table entries, and then configuration table is this. A grid and a table. Sick. Okay, so that is found where? <laughs> Shit. Um, system table. Uh, any graphics card? I have a 3090. Boot services. And then we have number of tables. Uh, EFI tables. And then uh, tables. Const. This is a pointer to EFI configuration table. Uh, pointer to EFI table uh, array. Sick. Then we have to do a uh, struct EFI configuration table reperse uh, the entry for an EFI configuration table. Then we're going to do a uh, GUID. I don't know what a GUID is yet, but we'll figure that out. This is um, the vendor. There we go. Bink. Okay, uh, table and then use size. This is a pointer to the table associated with uh, grid. Okay, 128 bits. Um, yeah, what's the type of that? What is the type of that? I'm trying to find the definition. Structs. Please. 
Fuck. Do they not say? Oh, it's actually an EFI GUID. Come on, baby, let's find it. Found it. It's that. Okay, um. Data 1, U32, data 2, U16, data 3, U16, data 4, U8 for 8. Um, and EFI, uh, GUID representation. Okay, unit N, I think that's native. Yes, unsigned native. Okay. So, and then we just have an EFI GUID here. And the table's just a pointer, which is a U size. Fan, fucking tastic. Okay, so when we load this, sets, um, we we're making a function here, yeah. So we can get the system table, uh, let st is equal to a reference to st. Um, uh, convert the uh, system table into a Rust reference. Fantastic. And then I should be able to do for blah and zero to st dot. I guess I don't really have to. I can just do this. Um, DRF st dot table entries and then tables, number of tables. Print woo. Uh, get, oops, get ACPI base, fantastic, no ACPI init anymore, here we go, no, EFI, no, apparently that's unsafe, um, Convert um, raw pointer to Rust reference. I don't know why I don't do that down here. Um, I guess maybe just because I use it once. I can't remember if there's a safety reason why I was doing that. We should see a couple woos get printed. Beautiful. Um, then we can do II, and then we can do, no, no. Get a rust slice to the tables. Now we're doing it correctly. Uh, tables is a core slice from raw parts. We can do a DRF of ST. Tables, and then we can do a DRF of ST number of tables. And now, check this shit out. Print, ba -da -ba -da -da -ba -ba tables, All right? <sighs> Perfect. Perfection. Look at that. There we go. There's all the tables. Oh, yeah. Mama Mia Pizzeria. Fuck yeah. Risk five, too. Oh, oh, baby. I'm late. Why didn't you wake me up? I'm sorry, a buff seagull. Should have slid into those DMs. Um, so now what are we looking for? Tables, 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 table. 
tape, tape, table, tape, 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 Ah, oh, where the fuck was it? ACPI table protocol? I don't want that. Um... There we go. Uh, ACPI table GUID. Do we want to use the 20 one? I don't know. Let's see. ACPI 2.0 or newer table should use this. Um, should use this. ACPI 2.0 or newer table should be should use this. Um, what, um, why? Why, though? Why, though? So, this is the old one, then. So we want the we want the latest and greatest ACP tables. So we'll go and we'll go and look for that one. Eight eight six eight. Uh, we're looking for a eight seven one. There, right there. This is the this is the ACPI table. Woo! Woo! Where did I say guild? There we go. Fixed. Fixed, solved, never been better, partial EQ, and EQ. Okay. I'm going to do this. Just, it makes more sense. How are we so good at hacking? Uh, okay, so we have that, and we have EFI table, okay, sweet, all right, all right, um, EFI ACB table GUID is a EFI GUID, if I quid, and then we just do this, and we do this, and we do this, and then we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and this, and this, and this, uh, not bad, not bad, um, Okay, so, and then we just say, uh, um, so tables dot iter dot, uh, do I want to do find here? Predicates, no. I'm gonna do like a find map. Oh, and there is a find map. Sick. Find map. And we're gonna search in the table and we're gonna say, um, we can actually destructure that table. Uh, Good in table. Okay, and then we're gonna do uh, Didn't they add recently in Rust on um, bulls a then ah not quite yet. The the bool that 
dot then where you can do a closure to convert a thing. Uh, maybe I'll just try it. I think that's definitely going in. Let me check the uh, rust. If it's in nightly, I might as well use it. Oh, it's been tracking for a year now. Open a stabilization PR. Langmaster. Uh, 1.50. Okay, so we're just going to use it because we're going to get it. Uh, this is coming in soon enough that we're just going to use it. So we're just going to say um, GUID is equal to then table return some yeah isn't that fucking cool <laughs> fuck yeah and we're getting that we're, we're guaranteed we're getting that in 1.50 so um i'd rather use it than actually not use it because all i'm gonna do is remove that feature uh probably in a month <laughs> Isn't that fucking beautiful? Like, look at that. Uh, get the um, configuration. Uh, get the ACPI table. I love dot then. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? There's that, and then there's then sum. What is then sum? Oh, uh, then sum doesn't do a closure. And in this situation, we have no need to use a closure. Nice. Isn't that fucking cool? Basically, like, d dude, the <sighs> Rust is so nice, man. Without destructuring the table, do you have to reference the GUID by X? I I'd have to do X dot GUID. But yeah, destructuring here is definitely correct. Um, so look through all of the tables. So this is literally all the code. Oh, man. We, first of all, convert the raw pointer to the table array and the number of tables into a Rust slice. And then uh, we look through all of the tables for something where the GUID matches the table GUID. And if it does, then we return the address of that table. And then this will be an option. And in this case, sum means that it was able to successfully find it. Fucking gorgeous, dude. Fucking gorgeous. Like... Uh, and hopefully this is RSD pointer. Fucking gorgeous, dude. What a beautiful language. We'll just do unwrap for now. Obviously, we don't want to do unwrap. Um... Make this unsafe. Imagine writing this in C++. <laughs> yeah, it'd be miserable. It's gorgeous. Then some is so fucking cool, dude. Is that not, not a valid address? Seriously? Then what the fuck is that? Okay, let's read this. <laughs> what? A pointer to the table associated with that.
A pointer to that. Uh, type of the memory that is used to store the table as well as whether the pointer is a physical address or virtual address during runtime uh, is determined by the vendor GUID. Unless otherwise specified memory type of the table buffer, it is the responsibility of the specification defining the vendor table to specify additional memory requirements. Okay, maybe it's a physical address? No, that seems like a high-ass physical address. Oh, do they just repeat this twice? <laughs> Sick. Sick. <laughs> Is it just the same thing twice? <laughs> oh, cam's off. Rip. F. Flute. Um. Okay, let's let's see where the spec tells us. Let's see where the spec tells us the formatting of this. Remember, remember when it said that the spec tells you the format of that. Remember, Pepperidge Farm remembers. I guess the ACPI spec is going to be responsible for that then. I swear to God, if this isn't in here. Didn't they say that it's up to the spec to uh, define, you know? Anyone else remember when it said that the, the spec is responsible for associating the type of the memory? <sighs> Son of a bitch. Uh, tables defined in some of the industry standards. Okay, let's find... Uh... All right. Then this is defined in here, right? Right? Somewhere in here? They reference, there it is. There we go. Finding the RSDP on UFI enabled systems. All right. So, um, I know what the GUID is. I'm not worried about that. Um, Must retrieve the pointer. Locates the pointer by looking at the configuration table. Okay, so this is correct. This is the correct way of finding it. There's two GUIDs, one for 1.0 and one for 2.0 and later. So the 1.0 is there, and the 2.0 and later is here. Um, it'll search for an RSDP uh, using the current revision GUID first, and if it finds one, we'll use the corresponding RSDP thing. Um, if it's not found, then it will fall back to looking for the 1.0. In our case, we don't give a shit. Uh, must retrieve the pointer to that before assuming platform control via boot services. Okay, so that's fine. And then they tell me, they, they tell me, right? They tell me that whether or not it's a physical address, right? Right, they, they tell me. They tell me whether or not it's a physical address as is required as is required by the specification, because the, uh, let's see here, uh, type of the memory that is used to store the table as well as whether the pointer is a physical address or a virtual address during runtime is determined by the vendor uh, GUID. I see. Um, it is defined by the guidelines set forth in the calling conventions chapter. Uh, Unless otherwise specified, it is defined by that. Okay, so chapter two. Okay. Okay. Calling conventions. Uh, X64. Table. 
table. Mm -hmm. uh, loaded at boot time can be contained in the memory type reclaim memory. Or this. Okay, that's the actual memory type. They must be contained in ACPI NVS non-volatile storage. Cacheability uh, should be defined in the UFI memory map. No information about it, blah, blah, blah. It's assumed to be non-cached. Um, okay. Okay. Handoff state, RCX and RDX, yep. RSPs, RETs. Um, okay, no idea. No fucking idea. Oh, what? What? <laughs> well, I can only read one byte there? That is weird, man. Uh, RSD space. Yeah, this is the RSD pointer. Why can't I read a U64? What the fuck? Is alignment check set? Is that a definition in EFI? Oh, well, hot damn. Is that really the case? No fucking way. No fucking way. Direction flag is clear. EM is... Um, to use runtime services, this. No way. No fucking way, dude. That must be... <laughs> What? Let's check my E flags. Godling72 coming in with the Twitch Prime. Hell yeah. Um. Bit 18 is not set. I mean, maybe...
What? What the fuck? Closure. Jump to there, call Rex. Wow, these relocations are brutal, man. Um, Just see. That. <laughs> Are you running a debug build? I am. It checks for Lyman and debug. Then is my panic not working? So I thought my panic worked. Oh, it um it's going to do a, a direct undefined instruction. Okay. Yeah, it's just directly going to do an un undefined instruction. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, just aborts. Yeah. Is there no way to unaligned read volatile? I guess that doesn't make sense. Let's do read unaligned on that and we should be fine. Um, yeah, we'll do read volatile. Let's uh, make sure we're not doing that anywhere stupid. I think we might be doing that in here. Find all derefs in here. Uh, eight byte align the destination. Okay, so that's gonna go one byte at a line, uh, one byte at a time. We'll do uh, core pointer right. These are both bytes. Source and dest, and then we'll do uh, core pointer read. But then these bad boys, oh, huh. look at that. All right, he did it. Nice job, me. Nice job, me.
Um, I think, okay. So that should be good. But yeah, we already had that. Nice. Nice. Uh, print is good. EFI, we're working on it. Acby, we'll come back to that. All right. Nice. 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 Um. So what we'll do is, um, let RSDP is equal to uh, EFI okay and this find map this get the table pointer okay option blah blah One point uh, table Tables use this squid. Then we'll go and uh, we'll bang those in there too. Might as well handle it correctly. I'm known. I'm I'm known for doing things right here. <laughs> Bink and blink. If I that's how they define them, okay. Um, I guess I want an and then here. Oh, um, uh, I don't want that. Unwrap or else. Or else. What is it? I don't want unwrap or else. I want uh, or else. Yeah, just or else. Yep, no args to that closure. Returns the option if it contains a value. Otherwise, calls F and returns the results. Sick. Nice. Return none. Okay, so get the table. Um, first look for the ACPI 2.0 table. If we can't find it, then uh, look for the ACPI 1.0 table. Okay, so if it succeeded, then we just return that. Otherwise, go and search for this squid. Fantastic. Okay, so that should be a little bit more resilient and get the base of the ACPI table. Nice. Nice. And now we should be able to do an unsafe ACB in it. This will do uh, use create EFI. RSDP is equal to EFI get ACPI table. Uh, expect failed to find ACPI table. Uh, I'm going to do an expect error here, just to double check that that will uh, fail correctly. Uh, 
Oh, it's so nice to not have to search for that shit anymore. I uh, got the... Get the ACPI table base from EFI. And so far, we haven't done anything architecture specific, have we? It's really cool. Ah, I think table makes more sense here. RSD pointer. RSDP. Okay. Um, is it not expect error? Expect none. Oh, it's it doesn't exist yet. Huh. All right. Well, we know our panics work here, so I'm not too worried about it. Sick. All right, let's parse it. Let's parse out the RISD, RSDT. Um, as const rsdt. Oh, rsdp. Ah, uh, we'll put the expect and the cast on this line. So get it and then turn it into a constant. Um, Do I just want to turn that into a Rust reference? Okay. Moose. Fantastic. That means this is passing. Um, assert that the RSDP signature is RSD pointer. Historically, we did that in a different way. Okay, and then... Uh, so we check the signature, and then we'll check the checksum. Parse header, that's going to validate the checksum. Uh, table checksum invalid, and then the payload. So we're just going to do... Let blah is equal to parse header. Huh. So how did that work? So I would parse out the header. And then I'd have the payload and the size. And then what do I do? Do I cast that payload? Treat it as opaque. Okay. Um, well, I think what we're going to do is just this parse header. Hmm. I wanted to check the checksum. Get the payload. Maybe I just won't check the checksum on it. I don't know. It's just going to be kind of ugly. Parse out the RSDT. Fantastic. Apex. Like all of this stuff. Obviously, we're not ipping yet. OK. 
Okay, what do we want first? Let's get the... Let's get the MADTs first. And the MADTs are basically going to tell us information about the Apex um, that are present on the system. Do I want to do the read fizzes like that? <sighs> hmm. So... Header. Oh yeah, there's definitely a different header. So parse that header, RSD pointer, read volatile. Parse the header, check that. Um. Hmm. This could need more comments, I think. So get the memory map. Uh, check that the memory map uh, was obtained. This is uh, failed to get uh, memory map fr from EFI. Hex. Uh, through, go through each memory map entry, read the entry as a descriptor, convert the type into our Rust enum. Uh, I don't care about free memory here, do I? Eh, we'll keep it for now. Uh, update free memory stats if this memory is available for usage. Print those stats. Okay. We'll be coming back to that code anyways. 150 Apex. Initialize the state. Okay, bye. Um, check the signature and uh, align uh, alignment of the structure. There we go. Um, this is compute the number of table entries in the RSDT. So, get the table base, parse out that, go through all of these, go through each of the entries, get the pointer to the table. Yeah, I think I'm going to mark this as read unaligned. Just to be extra careful. Get the physical address of the entry. Get the pointer to the table. Get the signature for the table. Uh, parse the MADT, parse the SRAT. We can get rid of the SRAT parsing. This is basically setting those up, okay. So keep in mind, we're working with some old code here, so we're just kind of removing things as we uh, determine whether or not we need them. So far, largely is, is no. Um, we're just going to parse the MADT. Okay. 132. 
Oops. Vec new. Uh, 132. Apex. Apex.push. Apex.push. Apex. That's going to be re the return, and that can go away. Hello, Sergio. How's it going? Hope you're enjoying the stream. Oh, shit. <laughs> Rip. Flute. Um, okay. Uh, let's get this going. Uh, max cores. We'll get rid of that. I'm, like, really tempted to largely refactor this code. Like, really tempted. Uh, print found uh, x a pick. Uh, this is just an a pick, and then this is an x two a pick. I uh, will say this is a lay pick here, a local a pick. So this should give us information about all of the cores, and we'll hopefully just see uh, just one here. Yep, found a lay pick zero. So if I do kimu.sh, uh, I think it's dash smp32. So we're going to make a 32 core VM. Hopefully, we will see 32 um, entries. Nice. Yeah, that's 32 entries. Um, and then if, let's say, uh, let's just say 512 cores. Oh no! Uh, Kimi system machine help. So what is it? Uh, fourteen forty FX. Oh, I like how they have the dates in there. That's kind of cool. Uh, we're just gonna say this. Q35. Standard PC, micro VM. Yeah, we'll say Q35. Um, honestly, I don't even know if that's going to have a, a X2 Apex support. 288. Oh, come on. Uh, we'll just get rid of enable KVM. Oh, boy, we're breaking things right now. Wow. Uh, basically, these things do not emulate an X2A pick well. We might have to fire up a machine that actually has an X2A pick. Although, this is going to be really slow to work on our real machine. So, I think we'll, uh... Probably do that testing later, I guess. Um, what keyboard is that? It's a DOS keyboard. Time to run on metal? Yeah, not quite yet. Okay. Found those L Apex, which is fantastic. And then we mainly wanted to do this so we could get the serial ports. Although, let's go get the... Um, Found lay pick. We should also be able to go into here, get these SRAT tables. Parse header, go through here. Affinities and APIC affinities. Um, here we can say print. Um, X2 APIC affinity to the domain. And all we really care about are these domains. So we'll say uh, apic x uh, to domain x. And then we'll have apic id and uh, domain. Yeah, that's the information we care about. Uh, same with this here. Just apic id to domain is what we care about. And then here we just want print. Um, We want um, domain X and then the memory range 
that it supports and we'll do base.0 and then base.0 dot uh, plus size minus one. And we'll turn those into check things uh, when we get to that. Get rid of this. Okay. Get rid of these. And hopefully we're pretty close to having this running just fine. 246. Mm, mm, domain. Domain. D domain. Okay, domain. Fuck. Um, 106. Got it. Is that one LA pick per core? Yes. Okay, so there's no affinity table, and that is fine-ish. Um, uh, SMP help. Uh, help grab CPU. Uh, SMP. CPUs is equal to N cores, threads, dies, sockets. I don't know if this will make a NUMA node. No. Um... Numa node. Okay. First CPU to last CPU. So Numa I don't know. I, I think that's something we'll test on hardware. Okay, so let's see if I like this code. I I'm like questioning if I want this read fizz stuff here, to be honest. Um, the standard ACPI table. Well, I want to put more comments on these. Let's go and find the RSDP here. Um... Do, do, do. RSDP. Okay. Um. Finding it and then the structure. Okay, we're just gonna. I'm basically gonna upgrade some of these comments and just see. I think fuzz coins will have an intrinsic value or just for fun? It's just for fun. It's just, yeah. Wow. Uh, RSD pointer. Jesus. Copy pasta is really bad. Um, okay. We're going to have to fix a lot of these copy pastes, unfortunately. Looks like it's going to be a mess. Fucking shitty ass PDFs, man. What a terrible format. It's like it misses the first four bytes just for fun. <laughs> doop doop.
Looks like you have some crazy view out there. Hell yeah, I do. It's a wonderful. Have you tried the killing a uh, killing a uh, framework? Uh, no, I have not. Not my cup of tea. Um, I was wondering how performance would be for housing. I'm not too much. I'm not too sure. Not familiar with it enough. Uh, RSDT address. Okay, good comments. Good comments. Good upgrades. Extracting basic information. And then after this, there's more stuff. Oh, I need to get world buffs. Let me see what time. Looks like 9.15. Sick. Um, let me see. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can uh, quickly buy some uh, world buffs. I'm gonna try and get my Dire Maul buffs. Got an AQ40 tonight. Okay. Basically, just need to look for someone selling those damn buffs. Uh, DM sellers. Doesn't look like anyone's selling right now. Yikes. Okay, doop, doop, doop. All right, sorry. Um, RSDP structure, let's make sure these didn't get mangled at all. These actually look good. Um, so we have a length. Then we have a 64-bit address of the XSDT. SDT address. Oh, that fizz adder needs to. That actually is a U32. This is a U64. I'm gonna just do this for now. Um, we'll cast those later. Uh, do do do. I'm trying to see if I can get these damn buffs. Okay. Yeah, I don't see anyone. Son of a bitch. Um, imagine if all code has had as many comments as this. I mean, it should. Comments are important, man. Uh, C and packed. Why did I mark this as packed? Alignment reasons? Huh. Well, then we'll have, this is the extended checksum here. Uh, including both checksum fields. And this is um, just a U8. U8, three. Okay, um, so, this is the checksum of the fields defined in the ACPI 1.0 spec revision. Um, the ACPI version 1.0 RSDP structure only includes the first 20 bytes of this table, bytes 0 through 19. Does not include the length field and beyond. The current value for this field is 2. So for an RSDP field that is two, 
then we have these extended things in here. Um, so technically, I don't want to read more than what I need. What? I guess, what's the point of the XSDT? So those fields are only valid when revision values two are higher. I guess I can just, I can just require that. Get the ACPI table. I'm just gonna read it. Um, get ACPI table, uh, expect uh, failed to get ACPI base from uh, RSDP, address from EFI. Okay, and then here, read unaligned, uh, RSDP adder as const RSDP. Assert RSDP dot revision is greater than or equal to one. Uh, ACPI version 2.0 uh, required. Minimum ACPI version 2.0 required. Let's just see if we pass that check here. Fantastic, and it looks like we do. Um, so, assert that the revision is greater than or equal to one. Uh, OEM ID, we don't care about. RSDT address. And so the XSDT, I think, is just the same thing as the RSDT except it is 64-bit uh, physical addresses. So it's just better. So we're going to require uh, that. So then we're going to parse the XSDT. And XSDT, XSDT, XSDT. We'll get this from the RSDP XSDT address. Uh, it's already a U64. And then we'll parse that shit out. And then we'll re-comment all of this stuff out again. But then we're going to be working with 64-bit uh, addresses, which is just better. Right? XSDT, XX, XSDT. And then this is probably mod U64, would be my guess, but we'll double check that. Why is all this stuff possibly unaligned? Isn't that kind of bad? Well, we don't, I mean, um, I'm guessing all these things should be aligned, but uh, it doesn't really matter if things are unaligned. I'm, I'm fine reading them unaligned because it's effectively free. Um, I'd rather just read unaligned than uh, f basically just assume they can be any address because we're just working with the addresses that are given to us. Um, okay, all of that stuff uh, passes. Uh, so, RSDT, XSDT entries, XSDT size, U64, XSDT number of entries, go through each of the table entries, table pointer and signature. Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do some large refactoring here. I'm sorry, guys, but uh, this code is kind of shit quality. Um, so, RSDP. Length of the table in bytes, including the header, starting from offset zero. Okay. RSDP dot length is greater than or equal to, um, I guess they go to 36. That's the size of it. 36. Why would they use a 36 byte table? I guess it's 24 hex. Yeah, so like the XSDT address in here is actually unaligned. It's at offset, uh, oh no, that one's not. Yeah, I don't think anything's on the line in the structure, but whatever. Um, 
get the address. We're going to assert the length is greater than or equal to uh, size of RSDP. Um, RSDP size invalid. All right. Uh, as you size. So we check the revision, we check the length. Uh, and then we're going to check that extended checksum. Um, so this is a check information about. Did you finish uh, the offline wiki? I did not. I mean, I kind of, I, I just left it where it was. It was good enough. Good enough for me. Yeah, you know, we're going to... <sighs> I don't know, man. I I feel like I can write this code better. Um, and I'm I'm thinking about doing that. Let's see. Trying to find these uh, dire mall buffs. So, uh, I just think I can do this so much better. Like, have you heard of Gorse? It's super fun and uh, cool tool. Nope, haven't heard of that. <sighs> I I can do better than this. I can do much better than this. Um, what I think we're going to do is we're going to actually make this return a result. Um, This is unacceptable. This code quality's ass. Um, this is a really bad code quality. Base level RSDP uh, table, um, length of the table in bytes, including the header. Base level RSDP table uh, for ACPI 1.0. Um, XSDT address. Okay. Let's find RSDP, RSDP, K, 
Okay. Happy with this. Um, for ACPI 1.0. Good. 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 Okay. Um. Was this pulled from chocolate milk? Yeah, this was. Clone copy, uh, Repercy Pact. Impel. RSDP extended. Um, FN new, and I might have this. Right, like uh, from physical address. Uh, load an extended RSDP structure from adder. Oh, some son of a bitch. Uh, load an extended RSDP structure structure from uh, adder. This is unsafe. Okay. So what this is going to do is this is gonna read physical memory and um, yeah, and let's take a look. Read fizz, that's gonna read unaligned. Uh, fizz adder dot zeros const t and just cast that and read it. Address. Um, okay. So, uh, first, start by reading the RSDP. Um, yes, we will. Yes, we will. RSDP. Load an RSDP structure from address, from physical address. Um, address is physadder. Uh, read the base RSDP structure, uh, let RSDP is equal to mm read fizz, uh, RSDP, um, read the uh, adder. Awesome, 69. Panic. Okay, we're gonna read that base address. Results. I said I was gonna do this. I said I was gonna use results, um, and we're gonna do it. Uh, ACPI results. Type ACPI results is a uh, T which maps to results. T A C P I error. And this is um, a result type which wraps an ACPI error. I said I was going to do this in this kernel. This is going to be a good fucking kernel. We're going to take our goddamn time, and we're going to write good code. We're, we're not going to get impatient. We're not going to do panics. We're not going to do unwraps. We're not going to do asserts. We're going to go really careful. We're going to be very, very, very careful about keeping this code quality extremely high, because this is going to be the best kernel I've ever written. And to do that, we need to keep this code quality astronomically high. Um... Clone, copy, debug. I mean, so like, sometimes I wonder if I want to really, um, that need to be a pub type? I think so. 
No, can types doesn't matter. Um, so here we can say uh, ACPI result uh, just okay. 45. RSDP expected that. Panic. Never make it there. Fan fucking tastic. 47. We need a turbo fish. Beautiful. Okay. So this is going to be uh, um, errors from SPI uh, table parsing. We're going to say. Uh, Um, the ACPI table was not reported by Yuffie. Um, if I know adder, if I, if I, um, um, no if I, uh, Unreported. Fuck. Slow and steady. Hell yeah. Love your view. Isn't it beautiful, man? It's fucking wonderful out there. <laughs> it's pretty nice. Should ACPI results uh, not be in mod ACPI? Why not? Or you mean, should it, should it just be a result? Should I just call it result? Shadow that instead of having the redundant ACPI in the name and actually leverage the fact of a leverage a fucking namespace rather than naming the thing what's in the namespace already. I don't know if that's what you meant, but uh, pub enum error. Um, the ACPI table address, um, RSDP not found. Bam. Uh, and thus we were unable to find the RSDP. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Big upgrades. Look at that Q O L. Um, oh, I can't do that, can I? Do I have to do ACPI results? Um, <laughs> how does that work? Um, don't they do this for like IO result? Yeah, standard IO results. Oh God, result has lost all meaning. <laughs> Yeah, core. Yeah. Unless this is not uh, a, a good way to write this code, but I, I think this is like... This is what Rust does for a lot of things internally, and I, I think this is correct then. A result type which wraps the ACPI error. Core result result. And that's great. And then we have an ACPI table. Uh, RSDP not found. Okay, so now what we do here is we can say, um, oh my god, dude, this kernel is going to be so nice. This kernel is going to be so nice if I keep this up. Um, and get a ACPI table, uh, what does that return? An option? Option, okay. Um, then we're gonna do 
okay. What is it? Okay or, I think is the correct way. Yeah, okay or turns it into a TE, a result. Um, so we're going to do an okay or, or, um, error, RSDP not found. And then we can use a question mark. Yes! Fucking beautiful! So try to get the ACPI table from EFI. If we cannot, then we RSDP not founded. And then we just return that. Beautiful. And now we can use question mark, which makes code look so much better. Do we have try blocks yet? I don't know if we do. I understand why you're against libraries, but anyhow, in this era, such good libraries. Yeah, I know. I know. Still not going to use them. <laughs> I, I know. I know. A result type which wraps an ACPI error. So how do people like doing structures? I typically do structure, impl, structure, impl. Do people do structure, 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 impl, impl, impl? Um... That's like a, a code style thing that I want to kind of solidify in this in this kernel. So we have a signature. Um, and what I'm looking at here, uh, I just have a signature checksum, right? This is the literally the data that I'm going through. I have it rep or C uh, packed. Um, I'm gonna try to derive only when needed. Right, so basically, until a derive is needed, I'm not gonna do it. I know, I know this structure is good, so I'm not gonna delete that yet. Um, but I don't want to. Um, I don't want to basically derive things that aren't needed. That's unnecessary code bloat and other stuff. Uh, so we'll try and keep that to a minimum as well. We'll basically add those impulse as we need them. Uh, the ACBI table address was not reported by UEFI, and thus we were unable to find the RSDP. And then RSDP not found, and that's exactly what that error code means. So then once we get that, we're going to want to load an RSDP extended. And this is just going to be RSDP, or, um, we'll call this the, uh, eh, RSDP is equal to this from, uh, I don't know if I want to say from patter, um, because it's implied because I use the I use the strongly typed uh, fizz adder type here, um, which is something I'm going to keep doing in my kernels. I think that's the correct way to do things. Okay, so raid buffs are going out here soon. So then I can do rsdp adder, um, and obviously that. This is going to get the RSDP, uh, validates, and get the RSDP. Um, cannot be applied to that, and that is okay. This is going to return a result self, and this is going to return a result self. Okay, 108. RSDP address, uh, expected a fizz adder. Why is that a U size? Oh, one of the buffs just dropped. Wow. <laughs> Oh, wow. Someone just dropped a buff when it was not supposed to have dropped. Yikes. Um... <laughs> People are going to be fucking mad, dude. Wow. <laughs> nice. Classic, dude. Fucking classic. Oh man, I gotta open my other client then. So I can snipe the other buff. <laughs> Alright, so 
sorry. This is the unfortunate nature of World of Warcrafting. <laughs> Minus 15 DK fee. Okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I'm ready to accept that next buff. Good morning, my dude, how's it going? All right, uh, we were trying to figure out why that was a U size. And um, I guess, oh yeah, a pointer to the table is, wow. D was that a copy pasta error or like, is it that typoed in it? No, I, I think I typed these out. Okay, so get that address and then we're gonna take that um, as a U size. Uh, I don't need, I'm not gonna do uh, one, I'm not gonna do 128 bit uh, architecture support. It's just, it's just too verbose. It's too verbose, it's unnecessary, not gonna do it. Like, I've thought about it, basically like never uh, casting things uh, from like U64s and U sizes, um, and not, basically don't assume that a U size fits in a U64, uh, but I'm gonna, if we get 128 bit architecture, uh, I think I'll be writing an, a new OS by that point. So I'm not too worried about that. So that was started today? Absolutely. Hey, Dither, how's it going? Thank you so much for the five months of support. Hell yeah. Okay. Okay. How's chat doing? All right. We're going to assume that a U size is U64 for this kernel. I think. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, like all of these structures and so much would change that we'd be writing a new kernel for 128 bit. So I'm I'm not worried about it. Um. So uh, expected fizz adder. So what we're gonna do is we're going to say yes, that is indeed a physical address, and then we're gonna parse that RSDP extended, and then this is gonna be an explicit panic here, and it is from 81.9 perfect, which is right here. All right, um, so what we want to do is read the RSDP. So let RSDP is equal to RSDP from adder, adder, question mark. And so the first thing that we're gonna do is try to read this. And now the panic should be bumped up to here. So that's gonna read the RSDP structure uh, from physical memory. That's gonna treat it as unaligned. Um, I don't, I'm just, yeah. Yeah, I'm just gonna call it read fizz. Um, oh, there's rend. No, that's anixia. <laughs> God damn it. What are these buffs? What are these buffs? Oh, and now there's rend. Sick. Nice. All right, I got both buffs. All right, that's the only thing I really have to care about. I guess technically, um, nice. Someone fixed the scuff. Wow, fucking heroes, man. Let me see what I can find here. Uh, one second, sorry. Sorry, this is what happens when you stream for too long. You have to do like real things while streaming. Um, I can just get a heart later. I'm not too worried about it. Yeah, I'll get a heart later. They're they're pretty easy to nab. Okay. Um, real things as wow. Yeah, come on, dude. Wow is important. Are there any usable 128-bit architectures around? Uh, Risk Five uh, has a 128-bit uh, draft. 
Wasn't the switch to 64-bit to allow more than 4 gigs of addressable memory? Yeah. Switching to 128-bit is basically the, the same thing for the next. The next tier, I think we'll probably see 128-bit architectures in like 10 to 15 years, I think. Uh, is that reasonable? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, 2 to the 64, what is that? It's not that big. Like, we're pretty close to running into uh, memory issues. Um, it is, uh, that's megs, that's gigs, it's terabytes, yeah, um, yeah, you can do, yeah, you can do 16,000 terabytes right now. Max is 2 to the 48 on 64, uh, x64, right? Um, technically no, Intel has a, a five level, uh, page table spec. Um, so they have five level paging, which I think adds nine more bits to push you from the 48 into 57. Unless they go the whole uh, 64, but I don't think so. Um, I think it's just another, just one more level. What machines have 2 to 64 RAM? I mean, it's, it's really not that much RAM. Um, uh, like 16,000 terabytes of RAM is like getting pretty feasible, uh, to be honest. So, like, one terabyte of RAM is what? Um, terabyte of RAM is, I don't know, eight grand? Not, like, like seven or eight grand? So, something in that ballpark? Um, so, 16,384, and let's just say, let's just say it's 10 grand, right? Um, for uh, for 163 million dollars, you could have uh, you could overflow a 64 bit address space with RAM right now. So like, I know that sounds ridiculous, right? But um, 150 million dollar computer is not that big of a deal. <laughs> like there there are multiple multi billion dollar computers in the world. So 15 years from now, uh, when RAM is one tenth of the cost and it's 15 million dollars for 64 bits worth of RAM. Um, yeah, like pretty much every supercomputer on the top 500 list is going to have that. Um, now, are they actually collaborative in using that RAM or is it an independent, like independent systems where they uh, like share over um, networking? Yeah, it kind of varies. But if they're like, seriously, like we are already in the territory where, where we can have more RAM than that, right? Like, um, what is the top supercomputer right now? Um, top supercomputer is the Fugaku. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, high RAM now. I think it's pretty low RAM. Uh, it's a billion dollar computer and... Uh, HBM 32 gigs per node. Okay, so there's 32 gigs of RAM per node, and there's 158,976 nodes. So it has, um, really? It has five terabytes of RAM, that's it? Wait, what? Did I do that math wrong? 32 gigs per node. 158,976. No, it has 5,000 terabytes of RAM. Sorry, my bad. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it has 5,000 terabytes of RAM. Uh, so that computer, which was built this fucking year, uh, has one-third, effectively, effectively one-third of a 64-bit of the address space. So yeah, in, <laughs> in like 10 or 15 years, I think we're going to be there, right? Like, <laughs> it's, yeah. Like, it, we're close. We're seriously close. Um, that being said, those computers are typically like more of like a mesh or like node-based things where they're not actually addressing all of the RAM into one system. Um, I actually, one of the reasons why I'm making this operating system is I think virtual memory is underutilized. I think uh, basically building data structures um, in ways 
that allow the MMU to do compute for you is underutilized, right? And I, I think that's one of the experiments of this operating system is basically to build this operating system around extremely fast virtual memory management, uh, which will then lead to us building data structures that basically do like weird aliasing and weird ways that we organize the structures to basically allow the MMU to accelerate things that traditionally would require like a for loop or processing of like a hash table or something, right? Um, and I, I think like, I seriously think there could be valid reasons for 128-bit adder space right now. SSDs treated as RAM becoming feasible now as well. Yep. Yep. Like, no, I think there are like a lot of things. Uh, I do think, I do think disks will just be RAM. Like, non-volatile RAM is becoming a thing. I know that's separate than disks, but it's basically pushed forward some of the specifications and things that allow for, like, BIOSes and EFI and OSes to recognize non-volatile memory. Um, and with that, I think we're... I think we are five years away. Like, five years away from, basically, memory map disk. Um, and not memory map disks disk in the way of like MMIO that you're used to it, but like literally your fucking disk uh, is accessed by just reading and writing memory um, from the processor level. Like the OS, like when you do a syscall to read disk, it goes through the file system and does all that shit, and then it just like reads memory. Um, so I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna get there. Um... Is the x86 virtual memory model Turing complete? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, what's your exercise regime as a security researcher? Uh, Push-ups, sit-ups, and pull-ups. Climbing, uh, climbing when we're not doing COVID. <laughs> but yeah, SSDs is RAM. I, I think we're going to see it. I mean, we're really close with NVMe. NVMe still goes over PCI Express, which is a bit slow, but I think you're just going to have a fucking dim slot um, that's going to be your non-volatile dim slot, and you're going to throw in your fucking... Uh, you're going you're gonna to throw in your non-volatile RAM, which is much slower than non-volatile RAM, right? Non-volatile RAM is basically the same speed as actual RAM, but basically throwing something in that the memory controller, the CPU directly has wires to your, um, uh, basically directly into your disk. I think that would be fucking cool. Um, <laughs> so... Max pull-ups in one go? Oh, God, I have no idea. Um, 20, 25? Not sure. So I pretty much always do, like, one or two muscle-ups uh, each time I do a set of pull-ups, and thus that typically probably takes away, like, six or seven pull-ups worth of energy, so it's kind of hard to say. Doesn't that already exist with non-volatile dims? Yes, exactly. But it's it's just very expensive, and it's it's. I mean, maybe that's just the direction that we're going to go. Um, it's expensive. Non-volatile dims are very expensive. Let me see. Um, but like the the new servers I bought have first-class support for non-volatile dims. Um, they have support for disk in RAM, where they kind of like, I, I don't know exactly what they do, but I think it's literally intended that you put your disk in RAM. Um, they're selling 512 gig DIMMs for 6.7 grand. Is that NVRAM? Or is that just a, a DIMM? Okay, so there's NVDIM F, which has flash storage, NVDIM N, which is flash storage and traditional RAM on the same module. Um, computer accesses the DRAM directly. In the event of a power failure, it copies the data from the volatile uh, to the persistent flash and then copies it back. Ah, so NVDIM N is basically a DIM uh, that probably just has a capacitor or a small battery, probably a capacitor, um, probably a super cap. And it basically will dump RAM into the flash um, on a reboot. So then you get basically no penalty 
I mean, at that point, I don't understand why that would really be that expensive. <laughs> like, I think we're pretty much all, like, getting there, right? Like, I mean, you need as much RAM as you have disk, but, like, come on, that's not that hard. Like... <laughs> Do you know the durability of NVRAM? It's the same as Flash. Because it, cause it is just Flash, right? So it's the same as any other Flash drive. Um, dude, that's fucking cool. Yeah. It's, like, pretty well standardized. It looks like in uh, JE deck, uh, ACPI, and DDR4 kind of all really tie together. Uh, non-volatile RAM. I think that I think it's becoming a thing. Damn, dude. Huh. That's pretty fucking cool, dude. It should basically just be the cost of RAM plus a a, a tiny amount more, because Flash is basically free, right? Like a, a two tera drive. I, I just bought a, an external Samsung two terabyte drive that's USB 3.2. Fucking thing, like, was like 400 bucks. Basically free. <laughs> like, holy shit. It says info. Uh, yeah, let me. Uh, 39007 HTML. 700 bucks for 128 gigs? That's cheap as shit. I'd put that in my desktop. <laughs> um, Optane Dim, 170 nanosecond. Uh, it looks like half the performance. Half the performance for sequential and uh, like a, a, a fifth. The performance for random? Yikes. That's not there yet, but it will be, right? In the same way that, like, SSDs feel like shit now, right? Like, if you have a SATA-based SSD, it feels so slow compared to an NVMe drive. Um, and the NVMe transition was, like, pretty quiet. I remember SSDs were a big deal, but NVMe was just kind of like, whatever, like, whatever, things just get faster, now it's on your PCI bus. Like, <laughs> I built my own PC. I bet you think I'm cool. Hell yeah, you're the coolest kid on campus. All right. Uh, we're going to read physical memory here. Um, I'm trying to think if I want read physical to return an option. Um... Like, let me see. Like, to the M2 drives? Yeah, the M2 drives are so much better. $400 is free sad student noises. I mean, a 2 terabyte SSD fucking five years ago was not $300, $400. It has gotten so cheap, dude. It has gotten so fucking cheap. All right, do I want uh, readphys to return an option? Um, that is the question, and I don't know. I don't know if I want it to. Um, uh, let's think. Uh, the only reason that I would want readphys to return an option is if I have a uh, basically a cap on the size of the physical memory that I have identity mapped in. For example, if I identity map only like four gigs of RAM in, then I want to potentially return a failure in a situation where the um, physical address is out of bounds of that region. So I'm kind of tempted to have that return an option. Um, Is that gonna fuck performance? <sighs> 
Kind of? Um... I think that is something that I will probably do through, um, an assertion. I think if the physical address is out of bounds, I think that is an acceptable time to do an assert rather than a soft error. It's just, it's, it's not something I'm going to want to pay the, the price for. It's, yeah, I think, I think we're going to say no for that, especially since we're going to use readviz, um, pretty heavily here. Um... And I think I'm going to just do this as read and not read unaligned. Uh, just because that will be faster. I, I think these structures should be aligned. Okay. Um, okay. Read the RSDP structure from physical memory. Then what I want to do is... Um, I want to validate the checksum on it. And we know that it is exactly that size, so what we're going to do a uh, RSDP slice. Um, so given that the checksum for the XSDT incorporates the checksum for the first one, then I think what I might do here is I might make a wrapper on this um where i could do like read table and then i maybe pass uh the accessor for the checksum field um All right. You get Macro to wrap every expression in unsafe. Oh no. This makes me want to build a new system I have no use for. It. Welcome to my life. When booting with those DIMMs uh, that have copy from non volatile storage into RAM at boot, be super slow? No, because it can be done massively parallel. Because uh, unlike most things, um, like, you can have, like, one flash chip per uh, DRAM chip, right? And you can effectively, de depending on the circuitry and the way that you design it, you could you could basically pump those fuckers in parallel uh, compared to having, like... Right, like, your, your standard, standard NVMe drive might have, like, eight flash chips on it, right? And those eight flash chips are basically all going to be accessed serially, right? All of them are going to end up piping all of they might be read in parallel but they're going to eventually plummet through uh in serial whereas on a, a dram chip you can just like directly wire those things obviously that might be cost prohibitive but you can do it um so i can't imagine that it would even be noticeable in the boot time uh because it's going to take five seconds to post the bios and you should be able to read all of that into ram within five seconds anyways Um, so what's the difference between that and having the same amount of RAM and disk on a normal PC? Speed, reliability, um, not being OS, uh, like, not needing a driver to support it. Obviously, you need a driver to know to use the RAM like that, but you can just use the RAM like that, right? Um, no, I'm all for it. I think, uh, I will, I will be getting one of those machines. Maybe the next, uh, next build I do will be, uh, non-volatile RAM. Or maybe the, maybe the next storage server I build will be non-volatile RAM. That could be fucking fun. Do the RAM chips act as, uh... As a RAID 0 array then? I mean, like, in that situation, like, in reality, like, I don't fucking know what they actually do. Uh, but, yeah, of course, they could in that situation. 
Uh, and and no, it's not a raid zero. It's acting as a as a, a, a no raid. There's no redundancy. There's no redundancy, and there's no um. Uh, there's no like striping, right? Let's see. Uh, read the base RSDP structure. So what I'm thinking is making an accessor that will uh, read that structure, and then you'll provide a closure, and that closure will be an accessor for the checksum field. Actually, no. These checksums always check to 20 bytes. Um, although. I think the other tables are dynamic size, so we might special case these ones. Um, basically, we have to check some of this, and to do this, we have to do like uh, bytes is equal to uh, core slice from raw parts, and then we can do adder. Um, I mean, it's kind of tough to do that. Um, Oh, I, I read it there. Ah, yes. Uh, address as const RSDP as const U8, and then we'll turn this into a size of RSDP. Right, so this is going to, um, sorry, RSDP. So now that that is on the stack, we're going to basically temporarily turn it into a slice. Um, and does that have aliasing problems in Rust? I always forget that. Um, haven't you written a ton of OSs before? Yeah, this is just going to be a better one than the last one I wrote. Broadest definition, blah, blah, blah. I can't remember if, if Rust allows this aliasing like this. Now, since it's read-only, it should be fine. Um, okay. Um, should be fine, I think. It just won't matter if it's not mutable, but... but... Um... Yeah, if we don't have mutable, we should be fine, I think. Entirely. All right. Uh, bytes dot iter dot um, fold into an OU eight. We'll have our accumulator. We'll have X. Then we'll do accumulator um, dot wrapping add X. All right, and this should be getting a checksum. And here we can do this on this here. Um, looks like slice from ref. Yeah, not in this case. But in this situation, we should be fine. Okay, so this is going to basically uh, comp uh, uh, compute the checksum. Don't you need to skip the checksum value? No. Um... Okay, and if check is not equal to zero, I uh, return, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I'm going to see if this looks gross. Um, 
I guess, yeah, that's gonna be kind of gross, isn't it? Oh man, I kind of wish the then could go into an error. Because otherwise it's then some... Um, yeah, that doesn't make sense in this case. Uh, return error. Um, and then we just need one of these. We're going to say a checksum mismatch. And this is going to be uh, an ACBI table uh, was processed, which had an invalid checksum. Um, I think there are cases where it's not okay, even if immutable, like with boxes, this should be fine. Okay. Aliasing always scares the shit out of me. Um, uh, compute the check, uh, compute and check the checksum. Okay. So this, uh, yeah, makes it to the panic. Sweet. And if we said, if this is equal to zero, that's going to fail. That's going to bubble. And then that bubbles. And then where does that bubble up to? Unuse variable RSDP. Let's just see what we're doing here. That returns a result. Put a question mark on that. Uh, that one we have a question mark on, and then we should have something getting mad at us. First, we're not using image handle. Uh, 121. Yeah, we're not using that yet. Um, but... ACPI init. Why is it not yelling at me uh, about unused uh, results? Shouldn't it be? Um, shouldn't it be yelling at me when I call? Shouldn't it be telling me un unused result here? Potentially unused result? Shouldn't that be a warning? The checksum is the value needed to get the sum to zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a pretty common checksum technique. Um. The fuck? Why is that not yelling at me when I call a nit? Oh, there it is. Okay, sweet. Um, it's basically, uh, it was getting pushed off the screen uh, by Kimu. Kimu was like resetting the screen. Sick. Okay. Um, this is one of the reasons why I like to use results liberally. Um, I'm, pre I'm pretending like I use results and then I rarely fucking use them. So, if I read fizz, a pack structure, it should be able to handle reading that unaligned. Um, okay. Then we get the bytes. So we read that physical memory once. And then now that we have that, we then, from Rob Hartz, convert that uh, into a slice. And then we accumulate those bytes, basically doing wrapping adds. If it's equal to zero, then we have a problem. And then here we'll just do uh, expect. Um, wrap. Doesn't satisfy debug. Oh, cool. Uh-huh. Okay, so now this should get all fussy. And it should tell me why. Uh, unwrap on error value checksum mismatch. Okay, so... Um, pub enum... Uh, table, and this is uh, derive debug, um, so 
So I'm thinking about having this contain a table, right? And then the table will define the, the table that had the access failure. Um, or I could just make a different one for each one. But I think this is better, maybe. I don't know. Should I just make a checksum mismatch RSDP? Yeah, we'll just do like RSDP checksum mismatch. Um, an ACPI table is processed. Uh, a RSDP was processed, which had an invalid checksum. Checksum miss R, and then we'll go down to here. RSDP checksum mismatch. There we go. There we go. And there we go. RSDP checks a mismatch. Now, obviously, not actually failing. If it's not equal to zero, then it was successful. Nice. Nice. OK. Now, once we have read that, what we're going to do is check if other fields in that structure matter to us. Um, signature. Yeah, we'll check the signature. Hmm. I am tempted to do that table thing. It's better. It's better. It's better. Um. Uh, enum. Does that need to be pub? I think it does. Uh, a table. Different types of um. ACPI tables I uh, used mainly for error uh, error tracking uh, for error information. RSDP the um, uh, root system description pointer sick sick. Sick pub. Fuck yeah. Let's see. Look at that. Check some mismatch on the RSDP. Fuck yeah. That looks so good. Fuck. Nice. Um, and ACBI table, uh, had an invalid checksum. Um, an ACPI table did not match the correct signature. Um, signature mismatch table. OK. Check the signature. If. Uh, RSDP signature is not equal to RSD pointer. Return error, error, uh, signature mismatch, table RSDP. Uh, what do you want here? Um, is it this one that needs a ref? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, and we don't want this. We'll say not equal, and then we'll just uh, make a typo here. RSD pointer A. And then this should give a signature mismatch. Yep, signature mismatch on the RSDP. Fantastic. Read volatile, read volatile says the source should be aligned. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking before. It, it makes sense because um, there's... I don't know if there's a like good way to do a volatile load. I guess I, I was gonna say there's no great way of doing an unaligned volatile load, but I I think it's just the it's just the same thing. As just yeah, I there should be an I feel like there should be a volatile unaligned load, but there is in intrinsics, but not in uh, a standard or a core pointer. Do you know how to make an ARM port or of a Linux distro? 
uh, I mean, just build Linux for ARM and then modify their entire distribution to not assume it's x86 and you're good. Um, simple. Okay, so we check the signature and the checksum. Now, should we check the signature or the checksum first? It doesn't really matter. I think the checksum first is okay. OEM ID, we don't care about that. An OEM supplied string that identifies the OEM, we don't care. Um, a revision. Revision numbers are backwards compatible to lower revision numbers, okay. A CPI version 1.0 of this table is zero. Okay, so we don't care about that revision number. And then a 32-bit physical address of the RSDT, don't care. Um, so we check everything fully, which means we can now successfully return the RS, uh, RSDP. Um, everything looks good. Return the R, uh, RSDP. All right. So now this will bubble up. So this will basically validate that structure, uh, which looks good. All right. Then we hit the 111 explicit panic, which is here. So we first read the RSDP, which is going to get the um, ACPI. Um, this is the ACPI 1.0 structure, and thus is a subset and backwards compatible with all uh, future revisions. The extended RSDP requires uh, ACPI 2.0. Um, ACPI 1.0, yeah. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to say if rsdp.revision is less than 2, um, the, we can just do this, um, how it works okay. Return error, um, error, uh, revision, uh, revision to old. And this is old. And this is going to be, um, the, uh, extended RSDP was attempted to be accessed. Uh, however, um, the extended RSDP was attempted to be accessed. However, the ACPI version for this system uh, is too old to support it. Now, unfortunately, um, the revision here for 1.0 is zero. Um, the current value is two, and these are only valid when rev the revision value is two or above. Okay. Okay, so the revision value does have to be two or above. Uh, however, the API version is too old for the system to not support. Uh, it's too old to support it. Um, ACPI 2.0 is required. Okay. And yeah, so if the revision is less than two, then yeah, the revision is too old. And in this case, we'll see if we hit that. I don't think we're going to, and we don't. The ACPI revision is just fine. And if we take a look at the uh, ACPI version history, we can see basically right now how tightly we are controlling our operating system. Um, and let's see. Um, ACPI 2.0, which added the 64-bit thing, came out in August of 2000. So I think it is okay. I think it is okay for us to say, if you don't have ACPI 2.0, uh, bye. <laughs> it, it just requires that uh, your ACPI reversion, uh, revision is uh, beyond August of 2000. So um, I think that is a reasonable restriction to have on this operating system, and thus we're just going to keep going with this, and we're not going to worry about falling back to 32-bit addresses. Um, now, maybe there are OSs that mainly only do ACPI 1.0, or hardware that only does 1.0, but that makes no sense, because like even a, a Raspberry Pi, uh, well, that's 64-bit for the latest ones, but like 
even for a cheap ass 32-bit thing that has Eufy support, um, they're not going to be using ACPI 1.0 because they want some of the later features. They want some of the power management features, some of the bug fixes, some of the changes and improvements, some of the additions of new architectures. Um, so this restriction is plenty fine. There's no x86-64 processors that even exist prior to ACPI uh, 2.0. So it would basically be a lazy BIOS uh, that is writing a version of their spec that's way older um, than their hardware. So we should be fine. Um... Okay. Is this a 32-bit OS? No, it is not. What is the difference between 32-bit and 64-bit code? 64-bit code is able to access more memory. That's basically it. <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. You have more, you have you can access more than four gigs of RAM. That's kind of the only thing. <laughs> but I want to run it on a 20-plus year old PC. Yes, that that standard 20-year-old PC with Eufy support. With 64-bit support. <laughs> How many 64-bit architectures predated August of 2000? Uh, MIPS had a 64-bit variant. Alpha had a 64-bit variant. What else? I don't... Uh, there's probably PPC64, but I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> okay. Extended RSDP requires ACPI 2.0. Now, at this stage, um, now uh, read the extended RSDP. Um, and this is just unfortunately going to be the same logic repeated. And I just don't think, we're, if we repeat this code one more time, then we'll make a function. But I think for two instances, I don't know, we could. RSDP, RSDP. The, the problem is the next one actually has a dynamic length. Nintendo 64, that was MIPS. Itani Itanium 64 was around then. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. ACPI 2.0 is probably written with Itanium in mind. Um, PPC 64 exists. Yes, I know that, but does it exist prior to... Um, does it exist prior to August of 2000? My old friend Alpha. Alpha is a beautiful architecture. One of the best architectures out there. Sad fucking day. Thought N64 is a custom MIPS arch. Yeah, I mean, pretty much anyone that does MIPS does a slightly custom thing. I64 came out in 2001. Yep, that means it was definitely, definitely well... Like, they probably had... Uh, they probably had effectively release stepping chips in 2000 then um like they would have been on very final revisions of that silicon in 2000 that's actually pretty cool power pc 620 had a 64-bit chip it's g2 when it was g2 yeah i have no idea power pc 620 was the first 64-bit chip what g2 uh, i've G2s did not have a 64-bit PPC machine, PPC processor. Uh, G4s were the last 32-bit ones, I think. Right? Let me see. Yeah. Uh, Power Mac G4s were the last 32-bit ones. I know that because I have one. I have a, um, I have a dual socket Power Mac G4, um... It's fucking legendary. I, I think it's like 1.5 gigahertz each. Dual 500. Uh, maybe it's dual 500 megahertz. It's a beast of a machine. And I've got a fucking SATA drive in there. <laughs> um, Quicksilver. I, I have the most powerful Power Mac G4 you can possibly buy. Um, maybe it's dual one gigahertz. I think it's like dual one point something. MDD, mirror drive doors. Dual 1.25s. Yeah, dual 1.25. Uh, oh, maybe I have the 1.42. So there is a dual 1.25 and a dual uh, 1.42. 
They're both the 7455 chip. Um, I might have the 1.42. I, I know it's like the, the most powerful pre-64 bit Power Mac machine. And I got it when I was doing um, vectorized emulation for, uh, I was doing vectorized emulation for PPC uh, and I wanted a machine to test it on and I wanted that machine to be 32 bit PPC only. So, Power PPC 620, okay, wow. Damn. That's fucking awesome. That's impressive. Half a micrometer process? It had 6.9 million transistors. What a joke. <laughs> 6.9 million transistors. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, <laughs> wow. Fucking literally like no transistors on there. This. <laughs> Sad. Sad. We've come such a long way. What a what a world we live in. Let me change up my music here. Uh... <sighs> From where do you know all these things? Uh, what things? Oh, I'm looking at Wikipedia on the other monitor. I don't fucking know any of this shit. <laughs> I'm just searching. Um, when it did arrive, the performance was comparatively poor, and the cheaper uh, and the considerably cheaper 604E surpass it. Yeah, I mean, no surprise. Like they sacrificed so much space for 64 bits when they weren't fucking using it. Like, there's not much you can do to accelerate 32-bit workloads with 64-bit processors. Um. Okay, so what do I want to do here? Uh, what I could do is I could put this into a function um, that basically will... I can make a function that takes a generic, which is RSDP, and then takes a closure, which allows us to... Oh, we don't need... A, mm, well, we don't know the length. The next one has a dynamic length, so it's slightly different code. So we're going to want to just copy pasta this. Sorry, chat. Sorry, chat. But we are going to go for a little copy pasta adventure. Here we go. Now read the extended RSDP. Fuck. God, this song's good, dude. Let me fucking crank that. I feel like that's weirdly quiet, but whatever. Um, okay, so... What we're we gonna do, and and the reason why we copy pasted, we're gonna justify it. Uh, basically, we're gonna read the extended RSDP. Um, R RSDP extended, yeah. I think I like that more. Um, I like to further qualify things uh, as they go to the right. So we'll do that. Then what we're gonna do is. Um, the bytes is going to be equal to the RSDP dot um, length as u size. Um, shit. The length of the table in bytes, including the header starting from offset zero, used to record the size of the entire structure. It's not available in 1.0. Um, so. The problem is handling that dynamic length is kind of difficult. I'm going to assume that we know the exact size of it. And, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and this is more explicit as well. I, I like this. I, I think this is better. Uh, length mismatch um, table. And this is uh, an ACPI table did not match the expected expected length 
right? So we're going to be really strict here, uh, which I think is the correct way to, to write stuff like this. So um, read the RSDP extended. So we basically shadow this. All we're doing is just making, we're reading this first to check the revision, and that's it. And then we're going to the next to read it as an extended one. Um, RSDP extended. And in this case, we're just going to do some of this. Uh, cast that, get the bytes, compute and check the checksum, RSDP extended. Um, and we're just going to check those. And uh, check the size. Yeah, we'll do that first, actually. Um, if um, RSDP dot length as u size is not equal to size of RSDP extended, um, and this is going to fail closed. Uh, it's possible. We are actually not handling the spec here. We are stricter than the spec in that. Uh, something could have a length of 500 and still be a valid RSDP extended structure, uh, but we're just going to be picky because if if that exists, then I want this to fail such that I know about it so I can go and reread the spec to make sure I didn't miss what fields are encoded in there. Um, okay, and this is going to be um, the extended ACPI uh, 2.0 plus um, uh, root system description pointer, and then we'll do RSDP extended. Okay, so this is going to fail real fast, which is good. Length mismatch, uh, two colons, 144, unknown on signature, and this is on because we have a base in here. So we're actually kind of Rereading this twice, um, but I'm okay with that. Um, wait. Um, oh, we already know the signature matches from up here. Um, we know the signature matches because it's the same signature as the RSDP, right? So check the revision. If it's less than two, it's too old. Uh, then we read the extended version, which is just a superset of the old one, which had the signature checked and had that sub checksum. Now we're going to check the full size checksum here, and we're going to check the size as well. Um, okay, so now this is strict uh, and going to read that entire structure. Fan fucking tastic. And then we're going to print. Um, Hexadecimally, we'll print the RSDP, and we'll just derive debug on these temporarily, just so we can spit these things out so we can see what they look like. So now we'll be able to see that RSDP structure. Um, yeah, and look at that. All the checksums matched, all of, so that we check the signature, we check this checksum, the ID we don't care about, the revision we checked, the RCT address we don't care about, the length we checked, the XSDT address is what we want out of this structure, and then the extended checksum has been checked. So everything in here has been validated, and then the reserved field is not reserved as zero, and thus we don't actually have to check that that matches anything. And we are very, very strictly parsing uh, these ACPI tables, um, and that's gorgeous. This is uh, really, really, really well done. Um, so now we can just do OK, RSDP. Um, all good. Right, and there we go. So that has led us to uh, a valid RSDP structure. We can get rid of those defines because we don't need them. And uh, get and validate the RSDP. We're going to get the extended RSDP from that location. Um, sweet. Fuck yeah. That is some good looking code, man. Do you realize that streaming all the time doesn't necessarily make it EU friendly? It just happens that when you stream 24 7, it often lines up with times. Hey. That's not my fault. All right. Um.
What do you think about the D language? Eh, not a huge fan, but I also can't speak to it too well. All right, everything in here is now new, fresh code, really high quality. The best, this is the best quality code that you can possibly get on the market. Um, so, initial, uh, okay. Let's make sure all the comments are accurate. Those are new comments, those are new comments. New comments, new comments. Load that from there. Extended. Load an extended from there. Good, good, good. This one. Uh, initialize the API, ACPI subsystem. Okay. Best quality code, I'll take two please. What was your strong, longest stream? I have no idea. Um, okay, so we will do a... Um... Oh yeah, don't, don't forget to follow. Don't forget to follow to see more content like this. <laughs> Hype. <laughs> All right, so now we're ready to read these headers here. Um, in memory representation of an ACPI table header. Uh, and these are uh, notice that if it finds one that's not listed in that, it ignores the entire table. Um, okay, so we'll grab this. So the ASCII. And did I fix all of these? Yep. Mm, yeah. And yep. Okay. So, um, yeah. Length. Mm-hmm. The length. Oops. Oops. There we go. Starting from this. Okay. Revision. the entire table, including the checksum, the entire table. Okay. OEM ID. Oops, and OEM supplied string. Okay. <sighs> Fucking copy pasta, man. Uh, looks good. And OEM. Uh, vendor for a contain ing definition blocks. Okay. Uh, containing definition blocks. Defining, distinguish, sim okay, I'm just trying to read through these, make sure there's not uh, things that got smushed like uh, we saw from some of these lines, but I think we're good here. Nothing looks fucked up. Okay. Okay. All right. Nice. Nice. -y. Um. <laughs> Tremendous quality. The best call. The best quality so far. You wouldn't even believe how big of a quality. No one has ever seen anything like it. Yeah. Yeah. Best quality code. Exactly. You're orange as fuck on my monitor with night mode on. I mean, yeah, I look pretty orange right now, to be honest. White balance is kind of weird. <laughs> How 
how is my voice sync? It looks pretty good. It should be fine. I haven't changed those settings for a long time. Damn, dude. I thought OS Dev would be more hype. Trying to make it hype. It's hard to make OS Dev hype, man. It's a, it's just a long, painful process. Voice sync is good. Good. Okay. So, um, so, um, for these dynamic length things, so far, everything has been clean. I like the way that I've done everything so far, but some of these structures are dynamic lengths. Um, wait, are the, uh, check some for the entire table. Must add to zero to be considered valid. So, What do I do? Return the point, the physical address and the length of the remaining payload, I guess. I think that's effectively what I did before. So we're going to do um, pub fn. All right, pub. Whoa. Let's, uh, let's do pub checks right now. Okay, we're good. Um, so we're going to get a uh, parse. Um, pull header fn from adder, adder, fizz adder, results, panic. Okay, this is going to, uh, from an address, determine the, um, uh, check the validity of the structure of the table. Table. Yeah, we'll just say table. Uh, check validity of the table. Um, those are good. Okay, RSDP. And I'm going to do some of this. self. I'm going to try and use self uh, more frequently. Obviously, those ones I can't do self on. Um, and then this one, that's not self, but these are self. I'm trying to get better about using self. It just makes renaming things a little bit easier. Um, and then this... Yeah, I'm okay with that. I could do size of val ref RSDP, but it it has the same effect here. Um, okay. Good. Oh, table. Oh, no. Um, um, uh, table type. Table type, type, type. Sick. Okay, so from an address, check the validity of the table. And this is going to look pretty similar again uh, to this code. We're going to read fizz, and then we're going to... We're going to read it. That's what we have to do. Uh, read the RSDP, or read the... Um, table, and then this is a type T, okay, so, oh no, this is as a header, yeah, read a self, um, okay, 
Drive debug on both of those. Those are only the the only derives, and those are the only derives we need right now. 193, call to unsafe function, unsafe fn from address. Um, let's check safety. Looks good, looks good. Everything is unsafe so far, uh, which is fair. We're working with so many raw pointers. Okay. So, read the table. Uh, read physical at that address, and then that is going to give us that table. Um... Read the table. And at this point, I guess we're just going to do a checksum check, right? Yeah. Uh, so we have, we want to check a signature. Um, maybe. Depending on how we want to do it, we, can, uh, we could potentially just iterate over this stuff, which I think is what we're going to do. We have the length in bytes. We have the revision, which we don't care about right now. Uh, checksum. So we're going to get the length and then use that to validate the checksum and then everything else I don't give a shit about, to be honest. So we're just going to um, create a slice. Uh, we can't do a slice. So we're going to do uh, zero to length dot fold um, zero u8 accumulator the value, so for each of the indices, we're going to do a core pointer read, uh, nope, uh, we're gonna do a read fizz of a u8, uh, we're gonna do accumulator checked add, oops, wrapping add, then we're going to read the byte at the address dot zero fizz adder uh, plus offsets. Yeah. So that's going to compute the checksum. Um, table dot length. Sweet. Um, mm read fizz. So read a byte at the address plus the offset. Go through all of the bytes. And this is going to um, uh, check is equal to this. Uh, compute the checksum. Compute and uh, validate the checksum. And then we're going to say if the checksum is not equal to zero, then return error. Uh, invalid uh, checksum or checksum mismatch table type. Um, I'm just going to throw that in there for now. Just make sure this builds and it should uh, checksum. Yep, this is a error. Checksum mismatch on an RSDP. And then I think we will actually just provide that value in here. Taru, oh, thank you so much for the two months. Hell yeah. What sorts of headphones do you have? These are DT770. Uh, oh, DT990s. These are the open ears. DT990s. Um, compute and validate the checksum. If the checksum is not equal to zero, then we have a checksum mismatch, and this will not fail. We'll hit our panic, which will be good. Bam. Okay. So, uh, we've checked the length and we've checked the checksum. So now, what we want to do is, I think, um, I think all of these are four bytes. So we're going to say um, an unknown uh, table type. 
an unknown table type. Okay. Um. Okay. We're going to do uh, impl from u8 for, for table type. Uh, fn from val u8 for yields a self. Um, match val. Then if if well, well we'll worry about that later everything else um self unknown now fuck yeah oops um okay so what i should be able to do now is this will be table type from table dot signature right so Vim does this tabbing by two tabs here, and I, I feel like I always do the one here. I don't know how to change that. Um, it's kind of annoying. Okay, so, well, we should probably call this function. Um, let tables is equal to rsdp dot XSDT address. Um, oh, the XSDT is just a normal, normal tabley boy. Okay. So we'll just do um, XSDT is equal to table uh, from address R, uh, fizz adder rsdp dot XSDT. Um, get the XSDT. XSDT adder. And that's a 64 bit address, and this should just chug. Um, okay. And then let's try a checksum mismatch. We're going to say one, and then this will say unknown, and then we'll see XSDT as bytes here. Um, XS. Uh, DT. Yep. Um, okay. So we're going to say uh, if these match XSDT, then um, self XSDT. This is going to be the extended system description table XSDT. So now. Um, Now, we should be able to see XSDT now. Yeah, look at that. Checks and mismatch on the XSDT. Now, obviously, that hasn't actually occurred because um, we broke that just to see our error checking, and it looks like it's good. Table type from, take the signature, convert that, and now we can kind of arbitrarily handle these things here. Um... So now what we're going to do is take a look at the, um, we can return the table type. Yeah. Uh, table type, table, 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 <laughs> table type, type, uh, from table signature. And this is, uh, get the type of this table. And then, uh, we'll just say at the end, it will return an okay self, uh, yeah, table, and then table type. Now, technically, we could just re-get that type, right? There's no reason we can't um, just re-obtain that from the return value, uh, but I actually kind of like pre-processing it like that. I think that's pretty good. Um, okay, so then that makes it down to here. Um... Unless I want to pass that in as an expected thing, and I could say I'm expecting this table type. I can't believe this content is free. Aw, thank you so much. Hell yeah.
Um, yeah, these are 990s. Or wait. Yes, these are 990s. Sub if you can't believe it. Yeah, you don't have to sub. Just follow. I don't give a fuck about sub. I mean, I, appre I appreciate those who have subbed. However, um, follows are just as important to me. Uh, follows, follows are, are people. Subs are supports, right? And I, I, while I appreciate the support, I don't necessarily need it to keep this content going. And thus, and thus, uh, follows to me are, are just as important as subs. <laughs> he doesn't even appreciate most of Sag. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Um... <laughs> if if you if you don't fucking sub your shit, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> oh man, yeah, but obviously the only reason that you actually sub is to get access to our fantastic emotes that Chad is now going to let you know all of the different emotes that we have available here, um, all of the wonderful things for. F for only $5 a month, you can support this sad excuse of a human being who thinks programming is entertaining. Um, oh, wow. Wow, chat. Are those all of the emotes that you can get if you become a subscriber to the channel? Wow, those look so cool and would make you look really hip when you go into other channels and spread the word of Gamozo. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate me now. I appreciate it. KM Draco, thank you so much for the two months. <laughs> oh, god damn it. Uh, I like how we've only written like 200 lines of code. <laughs> I guess we're being very slow and gentle and cautious. Honestly, all right, chat, how is this code quality? How is this code quality so far? From what you've seen, have we been good? Uh, about keeping things nice and readable, well commented, well documented. Uh, we haven't had much code reuse. We had one code reuse kind of up here, but there. Oh, now that we switch to using self, now that we switch to using self, there. Honestly, we could get rid of some code reuse. We could we could get rid of some code copying. So we might. Might have to fix that. How do I roll into Vim? So what you need to do is you need to you need to take your Vim, and then you 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 print it out, and then you you lick it a couple times. You put your favorite herbs and spices in there, and you just you roll it out on your table, and you grab your lighter or your nearby candle, and you get you get ripping. <laughs> How do I roll into Vim? Honestly, um, I don't know if Vim Golf is a good suggestion. It might be a little bit more for the advanced users of Vim. Um, but honestly, like, I didn't even know if I, I mean, clearly I suck at using Vim. Uh, but just download it and open it and then try to close it and then uh, just Google how to close it. And once you, once you, Figure out how to close it. You're probably on a good track for understanding the rest of it. <laughs> Vim tutor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have to do this. When I wipe my eyes, I have to do this. Otherwise, I can't read chat. Sorry. And I have two chats going. I don't know why I have two chats going. But I have two chats going. <laughs> Closing Vim is easy. Is easy. It's Alt F4. <laughs> oh, man. Someone else is faster again. Yeah, geek, dude. Come on. Come on, G cat work. <laughs> All right. So, we do we do have an alert. Everyone get your alert flashers on. We have an alert. We have copy pasted code, copy pasta code alert. Um and basically, uh our solution to that is make a function. Um so um f 
FN. <sighs> um, so what can I roll up into one? This. Bam. Get fixed table. Um, this is going to be, uh, get the, get a, uh, fixed size, uh, table. This is currently only used for the RSDP, but it could be used for anything. Effectively, we just read the physical memory at adder, um, as a type T, and perform a checksum validation on the uh, underlying bytes of uh, the, the T, right? Um, so now we can just say we have a T here, um, and then unsafe get fixed table address is a physical address. Uh, this is going to yield a T. Um, yeah, uh, we're gonna read a T. Uh, read the structure uh, from physical memory. We are then going to cast it to get the bytes. So this is a table um, from, and then this is table as const that, uh, as const T, as const U8, size of T, uh, check the checksum. Um, 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 uh, this is making it better or worse. That's what I'm trying to figure out right now. Uh, type table type get fixed table we pass in a T uh, physical address as a type go through all of those that should be pretty good 110 um, let RSDP is equal to get fixed table uh, that needs to yield something a result T. Okay. Now, um, uh, get fixed table. We're going to get an RSD, uh, we're going to get a self and, uh, from the address, and it's going to be a table type RSDP. So get the RSDP table. And then check the signature. Um, we can't check the signature generically in that function unless we made a trait, and that is not worth it. Um, a type type, <laughs> table type. What did we do before? We did table table, we've done type type. How many times have we actually fucking typed that correctly today? Um, so get the RSDP. Now we can get the extended. RSDP table, which is now going to be an RSDP extended. Bam. All right, code duplication be gone. Wait, check the size. Okay, so now this get fixed table is going to read a type of self. Uh, at this address, and then it's going to report this for error reporting. And then we check the size. Up here, we check the signature. Obviously, accessing these fields is uh, not possible. This one doesn't have a size field, and now we have gotten rid of that duplicate code. Uh, so that checksumming has now been moved to only one place, uh, which is fantastic. Big upgrades there. Um, and... We could maybe genericize across all tables, and I'm thinking about that right now. Um, so this table is going to be a dynamic size, um, and it's going to have this header, and we have a different header on the RSDP. 
Um, really the only thing that we could cut out here for duplication is the checksum, and I, I think that is acceptable to actually duplicate. It would, it would be adding more code to make them both use the same checksumming. Um, now technically I could just make a checksum function here. Um, and, uh... Unsafe fn checksum um, adder fizz adder size u size uh, results t uh, results. This is uh, compute and ACPI checksum on a structure um, on uh, physical memory. Okay, so then we can go to this one. Check some. Uh, then we're going to do, this is just going to be size. Um, SU64. We're going to fold accumulator, uh, wrapping add, read fizz at the adder.0 plus the offsets. Um, okay, and then if it's not equal to zero, um, uh, compute, uh, checksum, and then this is a uh, validate checksum, and here we can do okay. Uh, I think I like this more. If the checksum is zero, then okay. Otherwise, uh, mismatch for the type of the table, which can be found here. Um, beautiful. Okay, and then this checksumming stuff. Oh shit, do I even need this get fixed table anymore, to be honest, if I just collapse this checksumming stuff? Because this is now just gonna be um, checksum, adder, size of t, question mark, that's it. And now that has, uh, in, increased our code burden, um, self. Right, um... I love refactoring, man. 79. Nuke this. And now we're not doing the uh, from raw. Uh, we're not casting that to a slice anymore, so I'm not as worried about aliasing either. Not that that mattered in this case, but... Um, and then this is... RSDP. Uh, okay. Do I just want to validate the checksum first and then get the table? Doesn't really matter, right? Validate the checksum, then get the RSDP table. It doesn't, like, we're still reading it regardless. Um, so here we can validate that. Um, as an RSDP extended and validate that as a self and then read fizz. Okay. So we first check, we first parse it into an RSDP structure, make sure the revision is good, and then we validate the RSDP extended version. Um, and then we get that table by reading that fizz, which is the same thing we do here. Uh, check the signature up on this one. This one, the signature is implied from here. Um, and thus, this should be uh, slightly better. And then 51 length mismatch. Um, it doesn't like that because of the, uh, I think, debug. Okay. Um... 232. Okay, so now this from address 
Uh, we need to read the table first, in this case, and then we need to validate the checks, get the type from this table, and then check some address um, for table dot length as u size, and then we'll do type. And let's see if I don't put a question mark on there, will this get mad at me? And hopefully it will. Um, type, let's say we can implement clone and copy on these now. Oh, uh, we just need that on type. Yep, result unused, perfect. That's what I like to see. We'll make sure that we don't fuck that up. So this is uh, validate the checksum, and that should be good now. Okay, so now this is gonna get an XSDT and then the table type. Now the question is, um, I might do a result option potentially here uh, where the result is on errors and the option is on matching with the type that you requested. Um, so what I might do is say type is a table type and then here we'll return an uh, result option and this will basically only return if it matches. So um, then we're going to validate the checksum. So this will basically make sure that we validate all of the table entries, um, but we'll only return the option if it succeeds. So in this situation, we will return an OK sum. Um, if type uh, requested type, what the fuck was that comment? Let me double check some of these comments. Make sure I didn't fucking hang them up. Load that. Validates. Get the RSDP table. Um, let's make sure this one is using generic wording, and it is. Okay. Um, this is a uh, attempt to uh, process adder as a uh, as an ACPI uh, table. Um, uh, return an error if it is not a valid ACPI table. If it is a valid table and the type matches the requested type, uh, the requested type, uh, then this returns a, uh, returns a self. Okay. So if type is equal to the requested type, then this will return an OK sum table. Um, otherwise, it will return an OK none. Right? This is a uh, check if the type matches the requested type. OK, and then here I'm going to say I want a uh, XSDT, a table type. So now, if that's not an XSDT, then it's going to get mad at me. So table type uh, partial EQ and EQ. So now, this will return an option, right? So if we print this, XSDT, this is an option of whether or not it matches. 243 um, cannot be formatted because it's a table. Uh, let's go and add debug to this temporarily. Make sure to join Discord if you want to get your hands dirty. Hell yeah. Okay, and look at that. There is our table. So that is, it's wrapped in a sum, right? Um, and what we want to do here is, yeah. Yeah, so if we said this, we expect an RSDP here, we should see a none, right? Because it will, it'll process it successfully, um, but then it will give us uh, a none here. Perfect. So it doesn't return an error because it didn't fail to process it. It just didn't match the type that we were looking for. Um, but it was a valid table there. Now, if we take this address and we add uh, one to it, then this will very likely um, return an actual error. Uh, 
Let's see here. Meld opcode. How big is the length? The length is four bytes. Yeah, we probably just, we fucked up a length so bad there. Um, we kind of just need to coincidentally find something that doesn't have a length that causes us to just completely smash uh, memory here. Um, and that's going to be relatively hard to find, unfortunately. I'm just trying to guess. I'm trying to find something. This is going to move this signature into length. Um, revision checksum. Yeah. So ultimately, it's it's hard to say. I guess what we could do is... Well, I just... I want... Well, I don't know. I, I'm comfortable with my code here. I'm pretty sure that if this checksum fails, it will return an error rather than returning success. So, okay, XSDT. And then here, I can say, okay, or... Um, and then here, we will have an error. Um, invalid XSDT. And this is going to be uh, an error. Invalid XSDT. And this is going to say um, a valid... Uh, hmm. XSDT missing or something like that? Or like... Yeah. A valid ACPI table was found at the uh, uh, location the RSDP indicated the uh, XSDT was located at. However, it's... Um, a valid ACPI table was found at the location the RSDP, RSDP indicated the XSDT was located at, however, uh, the signature uh, did not match XSDT. Or I could just do a signature mismatch on that. Yeah, I, that's correct. What am I doing here? Um, signature, signature mismatch. I mean, so here's here's the crossroads that I have, right? Uh, there's a couple ways that I can tackle this this function. Um, one is it can take in a requested type and do exactly what it's doing now. It will treat an error as an error, but if it doesn't match the requested type, then it will. That's not an error. It's just there was a valid table here. It's just not what you were looking for. Um, on the flip side, um, we could also have this return the table type. Um, and then you check that table type on your own, which is, I think, what we were originally intending to do. And now I'm seeing more reason to do that, uh, largely because the way that we're going to process these tables, it will prevent us from calling this multiple times. Um, so I think that's what we're going to do. Um, it it makes some of this stuff a little bit uglier. Um, now, we don't care about performance too much. So basically, it comes down to we're, we're going to get to a point where we're going to do like four table in tables, right? And we're going to say like if let sum with the current model, we're going to say like if let sum um, uh, a pick is equal to table from adder, right? Uh, adder uh, table type a pick, um, right? If we got an a pick, otherwise, if we got a, a foop, right? And we'll keep going through here. Now, unfortunately, this means we're gonna have to process it multiple times. The nice thing about this, um, uh, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be better if we just return that type. Uh, attempt to process adder as an ACPI table um, and return the type of table which was found. Okay, so this is just going to be better here. Uh, it is actually what we originally planned to do. Um, and sometimes things change, you know? Uh, table type. So now read the table and then here, uh, okay, sum table type. Uh, return 
the uh, parsed information. Okay. Fantastic. 245. And then down here, obviously, we're going to get rid of that code. We're going to write it very soon here. Uh, we're going to get that. And then this is going to be uh, type. Okay. So we're going to get that. We're going to say if the type is not equal to table type xsdt, then we're going to return error, uh, error um, valid signature um, table type xsdt. Right, get the xsdt, and if the type is not equal to xsdt, then obviously that is a problem or a signature mismatch. So we expected an xsdt and we did not get one. So that is the error. Fantastic. Okay, and then we get rid of this second argument, which means we can collapse that to one line. Nice. All right, so then this will still print the XSDT. Um, yep, if it's not XSDT, then we have a signature mismatch. Okay, now that we have processed the XSDT, um, the length of the entire table of the bytes implies the number of entry fields n at the end of the table. Um, and... Length of the entire table. Um, does that include the header? Let me see here. Um, I'm trying to interpret this text. Uh, length in bytes of the entire table. I would assume that includes the header. The length implies the number of entry fields. I, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Um, if it says entire table, I would assume that means including the header. Um, and hopefully the like modulo is kind of off on this, but let, let's see. So I have the length. Um, and then what we want to do is return the um, the address dot zero plus uh, let header size is equal to size of self. Um, compute the uh, address of the table's payload and the size of it in bytes. And this is really simple. Uh, let payload address is equal to the um, adder.0 plus the header size, right? And this is just going to fizz adder. Um, as u64, and then let payload size is equal to uh, table.length as u size minus the header size. And. Um, See, invalid length, length mismatch. Yeah, let's do that as well. We're going to say, um, get the type of this table, validate the checksum. If, uh, make sure the length is sane. We're going to say, if the, when we do that up here, we, uh, we assert equality here. So here we're going to do kind of the same thing. Table.length as you size. Um, if this is less than the size of, uh, we'll just get the header size. Um, if it's less than the header size, then return error, error, uh, length mismatch. Length mismatch on the type, right? Make sure the length is sane, which means that these additions and well, this subtraction will not underflow. Uh, basically, guarantees that. So, if the length is less than this, then obviously that is a big problem. Um, okay. Not interpreted as comparison, really. 
235. Okay, so then here we will have the payload address and the payload size. So the address, then we add the header size, and then we take the length of the whole table and we subtract off the header size. And that should give us what we care about now, which is the um, uh, fizz adder and uh, use size. And then we can say it returns um, header type of table um, address of contents and content length, right? 251. Um, we actually don't care about that header in this case. Um, thought I heard that shutter. Um, then we have, uh, I might say data and length here. Hopefully that isn't too much of a problem. Um, let entries is equal to len divided by uh, I guess in this case it's just size of u64 which we know is 8 but whatever um, um Then that goes to description headers. And what's the description header? I think I think we're good here. Um, so I'm gonna do uh, if len mod size of u64 um, is not equal to zero. Make sure the xsdt uh, entries are. Uh, Modulo, make sure the XSDT entries uh, make sure the XSDT size um, is modulo a, a physical address size, right? Uh, a 64-bit address size. Um, if it's not, then return error, error. And I think we'll just say, like, uh, do we want a specific error here? Um, we could add one, which is, like, invalid table contents or something like that. But we could be more specific about this very specific occurrence. So far, all of our errors only happen in one location. Um, and thus, you know exactly, uh, you know where the error came from. Um, but this next error, if we do like invalid table and we reuse that in multiple places, then we'll end up with errors that are relatively confusing. So I think what I want to do is very specific errors for very specific things. So we're just going to say, um, uh, let's see, um, I don't know what I would call this. Like, I know what it is. It's basically, uh, um, let's say, um, hmm. XSDT bad entries or something like this. And this is, um, the, uh, XSDT table, uh, size did not, um, uh, was not evenly divisible by the, um, uh, array element size. <laughs> Enum error, error online, yeah, fuck off. Um, technically I can encode that information in an error relatively easily. Um... The XSDT table size was not evenly divisible by the array element size. It's a very, very specific error, but I love it. 
Gorgas, uh, get the number of entries in the XSDT for, um, for index in zero to entries, um, read the, uh, table pointer from the XSDT. And we'll just do let um, table adder is equal to, and at this point, these are just unknown table addresses, and we can do um, can I do like a div rem? Is that a thing? Um... I don't like, I don't like this. It, it just, um, let me see. Uh, I think there's like a, there's something for this. If I'm not mistaken, there, there's like a, a, I think there's a, like a nightly feature where they were adding stuff like this. Error variants are so cheap to make. Yeah, no reason to not be specific. Yep. Yeah, and that way it's not just like invalid table, right? Um, I typically don't do this, right? Because I'm lazy as shit, but um, I think it's good. Let's see, uh, remainder performs rem. Um, I think it's in Alec. Hmm. Um. <sighs> Let's see. Maybe it was on pointer. Two password solar wins one, two, three. Oh, you got me. Um, there's a line offset. I swear there's like a way to get like elements or something. Um, the more specific the air, yeah, exactly. Elements L L element L. I, I swear, I swear there's something in Rust. Uh, maybe maybe I am thinking of like a line offset that helps you align because this is in the same ballpark. Um, hmm. Hmm. You say I watch you fuzzing Windows 7 calc? Hell yeah. Yeah, that was super fun. All right, let's uh, let's just go here, and uh, I think we're fine with this. Table address is equal to um, mm read fizz u64, uh, and then we're gonna do the address here, the rsdp adder dot zero plus. Um, no, 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 no. This is the uh, data. Yeah, and we're just going to call this the XSDT. And then this is going to be read physical data dot zero fizz adder. And am I using eight in here? I don't think so. No, no. I'm, I'm good about that. Okay, uh, that's another thing that I want to make sure I'm doing is using these size ofs. Um, when I'm doing these multiplies. So we're going to do index times this. Uh, 270. Okay, read fizz. That time size of. Uh, and turbo fish. 
and data, this is excess dt. So uh, index time size of that as u64. Kind of gross. Uh, this will make it acceptable. And entries. That's also a U64. Uh, we can do this. Multiply them as a U size and then turn it into a U64. Doesn't really matter. Just is uh, less casts. Few fewer casts. Okay. Um, and let's just do uh, print XSDT entries, this entries. Clearly we have some issue here. And I don't know what it would be. It's probably this print. Yeah, XSDT entries. Here we go. Let's try this. Oh. Oh, that pretty much has to be alignment then, right? Um, let's see, uh, xsdt.0. Well, that's spoop. That's very spoopy. Yeah. Definitely not aligned. Um... Well, son of a bitch. Um, obviously, that one can't be unaligned. This one can't be unaligned because it's on a, a pack structure, an RSDP. This one is also a pack structure, so alignment does not matter here. Um, this one is also pack structure, so alignment doesn't matter here, but this one, it does matter. Okay. And yeah, those are all, uh, okay, now let's uh, parse the tables. Let's, um, that's the header, the type, um, data length is equal to table from address, uh, fizz adder, table adder. Okay. And now we can print all of the types and the lengths. Why not? Um, and how much arithmetic do I do in here? I don't know if I should be doing checked arithmetic. I don't think it should matter here. Um, no checked arithmetic here. Uh, none of this, no arithmetic here. Uh, no arithmetic here. Um, no, uh, we've got arithmetic here now. Um, so, I think I might, since it's untrusted data, I might turn these all into checked, um, arithmetic. But yeah, here's all the tables. Here are all of the tables that we have. Isn't that cool? All the tables and their sizes. Um, I used to get Sigbus errors all the time on Spark because unaligned, yeah. Yeah, I actually really like that Rust does this unaligned checking um, in these debug builds. So that's one thing that you can't really do with a normal bootloader. You can't really run a debug build of a bootloader because you typically just blow your size limits. Um, and in this situation, we can do it. Which is really fucking cool. Um, 
So, uh, offset, plus offset here. So, how much do I care about this? So, where do we have arithmetic? This. Um, what do I want to do for this? Do I, do I care? I could also just make it a wrapping, um, but that's not great. Um, I don't know. I'm just curious if that's going to be too pedantic. I, I like being pedantic, don't get me wrong. Um, we don't have that much arithmetic, so we, c we could do it. <laughs> Big Rick, thank you so much for the seven month. I'm so glad you care deeply about subs. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> su sucks to suck. <laughs> Is it snowing out there? Nah, it's just foggy. There's some clouds. Clouds. Oh, do I care about this? How many places do I do a plus? One, two, three. How many places do I do a multiply? One. Uh, divide shouldn't matter. Um, sick. 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 Um, I guess divs don't matter. Um, divs on these unsigned can't can't overflow. Um, right, let's fucking do it, dude. Let's fucking do it, mate. Um, uh, an integer. Occurred. Is that correct? Two C's, two R's? Oh, God, I'm so good at English. An integer overflow that occurred. Now, in this situation, I'm probably not going to be highly specific about where this happened. Uh, checked. Um, Uh, checked add. Oh, because we're in fold. Uh, there's a trifold, isn't there? Isn't there? Uh, yeah. Initial value in a closure uh, with two arguments, an accumulator and an element. The closure either returns successfully with the value that the accumulator, blah, 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 or returns failure with an error that's propagated. Um, okay. Nice. From none error, not implemented. Fuck yeah. Um, okay, or error integer overflow. And we're not going to be super specific about where those integer overflows occurred. Um, nice. Trifold is sick. Beautiful. Um, okay. Now, this we can actually... Um, We can actually do some cool stuff here. Um, we're going to do a check sub on this. 
And then we can get rid of this stuff above. Uh, check sub the header size, and then we're gonna do uh, OK or error length mismatch type. Now it's technically an underflow, but it's also that condition. So we actually kill two birds with one stone there. And then here we can do a checked add uh, this, and then we can do an OK or error integer overflow. Something in that ballpark, 236, uh, this, checked sub, okay, or, header size. Oh, we got rid of that. Um, size of self. I do want to line that, okay. Um, Okay, or integer overflow, question mark. Hell yeah, this is really fucking hardcore now. Yeah, no additions, no multiplies. Obviously, the, the ones at the end, I'm not counting those, but inside this internal code, you can give a fucking physical address that will integer overflow and, and we'll, we'll catch that and handle it gracefully. Um, gorgeous. Fuck, how fucking nice is that? That is aggressive, aggressive defensive coding. Aggressive defensive coding. That's, that's my new term here. We do aggressive defensive coding here. <laughs> we are so aggressive about our defense. Whew. Covering all bases, yeah. I mean, it's untrusted. It's untrusted data. Um... Yeah, obviously there's there's no way that we can recover from this untrusted data, but it's it's really fucking cool. Does it mean you can move the XSDT address and be safe? No. Uh, I mean, yes, I can I, I can move it, but that, it doesn't make me safe at all. I feel like I'm not grounded. I'm making a lot of static here. Hmm. Um. Are you writing tests for that? No, tests are useless. Um, let's see here, okay, um, now get the number of entries in the XSDT, carpet, yeah, I'm on carpet, uh, get the number of entries in the XSDT, then we go through all of the entries, and this is, uh, go through each table in the XSDT, uh-huh, so if it's not XSDT, then signature mismatch. If the length is fucked, then bad entries. Uh, get the number of entries, go through the entries. Um, and then here we can do all of this checked. Um, we'll do... Uh... Entry address is equal to xsdt.0.checked add um, I think I want to do this. It's, it's kind of like reverse notation, but um, index checked mole uh, size of u64. Um, and then, uh, x dot checked add, uh, xsdt dot zero. So this is, um, get the physical address of the, uh, xsdt entry. And then here we can just say as you size. I'm actually fine with that here. Um, and then here we'll do entry address. Uh, get the table address by reading the XSDT entry. Uh, it has um, it has been observed in Kimu. Uh, 
uh, 5.1.0 uh, with um, O. Uh, it has been observed in O. Uh, oh, be right back.
Alright, uh, what were we doing again? We were going through and it had been observed in OVMF that these addresses uh, indeed can be unaligned. So I don't know if that's actually in the spec or not that this can be unaligned, but we've seen them. We've seen that those can be unaligned and thus uh, that is important to us. Um, and then here we do OK or uh, error integer overflow and we'll just check that. That looks good, 279. Um, expected a fizz adder, found a u size, yes. As u64, so we're just gonna make that. And now this should theoretically print the uh, Yeah, we actually have to load that table. So now this is uh, a parse and validate the table header. Um, let's this, then we have a type, we have data, and we have a length is equal to um, table from adder, fizz adder, and I could technically just read a fizz adder directly. Um, that's okay. That's okay here. Eh, I'm gonna keep it as a U64 and uh, do this instead. Um, just in case for some reason I change fizz adder, it'll make this code pretty much all break, uh, which is good rather than just like silently work by reading the wrong thing. Um, 283. Okay, here we go. And then we shadow those variables, which looks good. All right, um, all of the different tables that we have, obviously nothing too crazy there. And now we can match on the type of the table or more specifically, we can figure out the tables that we care about. And we really only care about the tables which will contain, I think uh, we want APIC. Um, So we have APIC, and this is, uh, and this is APIC uh, table. I guess we can we can type out what APIC is, but um, actually multiple APIC. I see. This is uh, MADT. This is the multiple APIC descript description table. I feel like I spelled that wrong. Descript description table. Okay. Um, multiple APIC description table. Then we have the, what else do I care about? Uh, I feel like FACP I've used before, um, but why? Oh, wow. That would have been, I would have used the FACP, uh, FADT back to, um, like, shut down the computer. Wow, I don't, like, I haven't done that for, like, a, a 10 years, but that's still, like, something I remember quite vividly. Um, RSDT, is that what I want? No. Now, RSDT is the list of the tables. Uh, SRAT, um, that's what I want. This is the system resource af affinity table. And this is going to tell me which cores um, belong to which NUMA nodes. Okay. And MADT, self MADT. And B SRATs, self SRATs. Okay, and we'll be able to see what we have here. Ah. Really? Oh, APIC. Um, that MADT is actually APIC. That's why. 
The SRAT, yeah, this computer won't have an SRAT, or this VM won't have an SRAT because there aren't multiple NUMA nodes. Um, but, yeah, MADT 140. Okay, sweet. Um, all right, so then uh, we can effectively match on the type, and we can just say uh, uh, unknown, and then otherwise, this is the... this. Um, table type, MADT. Okay, so we have that, and sweet, so, oh, errors, there we go, problem solved. All right, so, um, M A D T and so parsing that is relatively easy. We have the header, then we have these st structures underneath it, and these ones are kind of fucking ugly. Um, 32 bit address at which the each processor can access its local interrupt controller. Ah, so I might do, um, I might make a macro here to kind of consume this memory. I'm not 100% sure how I want to do this. So I have the address that I can access the APIC, uh, which is cool, just in case it was remapped or something like that. Um, multiple APIC flags. Interrupt controller structure. And then that can have various structures. Yeah, I can show you guys. Um, but effectively, there's like... It's, it's really not that complex of a structure, but it is something that you kind of have to deserialize, and it's not absolutely trivial. So um, we've got an address here, which is basically where you find your local interrupt controller. Super simple. It's just, a, it's just an address, physical address. Um, then the flags, uh, which are the... Um, I don't actually know necessarily what the flags are. Oh, I see. Basically, whether or not there is... A one indicates that the system also has a PCAT compatible dual, dual 8259, that's a PIT, um, set up. So the 8259 vectors must be disabled, that is masked, uh, when enabling the ACPI APIC operation. So basically this lets you know whether or not um, you need to disable the uh, PIC before you enable the APIC which I think we can just do indiscriminately. I don't think we have to really check this flag, but it, it exists here if we do care. Um, then we have this varying length structure here, which is just kind of random bytes. And these are basically serialized and deserialized in weird ways. Um, so I think they all have basic structures of a type and a length, a one byte type and a one byte length. Um, and then they just have information inside of them. So we can parse only the ones that we care about, um, which is largely going to be um, NMI source. Oh, interesting. Uh, we're not going to be doing... I don't think we're going to do any interrupts in this entire OS. So we shouldn't have to worry about interrupts at all. Um, local SA pick. Um, okay, local S A pick. Then not um, platform interrupt source, iOS A pick. Okay, and then X two A pick. Really, all we care about are the um. We care about the. Hmm. What's this? 
Interrupt models, don't care about that. I think we only care about the APIC entries and the X2 APIC entries. We just want a list of all of the processors that exist on this system. That's it. We want a list of all the processors and then the domains that those processors belong to. And if I'm not mistaken, those domains are in here. So um, local X2 APIC, we have the APIC ID. Um, 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 hmm, the processor declared in the namespace device, interesting, uh, where's the domain? There's that reboot, because we have an unregistered. Not a big deal. Um, we could actually probably leverage that by setting the NMI to like a, a short timeout of like 30 seconds, and it will keep re-downloading it, and we'll be able to kind of test on real hardware in a hacky way, where it just keeps reloading um, our code. Uh, local APIC structure. Declare processor. Cape Babel. The Cape Babel. <laughs> um, if this bit is set, the processor is ready for use. If it's clear and online capable of set, then... It supports enabling it during runtime. Okay. So why do I feel like I don't know where the domain stuff is? Or maybe it's just the SRAT will define that. Um, where is that at? SRAT, okay. So SRAT. processor, local affinity structure, APIC ID, and then the domain. Uh, yeah, this has the domain information on it. So do I even need to know the APICs? I guess I, I guess I do so I can get whether or not those are, whether or not those processors are enabled. Um, so yeah, we'll process the APIC table first. Um, the MADT. So describes all interrupts for the entire system in a uniform interrupt model, uh, such as that, Intel, SAPIC, GIC. I think GIC is uh, ARM. Yeah, yeah, GIC. Um, with it, without interrupts, uh, what is the networking plan this time? Same as last time, uh, just a, a poll based networking stack. Um, I pretty much never do interrupts in my networking stack. I'm not a I'm not a big fan of interrupts. Let's see. Multiple APIC flags, and this is kind of what I was dreading to do. And it, I guess it just comes down to it's it's time to just fucking do it. Uh, so we're just gonna do a parse, um, maybe like an MADT. Um. And here we will take in a an address, uh, which is data, and that's gonna parse that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's all the code. Okay, uh, and then up here we'll have to start making those. So we'll do a struct madt uh, impl uh, from. We'll just start off with nothing. Um, impl madt unsafe fn from adder adder fizz adder returns a result self uh, panic okay and then this is going to um, process the uh, payload payload of an madt 
um, based on a physical address and a size. Um, okay. Data and len. Okay, so now what we want to do is um, um, so I might make something in memory management that allows me to um have like a physical slice um and consume from that physical slice here's here's what i'm thinking um fizz adder and u size and this is a consume a consumable um slice of physical Maybe just a slice of physical memory. Um, the consumable is kind of cool. Uh, so we can do impl fizz slice. Uh, we'll make this pub. Uh, pub. Pub unsafe. Fn new mute self. Oops. Um, adder fizz. Adder uh, size, u size, uh, yield to self, fizz slice, adder size, and this is going to. Uh, what's going on here? Okay. Um, create a new slice. Uh, Slice to physical memory, and then this is maybe I shouldn't call it a slice because it doesn't have an associated type. Um, yeah, and that's going to be consumed kind of in a generic way. Uh, what we're going to do is like unsafe. Here's what I'm thinking: pub unsafe, fn consume t. Adder uh, mute self yields a uh, result t um, uh, I don't know what the result is going to be here, but it's not going to be success. So this is going to be um, read a uh, T from the slice, updating the uh, pointer. Okay. Um. Zoom T. This. Um, okay, um, if self dot z, uh, self dot one is less than, uh, size of t, then, um, return error and this is uh, make sure we have enough data to consume um, and then otherwise we'll just do a self dot zero plus equals um, is equal to self dot zero checked add um, Checked add uh, size of t dot okay or this um, update the pointer 
It's going to be uh, read the memory. Um, let's just say new pointer. Yes. So update the pointer. That's also doing a bounds check on that um, that range there. I guess I could do that ahead of time. Um, so what we could do is fizz slice is equal to this, and then we can say um, uh, results t then this. Oops, what am I doing? Uh, this is a self on that. And then we can say uh, if adder checked add um, size, adder.0.checked add size as u64 is none, uh, return error. Uh, make sure there is no integer overflow in the physical address range okay and then we also need to do size minus one here i guess um if size is greater than zero and the address um if the size is greater than zero and the size if that is none this basically we want this to be able to address i guess for physical memory it doesn't really matter um but uh, for memory ranges, we often want to use inclusive ranges because, like, what if I want to read uh, 16 byte? Uh, well, let's just say eight bytes from this address, right? Um, obviously, uh, OXFFF8 plus eight is an overflow, right? If this is 16 bit address space, right? It's not, but. We're just simplifying it. So this is one reason why uh, you kind of have to deal with the um, kind of inclusive ranges when you're working with these sorts of things. So if the size is greater than zero, um, and if the size is greater than zero, if it is equal to zero, then we'll just return a slice to nothing. Um, I guess I, s I need to do an integer overflow check on all these things anyways. It, do it doesn't really matter uh, because t is varying here. So we're going to say uh, compute the updated pointer. Um, will this be uploaded to YouTube? Yes. If yes, when? All, uh, right away. <laughs> Like, within a day. Um, unless I get lazy. And then it's, who knows when. So... Make sure we have enough data to consume. Self.1 is less than size of t. Uh, if there are fewer bytes present in the slice than what we want to read, then obviously that is a problem. Uh, then we compute this updated pointer, um, which I might just do a wrapping add on it then. Ah, shit. Um, this is actually really tough. Um... So, I think, I can't, I can't subtract one here, but I'm, I'm trying to think through, um, if I did that, well, that would be off, um, oh, that's really tough, I hate, I hate this shit. I hate this arithmetic right at the end of memory. It's always a complete pain in the ass. Um, read T from the slice, updating the pointer. If self one is less than that. So we do no overflow checking here, but at this stage we're gonna check for overflows. With the exception of a quality, which we can return early. Um, huh. 
how do I want to do this? I'm trying to think how I make this nice and clean. Um, obviously, at this point, we want to read that memory. Um, let the adder, uh, let the data is equal to uh, read fizz unaligned t on self.0, right? So this is uh, read the actual data. Um, that's going to read it unaligned. And <sighs> but I kind of want to make sure I, there's no overflow, and that's really fucking hard. If basically an overflow is acceptable, but only if it overflows to zero. <laughs> um, which is kind of strange. Hmm. It's me, Android bug dude. Uh, doing some Kimu stuff. Do you know uh, any to do pointer scans in Kimu? Like pointer to another pointer at offset A? Oh, are you trying to do cheat engine pointer scans? I, I don't know of anything that would do that for you. You're pretty much just going to have to write that code. <laughs> um, shit. Man. hate this shit. Fizz slice. Consumable slice of physical memory. Are we only going to use this in ACPI? And I think the answer is yes. We're never going to use this for anything else. Um... Like, this has the same issue, right? And that's where things are really tough. Like, this has the same problem. Uh, wrapping it, that's accumulating, that's fine. Then we take this address and we add that offset. Um, in this case, it's actually okay because they're bytes. Um, right? Um, because that's the actual address we're going to read. So if that overflows, then we, then we truly had an, an overflow. Then down here, um, yeah, because we don't want to read at 0. And this would prevent us from reading at 0 because this would prevent us from wrapping that address space. But this one is actually wrong. Um, well, this one's fine. This one is subtracting the header size from the table length, which is okay. And then this one is adding that to that physical address. And this one could technically be wrong if we're at the very end of memory. Now, it's physical memory, so we're, it's, we're not going to be. But we could be, right? Like, theoretically, um, in some theoretical system, uh, it, it could be, and these are like good things to think about. Um, so this check sub is fine, and then th the, basically the problem is like you're trying to do index versus length, and lengths are kind of a really tough. So take this, add that header size. Um, I don't know, maybe 
Like, the answer is I probably just shouldn't care. Um... This one's actually okay because we're doing the checked add. Uh, we're adding that header size. Um... That's getting the index, but then we could uh, actually read fizz could go out of bounds, right? Read fizz could could mod that address space, and I, I think like ultimately maybe we just don't care about it. I don't I don't know. Like, maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe I'm trying to make it unnecessarily complicated. That multiplies fine. And then, check to add that. Uh, so, like, I think in Rust, it's unde undefined behavior anyways. I don't, like, Rust does not allow uh, wrapping in the address space. Um, checks up that. Add that. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's worth the unnecessary complication. Uh oh, stream dead? No, okay. <laughs> this is just Twitch. Um, fuck. Like, oh, I hate these problems. They're so tough, man. I think everything in here is actually fine. So this one is okay, because that's just adding to get an index, which is fine. Um,. This one is subtracting to get the remaining length, which is fine. This one is uh, adding to get the um, index, which is fine. Uh, basically, none of these are going to go out of bounds. This one's multiplying by that U64. And then we're adding that to the uh, base. Once again, we're getting an index. This is fine. The, the problem really comes to when we actually go to read those things and if we go modulo the boundary. Um, and that comes to basically these reads, right? Um, so we're just going to do this. We're going to do it for now. Uh, read the actual data. Um, so if it's less than that, then we're going to read the data. Um, then compute the updated pointer. And we don't care about that. In this case, we're just going to ignore it, and we're just going to say self.1 uh, plus equals uh, core size of t update the uh, pointer and length. So the length gets reduced, and then the pointer uh, self.0 plus equals... Uh, self.0.0 .0 .0, uh, plus equals size of t and that's going to that's going to advance the pointer overflowing add gives both a result and a bool that's not going to help me in this case unfortunately Um, hmm. I mean, like, I could use that to get, to get if there is a zero, and I could basically say an overflow is okay uh, if it overflowed zero, but I think we're just probably not going to bother here. Okay, data. 
update the pointer and the length, and then return the data, and then here we'll use uh, core uh, mem size of 29 as uh, u64. Okay. So what we should be able to do now is make this consumable slice of physical memory uh, when we get this. So we can do um, let slice is equal to mm fizz slice address size. Create a slice to the physical memory. And then we're just going to loop. Um, while slice dot len is greater than zero, uh, pub fn len. It would just be a match with three arms. Yeah, it, it's just messy. I don't know. I don't think it's worth self dot one. Uh, get the remaining length of the slice. Let the... Okay, so now what we can do is... Um... Hmm. Do I just put fizz slice inside of here anyways? Maybe sub one to get the last index of the last element. Yeah, that's the correct way. Um, really, that logic comes down to uh, read fizz. These ones, right? These are the things where which would have to be affected. Everything in here is actually okay. Um, it's this that could potentially go out of bounds. Like obviously, this one could wrap. Uh, but this could prevent it universally in all places. It's This is the only place where we're doing a length instead of an index. Everything else in here is index-based in, in both of these files, ACPI and memory management. Um, your call, man. Yeah, it's just... it Like, these routines need to be really fast. Um... They're already marked unsafe. Now we are working with untrusted data and arguably it should be on the creation of that stuff in these realms where we actually validate those things. Um, right. Um, I mean, the, the main problem is it's, it's actually impossible to encode this. Uh, mainly because we are using a, an address and a length, and you actually can't you can't address all of memory with an address and a length, um, and that's that's kind of the problem. We would ha we would have to steer away from using an address and a length, which is is just probably not worth it. Um, these ones I'm okay. These are unsafe, right? It's on you to make sure you're using trusted data here. Um, we are working with untrusted data. It's technically on this code. It's this code's job to make sure uh, that those are okay. Um, but yeah, we could do the one check up top to make sure that we don't go uh, across those boundaries. Uh, but we're already potentially making mistakes in this code. Anywhere that we read physical memory, like right here, right? We're reading physical memory, and that could potentially be uh, wrapping. Um, it could be wrapping that, that memory. And once again, it, it isn't going to. Now, these are pointers that are uncontrolled, um, but it's going to fault anyways when we try to access those things. So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But if I wanted the expressibility to 
expressibility to be correct, then I would not be able to express a zero byte slice. Unless I obviously add more uh, variables to this tuple, uh, which I'm not going to do because that's just a mess. So basically, if I wanted to treat those physical addresses as untrusted, um, then any place that I read physical, right, and I could just turn read fizz um, into something that would check for that wrapping of the physical range. It doesn't fucking matter though, because we're 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 about to read physical memory, right? We're literally about to just read an arbitrary physical address, and we have no way of validating it. So, you know, what are we gonna get? And I, I realize the stream is cutting out, so sorry. I don't know if that's on my end or not. Um, if it is on my end, I'm sorry, but I don't think it is. I highly doubt that it is. Yeah, it's not on my end. <laughs> so, must be ingest side. All right. Um yeah, we're just going to be okay with that because there's we're literally we're reading an uh, an untrusted physical address. There's there's it, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um And when I say untrusted, it it's still trusted because we're reading it. We 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 have no option. Um, it's kind of this weird world where the we the address is whatever the firmware wants it to be. Uh, it is an untrusted address in that we don't control and validate the creation of that address. But on the flip side, we can't make a fucking operating system without using it. So we are forced to use that address. Um, there's nothing we can do. Um... So, yeah, there's literally nothing that we can do there. We are, we are forced to just trust it. Okay, so we're going to create a slice to the physical memory. And then what we should be able to do now is consume the uh, local uh, APIC address. Um, and we can just do slice consume. This is a U32. Um, yeah, but welcome to really, really pedantic programming. Um, 264. 264. Uh... What's going on here? Lower hex on results. Yes. Um, we're just going to unwrap that for now, but we're just going to see. Fuck. Uh, oh, new. Fizz slice. Could you overlay Twitch chat into the VOD? I can't really. I don't have that historical data and it. It just kind of gets too cluttered, unfortunately. Um, okay, that's good. Wow, that worked. Okay, nice. So this will um, read the uh, 32, uh, get, read the local APIC uh, physical address. Um, and... When can this fail? If we run out of data here. That's okay. Uh, we'll make this our own map error. I think uh, they just mean to add the chat to the screen so it's saving the thoughts. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't like having the chat on the screen. I, I recognize people do like that, but I, I don't know. I'm not a huge fan. Map the error, and then we're going to convert this error into um, let's see. In this situation, we can do probably invalid table. 
Um, uh, actually a length mismatch, maybe. Did not match the expected length. Which is okay here, I think. Um Right, and now that is going to get that local APIC address. Um, and basically, if we fail to consume that, we're going to uh, use that length mismatch here. So, you're pretty good about reading the questions before you answer them. Yeah, that's kind of the point. That's the goal. Um, let's see. Um... Is this going to get too noisy with this? Uh, and I might just do like corrupt table here. Going to make a new one. Um, um, the when processing the contents of a table, um, I guess length mismatch is actually correct here because that's that's what's happening. It's it's required that this table has this length, um, and basically, if it doesn't, then yeah, it's a length problem on the MADT because it's those things have to be filled in, right? These are required fields. Then we have a dynamic size field here, um, but yeah. Uh, local APIC physical address, then we're going to grab the, um, uh, get the uh, APIC flags, same sort of thing. This is gonna be flags. And I might make this into an error, um, const, E error is equal to this, um, and this is uh, just a uh, the error type to throw uh, when the uh, MADT is truncated. Okay. Right, and now we can do that. And then we just do flags here. Okay. And I'm okay with the single letter uh, variable because it's in a local scope and it's pretty uh, unpolluting there. Um, otherwise, these are just going to get massive. That's unfortunately kind of how these things get okay so now we do uh, while slice dot len is greater than zero okay and this is a handle interrupt controller structures and these vary and then they all are uh, yeah Type in a length, type in a length, type in a length, type in a length. Yeah. Okay. So type is equal to slice consume u8 map error e um, and then the len. Okay. Okay. And then what we'll do, um, we'll just do slice dot um hmm. len for each slice uh consume u8 map error It's kind of gross. I could make another function here that will just discard. Um, dis, uh, yeah. This one actually is safe. <laughs> uh, mute self. Uh, results t 
this. And this is um, uh, bytes. You size uh, discard bytes uh, from the slice by just updating the uh, length, uh, updating the pointer and length. Then we'll just say if bytes is less than, uh, if self.1 is less than bytes, return error. Um, if it's greater than or equal to, otherwise error. Then here we just update these things. Update the pointer in length. Um, and this is just going to be bytes as u64, and then this is bytes. So, yeah. Uh, and then here we'll just say, uh, it's greater than or equal to. So equal, it will allow us to go down to zero, which is great. Slice, discard, uh, len as u size. And then if I don't put a question mark there, it should get mad at me. Um, oh, yeah, uh, this, okay. Fantastic, okay. So then put a question mark on that. That'll make sure that it actually was able to consume that information. Um, map error, blah, e. Okay. Uh, length mismatch. Okay. Uh, length. Eight. One, two, three, four, five, four, five, six, seven. Ah, length includes those two bytes. <sighs> Sub. Um, two. Dot. Uh, okay, or E. Um, basically, the, uh, so this is uh, read the uh, interrupt controller the structure header, right? So that gets the type and the length, and then explicit panic. Fantastic. That means we made it through. So now we can print the uh, types and the lengths. And this will tell us all of the information that is contained in here. OK. And we have no asserts, unwraps, or expects in here, do we? No, we don't. Beautiful. This code's pretty good. Um, I don't think we have any things that won't work well here. Uh, so zero is a local APIC uh, structure. Right? Yes. So uh, match type. Um, here we go. Uh, unknown type, just discard the um, uh, data. Okay, and then if it is a zero, then this is a local uh, processor, local APIC structure. And from here, we will get the, um, this is the APIC ACPI processor UID, which is slice consume U16 map error E, Okay, um, let the APIC ID is equal to this. Oh, that's one byte, U8. And then this one, one byte. Uh, is that a one-liner? Oh, yeah. Is this one? No, no way. Yeah. Okay, um, and then uh, let flags... Do the slice consume u32 map error 
E. Um, I'm really tempted to f uh, further slice that. Um, if oh yeah, um. Repper C packed struct local apic um uh ACPI pros processor UID uh this is a U8 this is an APIC ID U8 this is flags U32 Um, processor, okay, so this is deprecated. The OS associates this local APIC structure. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then this is uh, the processor's local APIC ID. And this is uh, local APIC flags. Um, OK. So what we can do is if len is not equal to size of local APIC, uh, obviously that is an error. Um, ensure, uh, identical, uh, ensure the, uh, data is the correct size. And then if it is, then we get the, um, APIC is equal to slice consume, um, local APIC. Okay, uh, map error. Please fit. It does. Okay, print. And now I can do derive debug. And this should. See size will promote that one. Okay. APIC is equal to that. Okay, so here are all of the APICs that we have. Isn't that cool? And then the flags, uh, that basically indicates um, in this situation that these are ready for use. Um, so basically, um, bit zero, uh, enabled, um, set if uh, ready for use, bit one, um, online capable, fuck it. Um, I'm tempted to do like a table here or something. Um, reserved as zero if bit, uh, if enabled, um, indicates uh, if the uh, APIC uh, can be enabled at uh, runtime. Okay, we'll leave that for now. Um, sweet. Um. All right, now we also have x2 apic info. Let's go find it. Let's go dig it up. Um, processor local x2 apic structure. We've got a nine. Processor local 
X2, A pick, structure, wrapper, C packed, struct, uh, X2, A pick, uh, local X2, A pick. Um, technically, that's often stylized like that. I don't know which one I want to do. We'll do this. Um, reserved. U16. Oh, rip. Um, X2 A pick ID. U32. Flags. U32. Um, processor. UID. U32. Okay, that looks good. Now let's grab these in. Uh, reserved. Must be zero. What? Oh. <laughs> I thought the no signal happened, but my Twitch is just behind. Um, reserved. X2 A pick ID. The processors local X2 A pick ID. This is the uh, same as local A pick flags. Okay, um, this is OSPM associates this, sick, same sort of logic here effectively, local x2 apic, x2 apic, and we should just be able to print that out, let's just see. I don't know if we'll actually have X2 APIC data on this system. I suspect we will not. Uh, nope, I am not seeing it. QMU system uh, hgrep APIC. Uh, help. Wow, really? Um, I wonder if Kimu cannot emulate the X2 A pick. I know Box can. Um, huh. Well, I'm pretty sure we got that right. Uh, reserved two and then 444. 32, 32, 32. Looks good. ACPI processor UID flags X2 A pick ID. Okay. Stupak62, thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. Hell yeah. Um, does look good, does not equal, return error, then we consume that, consume that, what machine are you planning to run on, what, what do you mean by that, like what architecture, uh, x eighty six sixty four right now, but, uh, we're kind of positioning that we are ready to run this on ARM if we so choose. Um, error. Get that. Get the flags. Consume this. While slice that length is greater than zero. Uh, if we make it to the explicit panic, then we are good. Okay. Um... Um, um, don't want to use up too much of the candle in one day. Okay. Um, so, what do I want to do here? Local APIC. So basically, I want to return um, this information. Now, I don't have allocations yet. So, what I'm thinking is that I will. Um, I, 
I might just do a fixed size array. Unfortunately, there's nothing causing these uh, APIC IDs to be contiguous, but I think I might just do it. Um, I think typically they are going to be relatively sequential, um, and it's something that we could change at a later point that will allow us to implement this uh, without having to make a stack allocation, uh, which I think is really good. Um... Slice consume local APIC, map error, APIC. So I basically have to wrap these up into some structure so I can record this information because obviously I'm not processing this for no reason. Um, I actually want to do something with this information once I have it. Um, oh yeah. Three fifteen. Same issues on these ones too. Uh, derive. We don't need those. Just for, just for testing, we can get rid of those now. Um, okay. Uh, Three forty four. Oh yeah, here we haven't figured this out yet. Panic. Uh, yeah, I don't yet know what I want to return out of there. What OS are you running in Polar and Grizzly? Uh, this OS. The OS that we're writing right now. 344. Um, 344. Okay. Uh, yep. Explicit panic. Yeah. Uh, cargo check. Discarded. Discarded. Yep. 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 Okay. Uh, that makes sense. Those things are removed, which is just fine. Um, so, can't do allocations yet, and why are we getting this information? Oh yeah, we also wanted to parse, um, like the serial port, we wanted to figure out where the serial port was. ATA controller devices. UART serial bus connection description. Is that what I want? Um. SPCR. Serial port console redirection table. Um, so that's a Windows defined thing. I don't know if this is going to be set up. I don't think this is right. Maybe? Like, we're not going to have an SPCR here. There's no way. There's no way that we have an SPCR here. Yeah. Um, well, technically, uh, 345, we don't parse all of the tables. Uh, let's just do OK self, right? But this is an option that you typically have to set up in your OS. Uh, panic at 44. Oh! Oh! Uh, SPSR. SPCR, sorry. This is an ARM. 
Uh, not mentioned in there. Um, Yuffie ACPI. I mean, so there doesn't seem to be a BDA. So maybe. Um, indicate whether a serial port or a non legacy UART interface is available for use with Microsoft Windows Emergency Management Services. Yeah. Uh, which is quite specific. Must be referenced in the RSDT. Um, but this has the info that I want. Um, the base address described in the generic ax address structure. It's 12 bytes. So this is the generic address structure. Um, interrupt type used by the UART. IQ, baud rates. Um, Hmm. Because otherwise, I don't know. Uh, let's do OSF serial. I actually don't know how you figure where those things are. Um, right. We, we know, like, maybe I'm just supposed to use the fixed IO port addresses, uh, but I did like detecting those out of the BDA. Um, so... Like, we do have an entry here. Um, you might be able to find the addresses in the BIOS data area. However, be warned, this won't work on modern EUFI systems. Uh, um... Tell you about uh, serial ports that only exist in the chipset and lack any kind of connector that can be plugged into. Uh, won't tell you about additional serial ports, expansion cards uh, that firmware uh, doesn't and can't know about, and will make your OS susceptible to BIOS quirks and bugs. Because the serial ports have relatively standard I/O ports, it's far more effective to use manual programming techniques instead. Specifically, see if the scratchpad register can store a value and then do a loopback test. Um, yeah, so like, effectively we can just hard code those ports and, and basically probe if, if they do work, um, rather than getting that out of ACPI. Um, uh, SPCR. So I'm just trying to see like if this is the correct solution. Um, parse SPSR, bool early console. Like this might tell me how to access that serial port, um, even when it's an ARM machine, right? Required for ARM64. No way. Huh. What else? Uh, what about SRAT? Not required. Recommended. Optional. S yeah, SPCR is required for ARM64. Well, according to uh, Linux, the expectations... So Linux expects that there is an MADT, SPCR, uh, what, what's MADT, I forget. 
Um, multiple APIC description table. Oh yeah, that's what I just did. Um, oh, so they use an MADT. That makes sense. Okay. Um, so what we just parse should work on ARM. Um, okay, we're gonna put the uh, we're gonna put that debug info back in here quick. Uh, match. Uh, drive, debug, clone, and copy on those, and then we're going to use this, we're going to print this information, apic, apic. You need to parse the gig stuff, yeah. Yeah, because ARM, ARM boots all the processors uh, by default. Um, the GIC is only just for figuring out interrupts, which I, I don't care about. So, because <laughs> we're not going to be doing interrupts. Um, but yeah, all the GIC stuff is down here. Um... Does Risk Five use ACPI? Mm hmm. It is mentioned in the um, in EFI. So, Yuffie binding twenty seventeen Risk Five. Um, if ACPI is supported, so I'd love to run this OS on uh, Risk Five, but I I don't know if they're gonna have ACPI. Uh, what version is this? January twenty nineteen, and there's no mention of Risk Five. Um, PLIC, work in progress, okay. MADT, a ACPI table for uh, that. And this is basically making a PLIC, platform level interrupt controller, uh, which will hold the information for risk five. And number of hearts connected. Oh, interesting, okay, cool. Maximum interrupt level, yeah. Cool. So, uh, not really a thing yet. Uh, Yuffie and Risk Five. Let's see what what else we have here. Um, I'm basically trying to figure out how the fuck would I figure out, um, how would I figure out where the uh, serial port is, right? ACPI. Yep, that XSDT entries all of this shit. Processor agnostic, yeah. Ready for risk five. Um. This is a, these slides are fantastic. Um, these are beautiful slides. What is, what is this? Eufy? Are some plans to support Eufy plus ACPI on High Five Unmatched? Um, I hate device tree files. Uh, Eufy is enabled by default uh, in U-Boot for Risk Five. Yep. No one is working on ACPI, which is not really needed. Even on Unleashed, one could boot with TFTP and Pixie. 
Um, DTB is embedded in the firmware, should see no difference. Okay, so effectively, um, so on ARM, I think it's common to, to use those tables. And like Linux was saying, seeing an SPCR, serial port re uh, console redirection, and I think SPCR is going to tell me actually how to use that serial port. So we could make a like very generic serial port driver that would theoretically work uh, like out of the box. Um, like... Interrupt types used. Yep, there's a GIC, right? Uh, zero is not supported, one is supported. Well, how would I actually configure these things? I don't have a way to configure these, to be, to, to be honest. Um, I can get the PCI information about it, which is cool, I guess. Um, Validar queues, GSIV, the vector. Hmm. Um, okay, um, I, yeah, I don't think this is going to be super useful. Generic address structure, we could use that to figure, basically figure out these, these com ports, um, and then we could configure it based on that information. They require a 16550? Really? Oh. Oh. Okay, that's kind of cool. Um. So. Wow, we could make that really generic. <laughs> Terminal type. Yeah, we could parse this out. And then what? These are fixed 12 bytes. I see. They get padded to 12 bytes. Um, zero's console redirection is disabled. And that's the only one I care about. Um, basically, if it's zero, then console redirection is disabled, and then this will allow me to know exactly what console I actually want to redirect to. Um, on a system where the BIOS or system firmware uses the serial port for console input and output, this table should be used to convey information about the settings to ensure a seamless transition between the firmware console output and the Windows EMS output. Well, this is exactly what we want to do. Um, yeah, I, I think we're going to do this. Um, I think I'm going to wrap up the stream for today uh, just because it's been a while and I need to do some run some errands. Uh, I need to pick up some more Christmas lights. Um, but yeah, I think we're gonna, uh, we're gonna figure this out. And then, um, I have a, uh, ARM64 board that we're gonna get this OS booting on. Uh, yeah, we're gonna try to get this OS booting on, an ARM64 board and do development kind of in parallel on both systems. How does that sound? That sound fun? 
And then we can maybe write an ARM64 hypervisor as well. Does the ARM64 board support Eufy? Yes, it does. It is a, um, uh, shit. It was like top of the line when I got it. Um, uh, Mochiato board? <laughs> I don't know how to spell that. Woo. Ma Macchiato bin. Oh, I was actually close. Um, I got the double shot. So it is a uh, quad core, two gigahertz, ARM64 with 16 gigs uh, dim. I think it just has one dim slot. Yeah. Um, it's basically it, like peripheral wise, it's actually pretty loaded up. So let's see. Um, right. Oops. But yeah, this is the board. Uh, one DDR4 dim. We have the UART pins there. Uh, DC jack, uh, ATX power, which I think is what we're going to use. Maybe we'll use the DC jack. I don't know. Um, and then a USB 3.0. Uh, it's got a 10 gigabit SFP. Um, it's actually got two 10 gigabit SFP uh, ports, and then they're also RJ45 bonded, SFP 2.5 gigabit, uh, RJ45 1 gigabit, so we've got a lot of shit on here, JTAG UARTs, uh, yeah, two UARTs on here, a fan, it's fantastic, and it's got a PCI uh, times 4 slot, right, so I can just throw anything in there, right, uh, I use that to throw in an NVMe stick, um, which I booted like windows off of this. I've booted a bunch of stuff on here. Um, but this is, this has a complete enough firmware that I am able to boot windows on it. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure we'll be fine. So, but yeah, it's pretty fucking cool, dude. Uh, it's a, it's a great, great thing. Uh, the processor itself, it's actually a pretty clean board. Uh, quad core Cortex A72, two gigahertz, um, and it's got IO virtualization. I don't know what that is. SBSA. I'm pretty sure this has virtualization extensions, so I think we're good. But uh, quad core two gigahertz is actually a relatively powerful processor, um, and this is going to be pretty generic, I would imagine. Uh, Board layout, schematics, block diagrams, all that sort of stuff. I can't remember how well documented this is. Um, but, yeah, console UART over micro USB. Oh, cool. So I can do that. I've actually never done JTAG before. That would be kind of fun. But we should be able to set that up. Um, and we should be able to also build a UFI firmware for um, Kimu such that we can load that, uh, such that we can run ARM64 in Kimu and test that as well. It's Marvel, so not documented at all. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, it is Marvel. Fuck. Um, I don't know if there are better uh, ARM64 machines these days. This is good supported in Linux upstream, and Yuffie should be very good supported. Yeah, yeah, this this just runs the um, EDK2. I remember even building it. Let's see. What are these? 96 boards? I don't know. These, looks, uh, these look pretty lightweight. I don't want that shit. Like, the 10 gigabit's actually pretty cool on there. That being said, I'm not going to write a driver for it. Um, virtualization differences. Oh, I don't, um, I don't really care. It, like it, they're basically all the same to me, to be honest. Um, they do the same things. Hmm. NVIDIA Tegras are supposed to get Eufy support? Wow. Not sure if it's already usable. Huh. This is a six-core high-performance board. Uh, passively cooled, which is a little scary to me. Uh, fuck this. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to do the big little bullshit. Yeah, fuck this. 
It's not a six core, man. It's a fucking dual core with a quad core. Fuck off with this. I hate this garbage. Uh, <laughs> the board I have the uh, macchiato bin has a. It has a fan, <laughs> and it has a fan, which is a good sign. So. Get the servers. Yeah, I mean, like, of course I could go and get one of the, um, uh, uh, uh Cavium Thunder X2s. Right, and these are, uh, basically the, the Thunder X1s were fucking trash. The Thunder X2s were okay, um, but I don't know, developer box, if you want 24 cores. Okay, what's this? Um, okay, pretty cheap. Um, one four gig dim up to four 16 gigs. Okay, so you can put real RAM on here. Uh, you are via micro USB for console. Okay, um, I mean, like, God, these things are so sloppy. So firmware looks good, EDK2, good to see. Um, let's find information about this. Multi-core chip, 24 cores of A53s. Okay, so they're like, okay, d decent cores. Um, honestly, I want a board that has fucking I want a board that has, uh, IPMI, right? I want something that I can rack. Um, here we go. Uh, yeah, like one of the Thunder X2 servers would be, uh, better, right? Oh, Marvel bought Thunder X? Shit. Um, but these will have... Um, these will definitely have... Okay, so SAS, don't give a shit. 28-core uh, ARM processors. These are, these are very, very powerful uh, cores. Um, turbo, all of that shit. And then uh, these should have IPMI. I would suspect these would have IPMI. Let's see what the specs are. Uh, yeah, AST 20, uh, 2500, yeah, and that's going to get, uh, that's definitely going to be IPMI, yeah, right, 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 management control, IPMI, yeah, nice, nice, so these would be, uh, relatively powerful servers that I could work on, um, I think these are pretty expensive, though. Let's see if we can get a price. No. No, we can't get a fucking price. Um, I think Thunder X2s are like uh, six grand back in the day. So I, we'll just do dev on our shitty dev board. Um, and if we can get it, like... If we can get raw uh, execution of, like, iPhones running in our hypervisor, then, then we'll worry about buying some ARM hardware so we can chug... But yeah, Thunder X3 and some other platforms should be coming out in 2021. Yeah, honestly, I mean, I, I should just check eBay, right? Uh, um, let's see. Um, so if we did, uh, Thunder X2, see so we can find, <laughs> that's free, wow, these things are fucking getting smoked, okay, uh, so these are, like, the workstation boards, um, yeah, 48 core, full system, Eight, 8 gigs of RAM. Yeah, no none GPU.
Um, God, where are those? F I just want the board, man, to be honest. Motherboard plus CPU only, right? 48 core, 2 gigahertz, 900 bucks. Fucking easy, dude. 1K for Ubuntu, yeah. A Huawei one? Oh, that's a beautiful looking server. Um... Let's see if I can find uh, info on this. ARM64 server. Honestly, I'd probably just do this. <laughs> I'd probably just buy this. Yeah, get, get one of the... Just fucking buy this. Right? Get the 48 core... Oh, 2x 48 cores! 96 cores? Uh... Oh, this is Thunder... This is the... First gen Thunder X. No, no, no. No, 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 no. These were trash. These were trash. Uh, those were really bad. Um, the, f the first gen Thunder X's were just a fucking joke. I think Thunder X2's are pretty good. If we look at like uh, th th Thunder X2, it's just Thunder X. Um,. It's so beautiful to see a socketed fucking uh, processor. All right, let's see. This is comparing blah, 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 blah. Come on, come on. Benchmarks, 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 benchmarks. Oh, God, that's a nice looking server. Fuck, dude. Oh, those are beautiful looking servers. Wow, and that, uh, wow, IPMI, that's looking nice. All right, let's see. Let's see. Thunder X versus Epic. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Mm, yeah, bunch of info here. Bunch of cool stuff. Okay, uh, yeah, like, actually pretty competitive, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically, like, it's gonna probably... Yeah, it's in the middle, right? It's between Intel processors and Epic. Obviously, I don't fucking know what the price points are. I'm just assuming they're reasonable-ish. Um, basically, Thunder X2 is actually a competitive uh, processor, to be honest. Um, so, Thunder X2. I think just buying those is, like, probably correct. Right? These... Gigabyte boards, uh, that looks like an at speed chip, uh, which means these probably have IPMI. Um, we got good peripherals on here. Standard ATX supply, like I could, I could easily just uh, buy a bare bones chassis um, and throw this motherboard in here. It's just gonna be a standard thing. Um, dual socket coming shortly. Oh, baby. Uh, base system includes... Oh, that's for the full system. More button CPU only. AST VGA, BMC on motherboard. Yeah. Um, I don't know, dude. These look, like, pretty good. <laughs> These look pretty good. Right? And when was that update? You can't, you can't, you can't give me the, you can't give me the, you can't give me the notice from four days ago saying that the dual socket ones are coming shortly. <laughs> you can't fucking do that to me. You can't do that to me. Damn it. <laughs> I don't know. That would be fun, dude. Rich IO, DPDK. Um, include an SSD boot drive. Yeah, 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 I don't give a shit about that. 
They require a two-week build and test time. Oh, that's for full systems. Yeah, fuck that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um. USB 3.0. Shit ton of SFPs. Uh, that looks like a dedicated IPMI, uh, port. Ah, uh, actually, is that IPMI? If there's no IPMI, I don't fucking want it, to be honest. Um, like, if there's no IPMI, I don't want it. Boot management controller. I, I would imagine there's IPMI then. Huh. PCIe card. I would imagine, I would imagine, given they say BMC on motherboard, imagine uh, that is IPMI. I don't know. That's that's pretty good. ARM sixty four. What else can I get? I want an ARM64 in computers. There we go. Come on. Come on. Come on. I can get a Debian 9 install DVD for uh, $4. Not a bad deal. NVIDIA Jetson. Ooh, fancy. The fuck's that? That looks, <laughs> that looks wicked. Um, oh, come on. These aren't servers. ARM64 server. Let's say four 10 gigabit NICs on the motherboard. Yeah, that's pretty standard. It's like a pie for ML stuff. Gross. Oh, fuck. I got to roll over my futures contracts. Shit. Shit. <laughs> Why are you browsing eBay? We're looking for ARM servers. What are these? Amperes? Gigabytes. All new Ampere servers. Oh, come on, dude. I just... Let me buy them! <laughs> just let me buy them! Oh, dude, someone did real VNC for ARM64? Holy shit! Wow. Um, that would have been really nice because I had like major display issues when I was doing my um, arm stuff. Let's see, arm sixty four whip. What does what does Microsoft say? Didn't Ubuntu ship free CDs at at that point? Oh yeah, way back in the day they did. Oh, I need to be part of the whip. I'm definitely part of the whip. What's this? Hmm. It's so hard to find information on these fucking things. I don't know why the SEO is so bad. The Ampere 80 core ARM based server processor. Providing samples. Yep. Yep. Oh. Oh, that's a good looking server. Oh man, is that USB is that USB three on the front panel? Oh, I know you can't see that. Oh man, but it's good. Oh geez, that's beautiful. So how do how do I how do I buy one of these? So they're on seven nanometer. These are these are real servers. Sick. Uh, server. How do how do I buy one? How do I how do I buy one? F products for the future of the cloud. Yeah, that's great. But how do I fucking buy one? Evaluate. Uh, Pre-order? Pre how, how much are these going to cost? Uh, 
single dual socket. Why why would you ever get a single socket server? Um oh boy. Yeah, these are these are easily going to be in the 20 grand ballpark, aren't they? Oh, those are nice though. DDR4 3200. Holy shit. Full interrupt virtualization, Gik V3, IO virtualization, MME V3, fucking gorgeous. Wow, these look hot. Uh, Redfish, fuck yeah. Everything he uses AST 2500. I fucking love it. Don't, I mean, that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's good. Good stuff. IT, thank you so much for the raid. Hell yeah. Oh, this is apparently this is proprietary and confidential. Even though I was able to just click on the link, uh, so <laughs> I, I, cl I clicked learn more, and uh, and it's apparently proprietary and confidential. <laughs> Welp, <laughs> it literally linked off their fucking website. <laughs> Sick. Sick. <laughs> True hacker skills. Oh man, leak. Um, yeah, these are gonna be really expensive, aren't they? Ah, oh, damn it, dude. <sighs> Come on, man. Those are beautiful looking servers. Oh, come on. Come on. Just let me fucking buy it. Thunder X2. What can what can I buy? Oh boy. Call for the price. Fucking classic. <sighs> Come on, dude. Gigabyte? Yeah, I was just about to look for gigabyte. Oh, the high density servers. Oh, dude, I fucking love these servers. Now these things are screamers. These things get loud. Uh, eight thunder. Oh, these are not Thunder X twos. Yeah, trash, trash. Not Thunder X twos. Trash. Nope. Nope. There we go. Thunder X twos, baby. Two U correct size. One U suck. One U's out. Two U's in. Um. And where can I buy it? Is there... Ooh, oh, oh, that's a good diagram. What do we got here? Oh, yeah. BMC. Eight channels? Eight channels of DDR3? What the fuck is the throughput? Okay, that's impressive. That's impressive. For vectorized emulation, I can do whatever I want. I can I can run it on this. <laughs> Damn. I bet the caches suck on this. 32k L1, 256k L3, uh, L2, uh, 60, uh, 32 megs L3. Not bad. I bet the memory access latencies are fucking ass on these. I don't know. I feel like I, I probably should just wait until Thunder X3. It's just not worth it. But, like, I don't know. It, it's just impossible to buy these things. They're so fucking niche. Like, no one wants to sell these. Here we go. What's this? Bare bones. Um, maximum memory 64 gigs? <laughs> what? Fully out of order. Do these have processors? This can't. This can't be just the. Per, uh, this isn't just the chassis for four four point six grand. If that has the processors, that's acceptable. Um, two processors installed. Second gen, thirty two cores. Okay, that's not bad. Thirty two core. Uh, dual socket, thirty two cores. Uh, there's gonna be no RAM installed in there, but that's not bad. Forty six hundred. That's probably going to have heat sinks in there, too. Yeah, honestly, that's pretty cheap. That's a lot cheaper than I expected. I expected, like, 15, 20 grand. 
<laughs> Max memory 64 gigs. Yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, serve the home. Oh, these are old though. Man, Thunder X2 is actually old now. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna buy processors that are two years old. That like that's just stupid, especially for things like ARM where they're just ARM is still really pushing it. I'll probably wait till I can get an amp here. Do you have a server closet? I got server room. But yeah, that's not bad. Forty six hundred put like a grand of RAM in there. I guess you can only put 64 gigs of RAM in there, so I guess you put two bucks worth of RAM in there. <laughs> Just spend the better part of my day getting boring SSL to compile on Mac with custom mods. All I want to do is give up on life. Mako files. Oh, God. <laughs> that sounds awful. Thanks for the biddies. Tried doing a, a bit of Rust low-level programming. I wasn't sure how I can create vector tables. Or insert data at a memory address without unsafe. Um, and also with good assembly generation. I mean, it, it, you, you have to use unsafe if you want to write to memory. Um, you're not going to be able to, like, just write to arbitrary memory without unsafe. Um, Thunder X3 is killed? Oh, jeez. Really? Why? Uh, give me deets, give me deets, give me deets. Thunder X3 was supposed to be seven. Thunder X2 was on 16 nanometer? <laughs> uh, 16 nanometer. Uh, dual die, single die, okay, fancy, fancy. Um, yeah, but is it dead now? Is it is it dead though? Hmm. Yeah, X2 is 2018. Yeah, that's too old now. They're good cores, but I don't know. SMT4, 64 cores, 34 threads. I think SMT4 is a bit overkill. I think SMT2 is is really good. Nanometers is this bad metric for 3D structures. Yeah, I know. We're just memeing. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll get it working on our uh, macchiato bin, or or we'll try it for two seconds and then realize it sucks. Uh, what about our Risk uh, Five server? <laughs> five years away. When? When was this? When was this? 2019. Oh no. Uh, Risk Five Dev Board. Oh, actually, the um, the Unleashed boards aren't out yet. They're coming out soon. I think. I think. I think. I think. I think. Uh, those are uh, SI. Um. Come on, course, 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 course boards. Unmatched. Yeah, this is what I want right here. Is this? No. No, 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 no. I want Unleashed, and it's not out yet. Oh. Oh, expected. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be buying those for sure. We're going to be buying these. These are the ones we want. Look at, look at these. Look at these buttes. Oh, man. Look at that. Two M2, M2 slots. 8 gigs of DDR4 baked into the board right there. Right fucking there. It's a U740, uh, which I think is an 8 core, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see. U740. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to buy the shit out of these. I'm going to have so many of these. <laughs> I'm going to have so many of these. Cancel Thunder X3. In favor of vertical markets and hyperscaler. Huh. Shit. Uh, where's the board? Where's the chip? Come on. Where's the information about the CPU? What? What? Tell us about it. How many cores? I guess it has a varying amount of cores, I think. So I don't know how many cores they're actually going to throw in there. 
But it, they're going to be good. These are going to be good, dude. I can't wait. Can't wait. These things are going to be sick. What is this? What's that pinout? What? 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 What are those pins? <laughs> is this? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what those pins are. It's for this. Is it like GPIO here? I don't know. Marvel exits the general purpose ARM server business. Why? It bought Cavium and just killed it. I mean, probably because they don't fucking sell. Because no one gives a shit. <laughs> I guess general... Uh, so they want to go to, like, cloud high density or some shit. That's fair. Yeah, they don't want to sell me a server. Test headers? I don't know. Maybe. It's a wicked, wicked header. Looks like there is a PCI... Yeah, PCI... Oh, man. Look, look at this. Forex USB 3.2 Gen 1. So you can't even get Intel boards with Gen uh, 3.2. Uh, actually, I think you maybe can as of like very recently. Charging point. There's a time 16 PCI E slot. Oh, only eight lanes usable. Okay. And then two M2 keys, which is sick. Oh, that's for Wi Fi Bluetooth. Oh, interesting. Um, e key. Huh. But yeah. I don't know. That's going to be sick. Look at that. Oh, man, dude. The dream. The dream. We can finally run the, the best architecture. Oh, that looks gorgeous. <sighs> 4X U74s and 1X S7. Okay, so it's a quad-core U74. Nice. Nice. Um, all right. Anyways, I'm going to wrap it up there. Thanks for stopping by. That was fun. We'll, uh, we'll go and, and figure some more stuff out, uh, tomorrow. Hell yeah. See you all around. We got to find someone to raid. Uh, let's see who we can raid today. Um, hmm. Do I even know anyone streaming right now? Not, not really, not really. Um, um, hmm. Hmm. Oh, shit. I don't know. Nothing's, like, really standing out to me. It's, like, a crazy, crazy stream here. Um. Hmm. The Primogen? Yeah, I'm thinking about that one. Yeah, well, we'll we'll send we'll send you all over to there. <laughs> mm, all right, <laughs> see you all around. Thank you for stopping by. Off you go.